Hello everyone and welcome to AccuJobs course on Module F. I am Avi Vashisht and I will be your instructor for Group A. In these sessions, we will be building a project and that project will be called Crypto Tracker, which you can see on my screen. And uh, we'll be building this over a span of 20, 25 lectures and every video will not be more than 15 to 20 minutes long. So feel free to pause and code along with me. This particular lecture is just the introduction and I'll be just showing you whatever we'll be building and all of the things that you need uh, before, you know, getting started. So you don't need to worry about anything else. This is a simple React project. It is mostly a front-end project, even though we will be using an API to call all of our data. And apart from that, we're using very well-known, um, what do you say, node modules or packages like uh, Framer Motion for animations. So this animation that you see on the right, this phone, has, has been done using Framer Motion. As soon as we refresh the page, you see the words coming in, uh, sliding in via animation. Those animations are also done using Framer Motion, right? If I decrease the uh, screen size, you can see that this uh, is completely responsive. And um, yeah, this is a completely responsive project. If I show you the mobile view, you will be able to see that we have a drawer which has been made using MUI. So like I said, everything is completely responsive and we're using very, very popular uh, node modules, right? So I'll just give you a quick walkthrough of what we'll be building and as to why we'll be building it. So the entire point of these sessions is to help you build a project that you can, uh, which adds value, first of all. It, add, it should add value to me, to you, to everyone that you show this to. And you should be able to put it in your resume and you should be able to show it, you know, to your interviewer. So the, so the entire point, to, uh, point was to make a project that is good enough to show in interviews, which is good enough to get you a job and so on. So this entire project has been made keeping uh, that in mind. And apart from that, uh, throughout these video lectures, what you'll notice is that we have kept in mind UI and UX. So for those of you who do not know what UI and UX are, UI is just user interface. So everything that you see on the screen is UI, but UX stands for user experience. So we have made sure that there's a good user experience whenever a person is using this website. As you can see, there are a lot of animations. Everything is completely responsive. Uh, this website has light mode and a dark mode, even though I personally prefer the dark mode a lot, but there's still a white mode, a light mode. And as you can see, there are toasts coming in from the right whenever a state changes or something happens. There is a footer as well. The links to social media are here, right? All of these buttons completely work. If somebody wants to share this app, they can. And if you open, press this button in your mobile devices, you will see a completely different UI. It's basically the, um, what do you say? The UI that you see, you know, when you share something on your mobiles, uh, you know, let's say if you're sharing something on WhatsApp, you will get that pop-up which allows you to share it to different apps and so on, right? Apart from that, we have a lot of pages, the first of which will be the dashboard page. And as soon as we go to the dashboard page, what you see is this, right? So we get a list of uh, 100 coins, 100 cryptocurrencies in real time. So all of this data gets updated, uh, I think every hour or every uh, 30, 20 minutes on CoinGecko's site. CoinGecko is the API that we'll be using. So like I said, all of these um, coins or all of the data is coming in real time. It is being uh, fetched using an API provided by CoinGecko. There'll be a separate video about CoinGecko. Don't worry about it. I'll be telling you all about that as well. And this video is just an introduction, right? So I'll just be showing you what we'll be building. So as soon as we come back to the dashboard page, we see that we have 10 coins on this page and there are 10 such pages. So we are fetching around 100 coins. And if the coin is doing well, we are showing everything in green. If the coin is doing bad, we'll show it in red and so on, right? So as you can see today, Tether uh, is at a loss of minus 0.01% or the price change has fallen uh, this percentage wise. Bitcoin is at a rise of 7% and so on, right? You can search for cryptocurrencies. If I go over here, I type Bitcoin, I'll be able to search Bitcoin. I can type Doge, I'll be able to search Doge. And um, this searching is not case sensitive. So even if I type Bitcoin in all caps, I'll be able to see it, right? And so on. There's also this mouse follower, which follows my mouse everywhere. So this is one kind of an Easter egg that we added. If I tap on it, the mouse increases. 
If I leave it, the mouse gets back to its original size. Apart from that, we have two views. So we have a grid view and we have a list view. So the list view looks like this. The animation again has been powered using a uh, framer motion. Our footer is here as well. And if you notice something in the footer is that it's a gradient and the gradient keeps on changing colors. So it's these little, little things that uh, we have made sure that we do properly and it helps in giving a better user experience to the user, right? Let's say if you're in our mobile view, like I said, the website is completely responsive, but if the user tends to, you know, scroll um, really, really down to the page, they will be shown this back to the top button on clicking of which they'll be taken to the back, uh, you know, to the top of the screen. Apart from that, everything is completely responsive as you can see. And uh, let's say I want to know more about a cryptocurrency. So I can actually click on that cryptocurrencies page and I will be taken to Bitcoin's specific page, right? So this is how the Bitcoin's page looks like. I just increase the screen size. We have the same list component, uh, which displays the total volume, market cap, current price, and so on. We have this graph that we see, which has been built using uh, charges. And this graph is also completely responsive. If I start decreasing my screen size, the graph decreases in size as well, right? Apart from that, uh, you can see that we can change the number of days. So right now this is just for 120 days. If I go back and can see this entire graph for seven days, I can see this entire graph for 30 days and so on. I can even change the graph that I'm looking at. So this is just the price change. If I click on total volume, I'll be shown the graph of the total volume that is being, you know, shared or sold or bought, whatever, or traded is the correct word. And I can see the graph for the market cap as well. And then I can scroll down, read more about Bitcoin. There are a few links that I click on them, right? So if I click on this prime coin, I'll be taken to this prime coin link, which is again a coin gecko link because the API that we're using is coin gecko, but yeah. And uh, like I said, the entire point of making a crypto dashboard was to basically make something which is useful. So keep in mind that everything that we have done is to provide value to, let's say if someone is interested in cryptocurrencies, right? The whole point was to make a project which is actually helpful to people and to provide value because I personally believe in that. And I believe that it gives you an upper edge as well. When you're showing a project to an interviewer, they instantly know if this is just a random project or this is just a side project or something. Or if you show them an actual project, which holds some value, which is good, which provides value to people, which is responsive, which takes care of users experience. The UI is good. If everything is good, it definitely gives you an upper edge. So, and that is what we at Accio believe in uh, helping you guys with as well. So there's actually a compare page. So let's say you're in, uh, you know, you're a person who's really into cryptocurrencies and you want to uh, invest in cryptocurrencies, but you do not know which one to invest into. So there's a compare page for you. And as soon as you go to that compare page, uh, there's obviously a really nice loader, but as soon as the data comes, what you see is graphs of two cryptocurrencies. So by default, we're co comparing Bitcoin and Ethereum, obviously the two of the most popular cryptocurrencies but I can compare other cryptocurrencies as well. Let's say I change this to uh, Dogecoin and I can compare Bitcoin and Dogecoin. And again, I can change the number of days as well for let's say 90 days, I can compare them. I can change the total volume, market cap, whatever I want to. And the entire point of uh, making these this compare page was that you can actually see how uh, cryptocurrencies behave and maybe, you know, you should be able to know in which one do you want to invest in. So I can clearly see that from, let's say, 23rd, 25th October up to 2nd November, the green is Dogecoin, by the way. So as you can see, there is a legend over here as well. So I can clearly see that Dogecoin was on a good rise. Right, while Bitcoin was still rising, then both of them fell together around 10th November. Then both of them rose again and Dogecoin rose exponentially while Bitcoin was still trying to rise up and so on. And then towards the end, which is recent right now, around 11th to 13th January, Bitcoin completely shot up while Dogecoin is still struggling. So as you can see, the entire point was to make something which is interactive, which helps people, is responsive and so on. Right. There is this, um, what do you say, an info component that we made. If I tap on this, I'll be able to see Bitcoin's uh, information, Dogecoin's information, so on. I can change these coins as many times as I want to. 
the API is actually really, really reliable in the four or five months uh, of which I've been, uh, you know, helping students make this project. I have never seen this API go down even for a single second. Completely free to use. There is uh, no key required. Everything is taken care by CoinGecko and so on, right? Apart from that, we do have a watch list page and this page is just to, um, you know, show you different, different cryptocurrencies so that let's say I want to save this in my watch list. I can go over here, click on this and as soon as I click on it, it adds this coin to my watch list. Then I can go to my watch list and uh, I will be able to kind of, uh, you know, see all the coins that I've saved. So I've saved Bitcoin, I've saved Dogecoin, I've saved this new coin and there's a list view over here as well, right? And yeah, so this is completely uh, very simple to use. Uh, let's say I want to get rid of Bitcoin. I'll click on this. It asks me that I, am I sure that I want to remove this coin? If I click yes, it will get removed. Otherwise, it won't. And I'll be given a toast as well. So like I said, this project contains these little, little details like the mouse follower, the custom selection bar that is there, right? If I show you the dashboard page, you'll see that there's a custom scroll bar as well on the side. It's blue in color. Right. So it is these little, little things that we are taking care of throughout these sessions to give a good user experience to our users. And um, that is something that you as front end developers should really, really, uh, you know, think about and you should add in your projects as well. Apart from that, like I said, completely responsive, really fast. There are loaders everywhere. So again, adding loaders is also a good user experience to give. Right. So your user knows what is happening. If I hard reload this website, you'll see that, uh, okay, it loaded really fast. Let me click on Bitcoin's page. So as you can see, there was a loader. So even if the API is taking long, I will be aware that, you know, something is happening and so on. Completely responsive. Even the font size decreases uh, as we are scrolling or going smaller in terms of screen size. And that is also something which is really important to do. Yeah, so like I said, this was just the first lecture. We will be providing you with everything. I think uh, you'll have the link, you'll have the GitHub link, everything will be on GitHub, right? Feel free to pause this video, code along with me. And uh, apart from that, you will be given all of these assets, all of the color variables, but something that I would uh, want from you guys is to, you know, consider this as your own project and change it according to your needs. Maybe if there's another feature that you want to add, you know, let's say if you want to give custom days instead of just standard 7, 30, 60, 90, you know, there are, I think you can go back as to 10 years, uh, CoinGeek allows you to go back. You can see the graph for 10 years down the line, right? So maybe you give uh, the graph for years as well. Maybe you change the color theme. Maybe you do not like this black and blue. You make it black and red or black and orange is a good theme. Right. So feel free to change this project. Feel free to add any features, get rid of any features, you know, uh, don't get rid of features, but definitely add features. And yeah, so this is what these lectures are going to be about. It's going to be about you and me building this project and uh, yeah, and eventually adding these, uh, this project in our resume. And that's the end goal. So in the second lecture, as you can see, it says uh, basic react project setup, and that is exactly what we'll be doing, right? So let's actually go ahead to our terminal where I've actually gone ahead and I already uh, wrote npx create react app and the react app that I created was called crypto project. So now let's just go to that directly. So I'll just say cd uh, crypto project and now I'll just say code and dot. This will take me to my VS code and this is a very helpful way or a, you know a shortcut method with which you could just directly use terminal to open your VS code. So I hope you guys are aware of it. If not, it is a great trick and it helps you to save a lot of time, right? So over here, let's actually get started and I'll just say npm start and let's see what we initially get. So I'm pretty sure that every one of you guys who's watching this video is already aware of the uh, basic React template that React gives us uh, as soon as we create the React app, right? So we'll just wait for this to run and as soon as the development server starts, it will take us to local, localhost 3000 where we have our, uh, you know, React server running. All right, perfect. So over here, we should have the React logo, which is spinning and we should have some basic text. And uh, yeah, here it is on the screen. We have the React uh, logo, which is spinning and we have edit src slash app.js and save to reload uh, text. So what I like to do is I initially like to clean up my code and the way to do that is very simple. So anything and everything that React gives us by default and something that we do not need, we'll just get rid of it. So I do not need that. 
right i'll go to my app.css and get rid of all of the styling because again it is something that we do not need we'll be creating styling of our own we do not need app.test.js we do not need logo.svg we do not need report web vitals we do not need set setup tests.js we'll go to our index we'll get rid of all of this code we do not need this we do not need this import and uh, these four imports are important obviously we have this we have our index.css where uh, we can technically get rid of this as well and this is something that we'll be editing too then we have app.js where we have this we do not need the logo and we, since we've already deleted the logo.svg we cannot even import it right and our app.css is also cleaned up cool so now let me just write hello Accio job over here and as soon as i do that if i save my server is running as soon as i go to my google chrome i should see hello Accio job right so this is the basic uh, code cleanup that i feel every person who is using react or you know has just started with react should do because all of those things are very unnecessary for us at least they have certain use cases but we really do not uh, you know we really do not need to worry about them as of right now i'll do one more thing where i go to my index.html inside my public folder and i'll add i'll change my description and i'll also change my title so this is my title so i'll change this to crypto tracker right uh, with the full stop because that's the uh, that is also the logo that i've created and i will be showing you guys a figma that i've created as well right and uh, everything will be shared to you guys uh, yeah so i've changed the title as well now if you go to our google chrome we can see that this is the title this is the hosted one and now something that i wanted to talk to you guys about was this crypto uh, project breakup doc that i've made so I will be sharing this document with you guys. Um, you know, I'll be, I will be putting the link of this document in the description so that you guys can go through it. And uh, this doc is basically, it contains everything that you need to do to build this entire project. And it has everything. It has the objective. It has the tech stack. It has all of the links, all of everything that we'll be doing, right? It has the GitHub repos, the project links. It has the Dribble website. And Dribble is something that we'll be using for design inspirations, right? It has the API documentation, it has the charges, MUI, frame of motion, every, everything that we have used is, is over here. This document also contains project stages. So again, there are 15 stages that I've made, right? We are currently on the second stage where I'm setting up the folder structure, adding the global styling and whatnot, right? Then uh, obviously there is this, these steps that you guys need to follow and uh, this document is, like I said, is everything that you need to know before, uh, you know, starting this project or while start creating this project as well. There are steps and every steps has uh, screenshots. It has import lines. It has, you know, everything that you need to actually know to kind of build this. So anyone who has this doc and anyone who has a basic sense of react or how react works should be able to create whatever I have, because again, it is something which is very, very simple, right? So let's actually go to our VS code and the first video or this lecture is basically about the basic React project setup and um, the folder structure as well. So for this exact project, the folder structure that I have chosen is something that I really, really uh, like and I rely on, right? And it's very fairly simple to do. And uh, when you're starting off in this project, you feel that it is something that is, that is unnecessary or that is a hassle or something like that. But trust me, as we move forward, you will realize that this actually makes sense. And this is how our code needs to be, right? So for that, we'll be creating multiple folders. One of the folders will be called components. Then we'll have another SRC folder, which will be called assets. Then we'll have one more folder, which is for functions. We'll have another folder, which is for uh, pages, right? So these are, I think, the four folders that we will be using mostly. And as these folders names are pretty self-explanatory, we have the assets folder, we have the components folder, we have the functions folder and the pages folder. So all of my components will be inside my components folder. All of my assets will be inside the assets folder. All of my functions will be inside the functions folder. Now you might be thinking, what are the functions that we're talking about? So the functions can vary from anything to, you know, uh, data manipulation or something like that to our API calls or maybe, you know, fetching data, getting data, manipulating it, it, doing some operations. So whatever function that we are writing and that is something that we might need in the future, let's say uh, fetching a specific coin's data or let's say getting coin prices or let's say um, getting coin information. Right. So all of these things will be functions that we'll be making. And this way, our code will be very, very modular. So we can just call these functions whenever we need to. 
uh, then we have the pages folder so i think you guys are aware that by default react builds uh, helps us build spas and those spas are called uh, single page applications right so since by default react allows us to do that we'll be using react router dom to build pages and making sure that our website is multi pages right uh, or uh, suppose multiple pages or multiple routes and so on so all of those pages will be inside this folder right and so on so let's actually uh, let me actually give you a little hint of how we'll be building our components and how we'll be actually working right so uh, inside the component folder we'll have subfolders so we'll be storing components for let's say we'll be having something called common components we'll be having another folder for let's say dashboard components right we might have components which are just landing page components we might have components which are just strictly coin page components right so we will be having different different components and all of those components will be inside these subfolders and the reason for that is let's actually go to a google chrome and i'll tell you so right now what do you see on the screen everything in react can be broken down into components right so what you see on the screen right now are mainly two components i see the header component and i see the landing page component right then i see the footer component so we have three components now the header and the footer are something that are there in every page or almost every page or they should be on every page right so these two components can be called as common components because they're not page specific but they're something that we will be using in every page or almost every page but when we talk about this component which hosts or which you know holds my uh, image of this phone which is floating then we have this entire heading this entire animation these buttons and everything so all of these are something uh, which is specific to landing page so basic structure follows is that we'll have a header component which will be inside my common components we have this landing page component which will be inside be which will be inside of the landing page folder right if i talk about dashboard my dashboard contains all the components of the dashboard will be inside my dashboard folder because these components are something that i will just be using in my dashboard right if i talk about this back to the top button or if i talk about this button that is inside the header all of these are separate common components that we will be building and the reason why they are common is because they will be used again and again so right now this might sound confusing but trust me in the future it's going to actually make a lot of sense and it will make your code much 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 more cleaner right if i talk about the full project uh, i'll just quickly show you guys the amount of code that we'll be writing so i obviously have the full project coded with me as well right now i'll just quickly show it to you guys i do not really want you to get confused or get intimidated or get scared by the amount of code that we'll be writing but i do need to show you guys right so over here as you can see we have the same folder structure we have assets we have components we have functions and we have pages now my asset contains two assets uh, which are basically the gradient and the iphone again these are the only two hard coded assets that we're using i think there should be one more asset for the fav icon but apart from that this is it right then we have the components the component as you can see has coin components which is the coin page components we have the common components which basically holds all of these common component components like the button the footer the header the loader the back to the top button right then we have the compare page components this just has the select coin then we have dashboard these are all the components that we'll be using in the dashboard page right then we have the landing page this just has one folder of landing page components or the inter component and we just have an index in C, uh, index.js and styles.css right then we obviously have our functions folder we have multiple functions you know all the api calls let's say getting 100 coins getting coin data getting coin prices if if the coin has been added to the watch list or not you know if we want to remove the coin from the watch list or if you want to set the chart data so setting chart data is the function that you use to set the chart data and the chart is the graph that you see on our website right so it makes sense to have all of these functions modular as well then we have the pages folder and look at how clean our code looks for our pages this is the home page the landing page and these are the only three components in the landing page and as you can see literally we just have four lines of code four five lines of code and that is it for our entire page so this way what will happen is that your pages actually become really really easy to maintain and really really easy to you know uh change the order of components maybe add certain components remove certain components so it just makes it makes our life very easy when we are doing it for the first time for the second time this will be very painful but if you guys stick with me till the end you guys will realize that when we are writing you know tens and thousands of code lines of code it makes sense to have uh, our project in such a in 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 such a manner 
right and that will allow us to at the end of the day kind of um, make our code very very modular and easy to access easy to understand and a lot of things right so like i said this entire uh, series or this entire video was just about making our code modular and something that i would want to do is show you the uh, structure of the components that we'll be having so let's say i create a component called the header and let's say i create another component called the footer right so inside both of these components i'll have an index.js since you guys know index is the first file that we run and i'll have a styles.css similarly inside my footer i'll have an index.js and i'll have a styles.css right now the reason for having an index file i'll be explaining in the uh, explaining in just 2 minutes just give me a second let me say rfce let me make uh, my header component over here i will import my styles that are that is just strictly my styles for my header i'll have dot slash styles dot css over here and for my footer i'll have again rfce i'll say footer over here and then i'll have uh, my styles just strictly just my styles for my uh, footer right so now let's do one thing let's actually import these in my app.js so i'll go over here i'll get rid of my hello dot uh, hello app job i'll just say header right i'll import my header like this and i'll import my footer like this as soon as i do that i should be able to see uh, okay i haven't imported my footer just give me a second uh, okay so a lot of uh, students also ask me that how do i import things really quickly so the trick for that is just by pressing control space and that is all that you need to do right uh, vs code automatically suggests you imports and these are the imports that i have right now I'll go to my Google Chrome, I'll go to my React app, and I see that header and footer are there. Now, let's actually go ahead and style them a little bit. So let me say, uh, let me give this a class name of um, header itself. And let me give this a class name of footer. Right, so now what I'll do is, I will now go to my style.css of my header, and I'll say dot header which is basically let's do width of 100%, let's do color of hashtag 000 or hashtag FFF, my bad, and let's do background color of uh, black, right? Background color, hashtag 000. Then in my footer, I'll have dot footer. And over here, let me give the background color of let's do yellow or let's do light blue, right? Then let me have my color as hashtag 000 and uh, my width as 100% um, again. Now let's just see how our code looks and this is how it looks. So we have the header in black and we have the footer in uh, light blue, right? The text of the header is in white, the text of the footer is in black, exactly like our styles made it to be. So now I, I hope you guys understand the segregation that we have. So our footer component will just contain the JSX or the HTML part of my footer, then it will just contain the styles of my footer. My header will contain the JSX of my header and my styles of my header, right? And that is about it. So this makes our lives much, much simpler because now we have components and every component has their own index and their own styles. Now, a lot of students ask me that, sir, why don't we just write header.js over here? Now, I rename this file to header.js. Now, notice what happens to my import. Look at this import and look at the footer import. Right, so the import for my header changes from components slash common slash header to now components slash common slash header slash header. Now notice that this header and this header is capital H, this is small h. And this just means header.js. Whereas over here, the import that I had was slash components slash common slash footer slash index.js. Right, now I don't really need to write index.js because index is the first file that anyways gets run inside a folder, right? But if I have header.js, I do need to write slash header. So now this just is unnecessary and that is why I feel, I mean, if you guys want to keep your code that way, I know a lot of students are comfortable with keeping their code that way. Feel free to do that. The code will still work. But if you want your code to look a little smarter, a little cleaner, I would suggest that have index.js over here. And what that would allow you to do is your imports will be much more cleaner and simpler. Just simple dot slash component slash common slash header. And that's it. No slash header again or no slash, you know, whatever JS file that you made. Right. And um, yeah, anyways. 
so like we said we'll be keeping these videos short we'll be keeping them about 20 minutes and uh, i think this is good for the initial project setup that we had in the next video we will actually be starting with the uh, importing of the global styling and the fonts and the root variables and whatnot right we'll also be talking about the coin gecko api and uh, why we'll be needing it and what is this api why is it important for our project and so on in today's lecture let me actually just paste the root variables that i've already gotten started with and these are the root variables that i have decided that we'll be using if you want you can use other root variables you can use root variables of your choice and again it's not a compulsion that you need to follow the exact root variables that i am i would love to see your projects where you make use of other color themes other functions and features as well right and we'll be getting to those uh, those things in the future as well and we'll be talking about them but right now these are the root variables that i've chosen and if you guys didn't know what root variables are root variables are basically these variables that we set in our html and css websites for our colors and or basically we can set them for anything that we want but right now we are just going to be concerned about uh, you know setting these variables for our colors and the reason for that is when you're building a really large project with a lot of pages a lot of components and, and, and a lot of html and css basically what happens is if let's say you want to change the color of something let's say if you want to change a theme or anything it becomes a really huge task to do that. You have to basically, you know, search for that variable. Let's say if I want to change my black and I want to change it to something like hashtag, you know, 222 or 333 or something like that or something like gray or something, I will have to, you know, uh, either global search it or go one by one. And that actually creates a lot of mess in our code. So what I suggest for that is that we use variables. And the reason for that is like, uh, it is the same as using variables in any code that you write. And why do we write and create variables? Basically to make our lives easier, correct? So in this example as well, that is what we are going to do. We will be creating variables to make our lives easier. And the variables that we'll be creating are purely just for color's sake. And this is also one of the things that we do to make our website kind of compatible in terms of light and dark mode as well. And I will be talking about that in the future classes whenever we have the class where we convert our entire website from dark mode to light mode. But by default, we will be having our entire website dark mode. Right. So, okay. So let's say we convert our body. And what I want to do is, uh, let's say I want to firstly get rid of all of these font families. They're taking a lot of space unnecessarily, not needed right now. Let me go ahead and convert my entire background color and I'll make it as V A R dash dash black and i'll can make my text as var white right so now this is how you access these root variables that you made if you want to learn more about root variables just go to google chrome just search for root uh, variables in css and there's a lot of documentation that you can ref but wc schools is the best right so this will exactly tell you exactly why as to why you need to use root variables and that is so that you can just directly change your colors right and we can just have root variables over here instead of using these colors again and again and so on right so i would definitely want you guys to go through this way and uh yeah this is the root variable way like we said let's click on try it yourself and now if i ever want to change the shade of blue i just need to edit this variable and make it to whatever i want to and my entire code wherever i've used the blue color will change right so now my life becomes much easier in the sense that i can just change one value and everywhere that I've used that color, it just changes and it just reflects in the entire website, right? So that's the point of root variables. And um, again, I will be talking about this more when we come to our light mode and dark mode uh, chapter or our session, right? In this session, we're just concerned about setting up the root variable, setting up the Google fonts variable and whatnot, or Google fonts font, sorry, and whatnot. So these are the variables that I've set. If I go to my uh, Google Chrome right now, and if I go to the crypto project that I've started, so I'll just go to my localhost 3000. This is what we see by default. My background color has now become black and my color has become white. Now, something that I want to tell you guys is that we should never use absolute white and absolute black in our codes. And the reason for that is that uh, it is not good for UX. And what do I mean by UX? I mean user experience, right? So there was this study which said that if you use absolute black, which is hashtag 000, and absolute white, which is hashtag FFF, 
it actually affects her eyes or the user's eyes in a way that it um, you know does not really allow them to be uh, very attentive or it does not really allow a lot of the data that they're seeing to be you know kind of understood by them or something like that so basically it's a general convention that if you're using hashtag 000 do not make your text color white make it something like e3 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 which is a slight shade of gray or maybe you would want it to be really close to white f3 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 but not exactly white if you're using absolute white for your text make your background something like black but not exactly black and this is something that you see on the very VS code that I'm coding in. This entire color right now, this part is not exact black. It is not absolute black. It is something darker. It is something like dark gray, maybe darker than dark gray as well. This I would say is dark gray, the color that you see in this background. But this part, whatever you see over here is something darker than dark gray, right? So this is basically a general convention and I want you guys to notice this in the future uh, whenever you, you know, go through dark uh, mode of a website or an application. Do notice this that nobody is using absolute black and absolute white together. Either white is not absolute white, it is not hashtag FFF or either the black that they're using or is not absolute black, it's not hashtag 000. And that is just one of the ways that you can improve the UX of your website. And the, like I said, the UX means a uh, user experience. And that really, this is something that takes place subconsciously. This is something that the user will not really notice. You know, it is something that their mind or their brain notices. There's a full on study on that. I would really suggest you guys to go through it as to why you should not use absolute white and absolute black together, because it is very contrasting and it really, you know, damages the eye and it really, you know, affects the way a user sees a website as well even though they might not notice it, but their brain and, you know, subconsciously they will notice it anyways. So apart from that, we have other variables. We have the blue variable. This is the main theme variable. Our theme is black and blue, but I would really want you guys to make your uh, crypto projects in black and red or black and neon green or black and orange. All of those themes are really, really nice. And I've seen students make them uh, in different, different themes. So try out any color that you want to, even black and yellow is a really good theme. Right, we have our gray variable, we have the dark gray, we have the green and the red. Okay, so these are all the variables that we have. Now something that I would want to do is, I would go to my Google Fonts and I will, uh, yes, I'll go to my Google Fonts and the font that we will be using for this entire project is called Enter, right? So all you need to do for that is go to Fonts. I will currently remove all the fonts that I have, right? I'll just search for Enter. And then what I'll do is either you can basically select um, every font that is there, thin, 100, extra light, light, regular, medium, or you can be selective and just select the ones that you will be needing. I, what I like to do is just in case select everything, right? And that is just in case you might ever want to, you know, keep your font weight as 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, whatever you want to, then it works. Right. All you need is this import. Just copy this import and we will be pasting this import in my VS code at the very top. Right. And as soon as I do that, my import is there. Then we'll go to our Google Chrome again and copy this font family. And as soon as I copy this, if I go to my VS code, add my font family in my body, what I will realize is that now my project has the font of enter and everything works perfectly. So, so far we have done two things. We've added our font as enter and we've added root variables, right? If you go to the documentation that I have shared in the last class, right? I really hope you guys go through this. You will realize that apart from adding the font variable, I mean, adding the font and adding the root variables, what we'll be using is we'll be using something um, which has to do with custom selection and custom uh, scroll bar. So something that I've also done in this project is that I've done custom selection. And uh, what custom selection means is that notice the difference when I'm selecting this, right? It's dark blue, not the dark blue, but the blue that we are using in our variable, that blue and the color is white, right? If I go to a website uh, such as Dribble, if I go to Dribble and if I try to select something, the selection over here works as, um, let me click on something and then select something. This is pink, right? Or this is the theme color for Dribbble. If I select anything over here, the background is pink and the uh, color is white. 
if I talk about basic Google search, whenever I Google search something and I select something, all of this is basic, you know, whatever your theme color for your entire desktop is, right? So how do we actually kind of change the way selection works in HTML, CSS or in React? How do we do that? Well, we use this uh, thing called selection and we can actually write custom selection for an entire project. And all we need to do is we just need to write dot dot or colon colon selection. And now what I'll do is I'll say background color is uh, VR blue. Right. And my color will be VAR white. At the moment I do that, notice how my selection really changes. If I go to Google Chrome right now, go to my project and if I select something now, it has been given the background color of blue which is the blue that I have decided in my root variables and the white, right? I can now change this to whatever I want to. I can make this red as well. And if I make the background color as red and go to my Google Chrome, you'll see that now my selection is red, right? So this is how you actually make a custom selection and you can actually affect your custom selection like this, right? So that is one thing that our project will be doing. And apart from this one thing, we'll also have a custom scroll bar. So something that you must have noticed is that we have this scroll bar for our uh, entire project, right? For our crypto tracker project. And all you need to Google is just uh, how to make a custom scroll bar, custom scroll bar in CSS. And as soon as you do that, you see a W3 schools link where you will be able to create your own custom scroll bar. Like over here, as you can see, this is a default uh, rectangular-ish. Whereas this is the red one, right? This is the default one. This is still different anyways. And all you need to do is you just need to have these four, five things in your CSS. So let me just copy them and I'll paste them in my VS code. And then I'll explain what exactly I'm going to do to make sure that my uh, project has a custom scroll bar, right? So uh, WebKit scroll bar just refers to the entire scroll bar. So let's say this is my scroll bar over here, as you can see, Right. If I give it a width of 10 pixels, that means my entire scroll bar will have a width of 10 pixels. Right. WebKit scroll bar track. Now the track refers to the area where the scroll bar will move. Right. Over here, as you can see, this is the track. So let's say if I make my track look uh, hashtag white, or I can just say VR white for that matter. Right. And I have my WebKit scroll bar thumb, whereas the thumb means the thing that you grab to, you know, scroll. So the main scroll bar, ideally. So we'll have a background color of VR blue over here. Right. And we can give hover properties. Let's just not have hover properties right as of right now. And I save this code. Now let's actually go to our local host to see what we get. And okay, right now we do not see a scroll bar. And the reason for that is there is nothing to scroll. So how about we give our body a height of, uh, let's say 200 VH. Right. And what that would mean is that would give it uh, 200 times the height that it has or 200 times the height of the screen. And now this becomes scrollable. So as you can see, we have our custom scroll bar now over here. And uh, yeah, it has the white background as the track and blue over here. So instead of that, I'll be using the values that I have used in the project. So I think this is somewhere around 0.3 rem. And my I haven't given any background color to this track. So we can even make it black or we can just get rid of it. Right. The thumb has a background color of blue and a border radius of, I think, uh, 3 rem. If we do that, as you can see, our scroll bar is now rounded as well. It has rounded edges, right? And it's it works like any other scroll bar, right? It's the same thing, but now it has a different styling. So just like that, in this video, we talked about the various root variables. We made our custom selection. We made a custom scroll bar. And that is all that you need to know before getting started with the project. And in the next class, we'll actually get started with the project. We'll also talk a little about the crypto API that we'll be using. And um, yeah, so we'll talk about the uh, CoinGecko API that we'll be using. And after that, we'll get uh, immediately, we'll start with the landing page. We'll create the header, we'll create the MUI drawer and so on. In this very short video, we're just going to talk about the crypto API that we'll be using. And that crypto API uh, is going to be called CoinGecko. As you can see on my screen, I've already gone ahead and went to the CoinGecko website. It's very simple. Just type coingecko.com and you will be taken to the CoinGecko website. Now, this actually uh, is a really good API. And to actually access the documentation, what you need to do is go to the products tab and then click on crypto API. As soon as you do that, they will take you to the crypto API uh, or the CoinGecko API documentation. And over here, they tell you about that there are various plans that they have. There's, of course, a free one. 
and uh, there is uh, more and more plans that you can take but i don't think so you really need to take any plans the free version works the best at least for me it did so we can just directly click on explore docs and in it's been about four or five months since i've been using this api to build obviously these crypto projects with students and in the time that I have been coding with it, I have never seen this crypto uh, or this coin API go down. The starter is, is always green. It is always fast. It is really, you know, I have honestly, I've never seen it uh, also act slow, right? So it's a very fast API, very reliable, and um, it's completely free. No keys required, as it says, right? If you obviously buy the pro version, then you can use a key, but you can actually access it without the key as well, right? They do have a rate limit, which is 20, uh, 10 to 30 calls per minute. And honestly, that is a lot as well. I don't think so you will ever exhaust this limit. I myself have just exhausted it once, and that was because my... Uh, my API call was stuck in a loop. So it was just calling the server again and again and again and again. And that eventually got me kind of uh, not banned, but, uh, you know, blacklisted for a while. And so basically after that, I obviously stopped coding. I went, had my dinner. And by the time I was back after having my dinner, the API was working again. So even the entire point of telling you guys this was that even if, you know, someday you exhaust the limit, do not worry. In the next 15, 20 minutes, it will start working again. And that is where I really find this API, you know, really, really useful because it can happen while you're coding, while you're experiment experimenting with things. You know, maybe your API calls get in inside a loop or, you know, maybe you're doing something wrong and they just blacklist you. But uh, the good point is that your API will work again within like 15, 20 minutes. So you can take a break and take a breather. And when you're back, you know, you can easily code again and without any issue. Right. So obviously uh, this API also works like any other API does. Right. There is a um, there's this endpoint called ping. And what that means is if I just click on try it out. Right. And execute it, it will give me that. OK. So every time you try out a specific link that they have, it'll give you the curl request. If you want to try making the curl request, you can. You obviously get the request URL. This is the request URL at which we'll be sending the get request, right? And this is the body that we'll see. It says Gecko says V3 to the moon. And that just means that the status is okay. Uh, status 200, that means it's okay, right? We uh, have a lot of different URLs, but mainly we'll just be using two, three URLs. Like over here, we have slash coin slash markets. Right. What this does is this, uh, we can use this API link or this endpoint to obtain all the coins market data, right? We can get the price, market cap and volume. And if we actually head over to our crypto dashboard, we'll see that that is what we want. So if I go to my dashboard, the first thing that I see is that I get a list of uh, 100 coins, which contains the coins information like their uh, symbol, their name, their logo. We see the price change in 24 hours, right? We see their current price. We see the total volume and their market cap. So this is all the data that I need, right? And when I hit this particular API slash coin slash markets, let me click on try it out. Over here, the only required parameter is VS currency. That is, you know, the currency that you want. So let's say USD. We'll just be talking about uh, in terms of dollars in this. We do not need to send the IDs that you want, right? Uh, the order of the cryptocurrencies that will come in is going to be in the descending order of the market cap. You can change this also if you want to. Right, per page you're going to get 100 coins, right? Total number of coins that we can get in a page is 250, right? And um, this is just page one. So if I click on execute now, I should actually be able to see. So obviously I get the curl request, I get the get request that I need, right? The request URL, and then I get the response body. So over here in my response body, if you guys look clearly, you'll see that I get an array, array of objects, right? And what is that object? That object is actually my coin object and it has a lot of data. I can already see that it has the ID, Bitcoin, symbol, name, right, image. So let's see if this is the image SRC, it looks to be. If I open it in a new URL uh, or a new tab, you'll see that this is actually the Bitcoin's logo that they have, right? So even the image, I'm getting the current price. Obviously this current price is in USD. If I over here go in the top and if I make this uh, INR, let's say, and then I hit this link again, uh, obviously now the currency that I'll be getting will be in INR. So you guys can choose your own currency that you want to. Even in the future, uh, when I talk about how can you expand this project, I would want you guys to implement a feature where you take the currency from the user because maybe the user wants uh, to see the price in USD, but then the user wants to see it in INR as well, or maybe in, you know, any other currency that they want to, right? So you can refer to this documentation and actually see what all currencies does uh, CoinGecko support, right? And accordingly, you can um, put that value, 
Right, we get the market cap rank. The market cap rank means this is obviously the first going to see, that means Bitcoin is at the top. And that is because the market cap it has or it holds is, you know, the biggest or the largest, right? We get total volume, we get the high underscore 24 hours. That means the highest that this coin has gone. So this coin's highest value that it has gone is this, right? The lowest it has gone is this. So there is a lot of useful data already that we're getting using this API. And we're getting this for every coin. For Ethereum as well, we get the same things for Tether as well, for Binance coin as well. So for all the top 100 currencies, we get the same. Now, if you want to get more coins, you can ob obviously say 150, right? If I say 150, let me make my currency as USD again. And if I hit on execute, this is this is the beauty about this API documentation is that, that it, it gives you the request URL. And as you can see over here, it already changes these parameters per page 150 and VS currency is USD, right? So these are all variables that you can use and these are called uh, URL or query params, you can say. And through this, you basically provide certain information to the browser or to the um, API servers that you want to fetch the data from, right? But that is not important. The important point being that this API will actually work according to whatever you ask it to. And it's very flexible in that manner, right? And it's a very simple get request. As soon as I hit this get request, uh, yeah, as soon as I get this, uh, hit this get request, I will get a hundred coins or a array of hundred objects and each object is going to be my cryptocurrency, right? And just like that, there is a lot of, uh, other, um, you know, API endpoints that we'll be using one of them being this one, uh, coin slash ID. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to get the current data for a coin. So if I click on try it out, if I over here, let's say click write Bitcoin. Now how you will be wondering that how do I know that Bitcoin's ID is Bitcoin? Because over here you can see I got the data ID for Bitcoin is Bitcoin, right? So I can just write that and um, I'm just going to hit the default one, correct? As you can see, I get all the data related to Bitcoin and look at the amount of data that it sends, right? This is the API URL that I'll be hitting which is uh, coingeku.com slash api slash v3 slash coins slash bitcoin right so this is where my id is and now if i look over here i just get an object and that object contains all of the details that i possibly could want to know about bitcoin right it starts with id symbol name uh, but if we keep scrolling you'll see that i also see the localization uh, bit of it so what that means is i'll see what bitcoin is called or how do you type bitcoin in different languages for example, JA, I'm guessing is standing for Japan, right? So in Japanese, right? We have description. So we get Bitcoin's description that we can use. And this is obviously in English. If I scroll down, I'll see that there are a lot of other languages, right? Over here, there was uh, Korean as well somewhere. Let me just scroll to that over here, right? KO. So I'm guessing KO stands for Korean. So as you can see, this JSON object is actually really huge. The amount of data it has is massive, right? And that is what it's about. So uh, feel free to go through this documentation. I don't want to take more time on it. Like I said, this is a very short video about just the documentation. So feel free to go through it. And as we progress further in this uh, crypto series, I will be uh, you know coming back here uh, a lot just to refer to the documentation now and again. So yeah, in the next class, we are now going to start with our landing page and we'll be building the landing page header. So now we're actually going to get started with the main coding part where obviously in this video, we're going to talk about or code just the basic header that we see on our screens over here, right? So now this header is really simple to make. And as you can see, this is nothing but a header is just a nav bar. This will be position sticky so that it sticks on the top, right? Apart from that, this will obviously have the background color of uh, black that you see in the background, right? These two, uh, this heading will be in a flex, right? So this entire thing will be a flex box where this heading and these links will be separated by space between. And over here, the these links and this button is a flex as well, right? So first we'll be building this basic header and then we'll realize that this header is actually responsive and below 800 pixels, I think, as soon as we go below 800 pixels, right now we are at 940, 907, right? As soon as we go below 800 pixels, what happens is this converts into a drawer. So our header now is gone. And what we see is we just see the heading, we see this icon and on clicking of this icon, we basically get our MUI drawer, right? So if you guys have used MUI before, this would be very, very simple for you to do. But if you haven't, don't worry. I'll be helping you through the entire process. But the first things is first where we'll be building our basic header, 
right? And that basic header is nothing but it's just a simple flex box with this heading and uh, these links uh, in a you know space between, justify content space between. And obviously align items is also centered. The background is black, like I said, position is sticky and it's at the top, right? So let's let's get started and build, build our basic header. So um, as of the last video, what we have is that uh, we already have a root variables and we already have a header component as well. So why not let's just go over there and edit that component. So we go to our common components, inside our common components, inside the header, we have an index.js file. Now this is the file that is responsible for all of my header code, right? So I already have a class name called header. I'll change that to maybe make it to navbar, right? The navbar will have a display flex. The flex will be between two h1s or one h1, sorry, and one another div, right? So this is what we have. This uh, heading is obviously going to be called crypto tracker and with a full stop. Now that full stop was actually blue, if you guys remember. So the way we're going to handle that is by using the span and I'll have an inline styling over here and I'll say color is equal to VAR dash dash blue, right? So now if I save and uh, let me actually go ahead to my app.js and first get rid of the footer for now because we don't really need the footer right now. Let's just build the header. And if I go to my Google Chrome, I can actually see my heading, right? So this is already, uh, this has started to, you know, look like our header already. The only thing is we'll have to fix the uh, font size and all of that, right? So I'll give this a class name and I'll call this the logo. Right, I'll have a flex over here as well, and that flex will be called links, correct? And a lot of students like to give, um, you know, unordered lists or ordered lists over here and then style them. It's basically at the end of the day, a simple flex box, right? So I just like to keep my life simple. And over here, we'll have P tags, and these P tags will be called as link, correct? So over here, let me build the watch list page, right? We'll have the watch list, we'll have the um, home, obviously. So the home will be before the watch list. Then we'll also have a compare page, right? So basically all of the links that you see, and we'll also have an anchor tag over here, let's say. Uh, for now, we'll change that to the link that we uh, have, right? But for now, an anchor tag would work just fine. So obviously my anchor tag will be wrapping my P tag, right? And just like that, I should have my, um, header almost there right so we have all of our ahrefs home compare watch list and over here i'll make one more called as the dashboard right so i'll have my dashboard over here so if i go to my uh, google chrome now and actually have a look this is what we see obviously it's not styled the best right so firstly what i like to do is i like to give a universal styling to all of my a tags and uh, that would be just give them a white color maybe or you know just give them a color of uh, var white and also say important just to override the css hierarchy and text decoration none because right now they have that um, you know underline we don't really want that and now as you can see this looks better right so now i'll have this uh, these two things in a flex and my display uh, what do you say my links will also be a flex Right, so my links will be a flex and my navbar will be a flex. So first let's go the navbar bit. So over here, I do not need this anymore or I can just say uh, that navbar, we can get rid of this, uh, we can get rid of this. Okay, so my navbar will be a display flex. Right, I'll have justify content as space between. Right, I'll have align items as center. Then I'll have a padding or a margin. Uh, let's give a padding. And the padding will be, uh, let's do 0.5 rem and 1.5 rem, right? Or I think let's do 1.5 rem and 3 rem. Let's first see how that looks. And uh, am I missing something? Yes, position sticky, so that it sticks to the top of the page. Uh, top will be zero, left will be obviously zero as well, so that it's, you know, uh, stays at the top left. And uh, I think we should be good. Now let's actually have a look and see what we have on the screen. So this is what we see and it is also not sticking right now. We'll also fix that in a second, but yeah. <sighs> right. Let's see as to why position sticky is not working. Hmm. 
we will have to come back to this i think position fixed yeah position fix will stick but it's not going to have the same with okay we'll we'll come back to this in a second right i think it's uh yeah we will have to definitely come back to it but anyways right now let's actually get uh ahead and also our background color needs to be vr black my bad right so this looks more like it and now what we'll do is i'll also have my links over here and my links will be a flex too so i'll say links and i'll have a display flex over here my justify content will be flex end right space between will be uh, our line items will be sorry in center only and uh, let's give it a gap of 1.5 rem right so if you guys didn't know gap gives the gap between them right so as you can see this is what we get right now what we'll be doing is we'll be styling these links obviously so the class of that was called link right by default the color i'll keep it as br gray right and i'll give this a font weight and i'll give this a font weight of uh, 500 right also our logo that we have that needs to have a font size and the font size for that will be one rem so if you go over here this is one rem one rem seems to be too small so i think 1.2 rem will be good and these will be uh, i think 0.8 rem let's try how that looks so we have 0.8 rem 0.8 rem is too small so i think one rem to this as well so this is what we have right and uh, let's make the font weight as 600 so that should be good so now we have the font weight and these are gray right and this is what my logo looks like and now what we'll do is we'll actually give a hover animation as well so i'll say on hovering of these links i'll make the color as var white right and i'll give this a transition all of um, 0.3 seconds i think that should be good right so now what's going to happen is if i hover over these these will be now um, obviously these will be white right so that is about it we'll have to see as to why this is not uh, working right am i doing something wrong we'll have to definitely check that position sticky should be there top zero is there right uh, should i give this a width of 100 percent i think that will break things but let's have a look uh, nope that definitely break things i saw that coming but okay right so we will have to see as to why my position sticky is not working right or maybe just have uh, let me have a look right now in front of you so that we can debug it in front um, you know together as well so let's see am i missing something uh, let me go to my crypto dashboard december and over here let me go to my header as well so the css we have position sticky uh, top zero background color black right everything seems to be the same just z index is the only thing that is different but uh, hmm let's see how about i just copy this and uh, let's see right so this was my december let me just have this as it is right now and i don't think so anything changed uh yeah nothing seems to change yet my position stick is not working maybe position stick is not really working because there's nothing under it that could also be a possibility so uh, let me have the footer let's see yeah it is technically working okay so i think the reason why it's not working was because we have given over here uh, 200 view height right so if we remove that and if we have a component that is by default taking that space then it's working right okay that that kind of makes sense right but anyways all right so our styling was fine there's nothing wrong with the styling i think the thing was behaving weirdly because there was no element under it that is probably why right that is something that i'm actually uh, coming across first myself but okay so we have our basic header ready right now what we need to do is we need to make sure that this is responsive right and how do we do that well I, like i said we'll be using mui for that so if you guys haven't really used MUI before this is the first time you'll be learning about mui right 
So MUI is this basic React component library and notice that I'm saying React component library and I'm not saying a styling library. So a lot of people confuse React with the styling library and the reason why React is not a styling library is because it does not really help you style things. It helps you build components and obviously you can style those components differently. But at the end of the day, the core motive of MUI is to use its components. Right, and it's very simple to get started. As you go to MUI.com, you see this NPM install link. Right, so I'll just click over here. It copies the commands that I need. So I'll go to my VS code now. I'll open up my terminal. I'll open up one more terminal. And over here, I'm just going to say NPM install, add it MUI material, add it emotion slash react and emotion style. So these are all the libraries that MUI requires, right? And then I'll click on get started. So while that is happening, let's just see what MUI has to offer. Right, so then you see this components. So by default, MUI has a lot of components that you can use right off the bat. So there's this button component that they have. And something that I'll say is MUI is the kind of UI you would see on Android devices, right? So Android uses a lot of material UI and uh, that is a basic, uh, you know, that is a highly used uh, UI library, right? So over here, as you can see, the buttons have a cool effect. Whenever I click on them, do you see this animation, right? This is the contain button, this is just normal text button, this is an outline button, right? And now if I want to include th these buttons in my code, all I have to do is, is just copy this code, right? And that is about it. Or I have to just go over here, look at the import, import button from MUI uh, material slash button, and then I can just copy it, right? So uh, that is all that you need to do, essentially, right? So you have button groups, you have checkboxes, you have switches, so MUI has their own switches, and these switches work really well this is also the switch that we'll be using to make our website uh, light mode dark mode compatible as you can see over here right and anyway so there are these switches then apart from that they have these text fields they have the select tabs right so the select tab is also good over here as you can see i can select whatever i want to correct there are these things called avatars avatars are nothing but they are dps or display pictures you might say and all they take is avatar you can put an alt tag and you can have an src Right, there's these things called chips, there is material icons, which is another huge library of icons. So we'll be using these icons as well in our project. Right, so in this project, we will be having these um, icons that we'll be using. So we, I'll show you how to import these as well in a second. There's tooltip, then there are these uh, feedback components, there are the surfaces, there's these navigation tabs as well. So if you ever wondered how to make these navigation tabs, you know, the Android style bottom navigation, there is a drawer. So this is the drawer that we'll be using. So what MUI allows you to do is it allows you to create a temporary drawer and you can open these drawers from various sides. So if I click on le left, my drawer will open from the left. If I click on right, my drawer will open from the right. If I click on top, my drawer will open from the top. And similarly bottom, the drawer will open from the bottom. There is this thing called menu and what menu does is nothing but you click on it and uh, then there's this uh, kind of like a menu that pops up. Right, this pagination will be using that. There's these tabs component that we'll be using as well. So you can have tabs, right? So, and you can use, you just have to copy and paste this code to use these components. And that is the best part about MUI, right? There's a speed dial thing, which is also one of the best things that I see, right? So you might have seen various applications and various web applications have such a UI, right? And mostly Google based applications or Android based applications. So now you might have always wondered how do you do these things. So this is how you do them. There's this material UI library, which is a component library, not a styling library. I will repeat myself. Uh, you would say that Bootstrap is a styling library or Tailwind is a styling library, right? This is not a styling library. This is a component based library. And what that means is it allows you to import components altogether. Instead of importing styles, you can import full components, right? Or a mixture of components as well. So uh, yeah. So now what we'll be doing is we will be adding my drawer in my, um, uh, what do you say, in my header. And what I need to do is I just need to add my drawer whenever my screen is below 800 pixels, right? So over here, what happens is my screen is fine. As soon as I go below 800 pixels, I basically get rid of all of these links that you see. So links become display none. And then over here, I get my drawer and that is about it. Right, and this drawer code is something that I will teach you how to write. So that is something that we'll do in the next class. Like I said, these videos are supposed to be really short. And uh, yeah, so let's meet in the next class where we talk about MUI drawer and how to actually implement MUI drawer in our header. In today's lecture, we actually want to use our MUI drawer and use MUI to actually build that MUI drawer and have a UI somewhat like this. 
So before we actually get started with that, I first need to make sure that my header is responsive because what I want to do is I want to say that after a width of 800 pixels or below the screen size of 800 pixels, I want these links to go away and I want my icon to appear. And on the click of that icon, we'll basically be having our MUI drawer, right? So let's actually do that first. So uh, really sorry for that. Yeah, so let's actually do that first. So what we'll be doing is I will be now writing media queries. And if you guys don't know what media queries are, media queries basically allow us to render uh, UI differently, right? So differently based on your screen size, right? So this is the standard way of defining media queries. I'll just copy this quickly, go to my VS code, go to my style.css and over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that media only screen max with the 600 instead of 600, I'm going to say 800. And then I'm going to say dot links display none. So now what actually happens is if I go to my Google Chrome and go to my crypto tracker, what you'll see is that after a width of 800 pixels, these links will completely disappear, right? So right now we are at, we were at exactly 800. Right now we are at 827, 830, right? So if my screen size is bigger than 800 pixels, my links stay. But as soon as it, it reduces from, you know, um, we have 806, 805, 802, 801. Right now it's 801. It's 800 per 91. As soon as I go below 800, 798, for example, the links go away. So now what we want to happen is we want our uh, a hamburger menu to come over here. And on clicking of that, I want to show my drawer, right? So for that, what we'll be doing is we'll first see how our drawer works. And like I sh sh uh, showed you, right, MUI drawers or any MUI component is very simple to replicate. All you need to do is actually just copy this code that they have over here. Right. So how about we do that first? So let's just copy this entire code and see what we get. So I'll go to my VS code over here. I'll create a new file called drawer.js where I'll have my drawer and let me just paste the code. So I'm doing nothing, but I'm just simply pasting this code. And now what I'll do is I'll create a div over here or over here also I can create that div, uh, but that would be a little complicated. So let's go to my index over here and let's see that outside these links, I create a new div and I say div class name and I give this a class name of mobile dash drawer, right? And inside this, I have my drawer. Now this is a component that I just uh, used my MEI codes. I haven't even read the code right now. Let's, let's not even read the code. Let's just entirely copy it blindly and see what we get, right? So over here, what I want to do now is before I show the UI, I basically want to say that, you know, by default, this mobile drawer is not visible, obviously, because I don't want my mobile drawer to be visible on a desktop. I only want my mobile drawer to be visible when my links are gone. So over here, when I say dot links display none, I'll say dot mobile drawer display block. And does that make sense? Right. So now let's actually go to our uh, Google Chrome and see what we get. And my guess is firstly, there will be an error. And I know that uh, because we haven't really imported uh, what do you say icons material right so this is important because we'll have some icons over here so let's actually first see if we get an error or not and as you can see my guess is correct we get an error and that error is because we say that uh, it says that cannot resolve MUI icons right now the thing about MUI is that since it is such a widely used library you can always google the errors you get and you will always find a solution to that problems Right. So it says, how can I import material UI icons over here? It says just have MUI icons material, right? So all you need to do is just NPM I, um, MUI icons material. And that is all that you need to do it. Do I'll go over here. I will go to my, uh, terminal and I'll say NPM install MUI icons material. Now, as soon as that is done, our code will have zero errors and we'll actually see what we, you know, have. So what are we doing right now? We have our header <coughs> index and uh, in that header index, what we're doing is we're basically rendering the temporary drawer component. Now this temporary drawer component is something that we get from our slash drawer fly file. This is my slash drawer file and this is the code that we basically copied from MUI. So now if it makes sense, this is the component that we copied, this component, right? So if I go to my crypto tracker over here, what should I see? I see the exact same component. Do you notice anything different in this? 
apart from the color change obviously no right so you basically see the exact same component now if i press on left i'll have my left drawer if i press on right i'll have my right drawer if i press press on top i'll have my uh, drawer on the top if i say bottom my drawer will come from the bottom and that is how simple it is to actually use any MUI component, whatever MUI component that you want to use is. You can actually, you know, technically just blindly copy the code, make a new component, paste it, render that component, and then we come to the part where we will edit this code to our liking, right? So now if you actually read through this code, what exactly is happening is that they're first mapping all of this. So there is a left, right, top, bottom, and then they're mapping all of this. Then they're calling whatever we are mapping as an anchor, and obviously they're giving it a separate key, they're making it in, into a button, then they have this drawer, right? So now what I'll do is I'll actually make all of our lives very simple because I've already understood this code, right? So firstly, we'll get rid of this thing. So you see that there is a drawer component and inside this, they're calling this list function. And this is their list function that they have over here, right? So we don't really need it. How about we just get rid of it, right? Let's just get rid of it. It is unnecessary. We do not need it over here. Now, let me just say H1 and let me just say hi so now what i've done is i've inside my drawer i have hi written right so if i go to my google chrome and if i say left now it just says hi so now something that i realize is that whatever i want to render inside my drawer i just need to have it inside my drawer and i mean that makes sense because this is my drawer component and i what I, whatever i want to render inside my drawer i need to have it over here right then something that I realize is we don't really need four options. We just need the option that opens the door from the right, right? So how about we get rid of all of this? Correct. Will it still work? Yes, it does. So now we just have a right button and on clicking of it, the door opens from the right. Correct. Now, if you actually kind of dive deeper into the code, you'll realize that it is just nothing, but it is just use states. So there's this one state which we need to maintain that the door is open or not. And that is about it. And one function to make sure that the door drawer closes and opens. Right. So what we'll do is I will actually, how about we get rid of all of these things. We do not need react fragments as well. We just need a button and we just need a drawer. Right. What I'll do is, uh, I'll create some new states as well. How about we just create a state const and this state will be called open comma set open. Right. Because there are only two states involved in my drawer. Right, so I have this state and over here now I'm going to say uh, false. Right, what I'll do is I'll also import react normally. Uh, obviously react router, I mean, I mean I has a separate way of uh, importing react. I don't, I'm not really a fan of it. So what we'll do is we'll just say import new state from react normally. Right. So we have a use state uh, imported from react normally. Um, yeah. And now what we'll do is on click of this, how about we just write an arrow function and the job of that arrow function is really simple. We will just say set open is equal to true and that's it. Right. Over here, instead of the I icon, let me say um, open, right or open drawer then what we have we have a drawer the anchor will be right because we want I'll, I'll come to this right and this will be open on close what we want to do is we want to set open as false and that is all that we need to do so another arrow function and basically say set open is equal to false right and now you realize this that we boiled down whatever code that MUI was using into this which is very very simple and now if I actually go to my Google Chrome you'll see that I have this button which says open drawer I click on it my drawer opens and I see whatever I have inside my drawer and that is all that I need to do so what did I do I basically made a state use state which is there to maintain my drawer over here I have a drawer the drawer takes an anchor the anchor is right if I say left my drawer will open from the left as you can see if I say uh, top my drawer will open from the top, right? So what exactly is happening is anchor is basically the place from where my drawer opens. Open is this use state, which is just if it's true, my drawer will be open. So by default, let's make it true. If it's true, always my drawer will always be open, right? 
if I say false, my drawer will always be closed. So it doesn't matter if I click, keep clicking on this button. The only way it will work the way I want to work is that I pass this use state. And I say that, you know, on ticking of the button, we set open as true. So this becomes true. So my drawer opens. Now there's an already an inbuilt method inside my drawer, which is on close. And all I need to do is I need to set my use state as false. And as soon as I set my use state false, this becomes false. And as soon as this becomes false, my drawer just collapses. And that is all that I need to do. Right. Now what we'll be doing is now we'll actually be using an MUI icon to uh, make this into this hamburger icon that we see. Right. If I go over here, this is the hamburger icon that we see and I'll be using my MUI uh, icons for that. So let's go to MUI website again. And over here, there's this thing called MUI icons, material icons, as you can see. We click over here, right? And over here, we get our icons. So the icon that I want is the menu one. So I'll just say menu, we get this. Now the icons that I really like are the rounded ones. And the difference between filled, outlined, and rounded is very simple. Right over here, the edges are a little curved, and that's it. So I'll click on this icon, since this is the icon that I want. And now I already get the import, right? So I'll just click on it, click to copy. I copied my import. I'll go to my VS code over here. I'll import my icon. And now all I need to do is do is over here. I'll just say material icon. And that is all that I need to do, right? Now there's another concept in re, uh, MUI called uh, icon button. So the normal button and icon button is just the effect that you see. Right, so I'll just wrap this inside an icon button instead of a normal button, right? Let me copy it, let me paste it, and let me import icon button as well. So icon button also comes from MUI, right? I can get rid of this now, and that is about it. Okay, so now this part is done. So now if I actually go to my Google Chrome, you'll see that I do see my icon. By default, it's blue, and the reason why it's blue is just because um, the color is blue, right? So what I'll do is I'll give this a class name and the class name that I'll give it is link. So if you guys remembered, link is the class name that we gave to our links right over here. And they were, that was, uh, that had a color of gray by default. So now my icon has a color of gray by default and hovering over it, it actually has uh, the color white, right? And now, as you can see, we are slowly getting where we want to. So now all I need to do is inside my drawer, I need to have a div which contains all of my links. So I can just copy this code, all of it. And all I all I need to do is wrap this inside a div. And I'll tell you why we're doing that. Right. And uh, have all of my links over here. Now, as soon as I do that, if we go to our Google Chrome, if I click on my drawer, this is the drawer that we see. Obviously, it doesn't look the best. So how do we change that? We give it custom styling. So the way to do that is first, let me give this a class name and I'll give this a class name of, let's say, um, draw dash div. So this is the div which is inside the drawer, right? So now I'll go to my styles of CSS. I will style it and I'll style it inside my um, media query only. And I'll give it a width of, uh, let's say 40 view width. Okay, I'll give it a background color of VR black, obviously and uh, let's see what we have now if i go over here this is what we see so now my drawer is there but obviously it's not taking the full uh, height so i'll obviously have to give this a height as well so i'll say height and i'll make the height as 100 vuh go back this is what we see so the height is now 100 vuh and my drawer is working now i just need to add a little bit of a padding and then we're all set so the padding obviously will be 1.5 rem and just like that our entire drawer is now completely done Right, and if you notice, our entire, in, in fact, our entire header is now done. Since over here, if we move anything, um, you know, above 800 pixels, we see our links. If I go anywhere below 800 pixels, we see our drawer, right? And that is what we wanted to do. Now, something that I really uh, like to do is that as my uh, media queries or as my screen starts to get smaller and smaller, I like to keep, uh, reduce my font size as well. So my dot logo, I'll give that a font size of uh, one rem. Okay. I'll give my nav bar a padding of, uh, if you guys remember, this is the padding that we gave 1.5 rem and three rem. What I'll do is I'll just give it an in general padding of 1.5 rem, right? Then what we'll do is I'll also give my links dot link a font size of 0.8 rem. So I'll say dot link is already there. I think, no, it's not here. So dot link, I'll give it a font size of 
uh, 0.8 run my bad right I do need to save it just a second so I save my code I go over here and now as you can see notice how my uh, the padding is more over here and the size of the font is bigger as well as soon as I go below 800 pixels my font size reduces a little my padding re reduces a little so my code looks a little you know or my website looks a little better and on clicking of the door we see our door as well right I think I don't need to reduce the link size uh, let's keep it the same uh, point eight is too less this is still normal right and this is completely responsive and we have successfully integrated our MUI drawer with our header so now our header uh, is completely responsive completely nice and this is also one of the best draws out there so this gives a really good feel and this does not completely lag it is fully responsive and everything works like a charm right so with this I think our header is done and there's something that is left and the that thing that is left is making our button component because as you can see dashboard is not really a link over here it's a button so in the next class we'll actually make our dashboard into a button so we'll be making a button component which will be a common component and as soon as we get started with that we'll then uh, work our way through our entire uh, landing page component and with after that our entire landing page will be done and then we'll move forward to our dashboard right in today's class we are going to actually uh, do a very simple job where we convert this dashboard url into a button because as you guys see in the crypto project that we're building we have this button component now this button is a button that we'll be using now and again so that is why we're going to make a common component out of it so we're just going to see how to make a custom button and uh, we'll be using it again and again throughout our ent entire website right as you can see that button actually has two parts one is the basic one and one is the outline version and uh, both all of them are clickable on clicking of this you see a custom function so let's let's actually work on uh, making that happen right so we'll actually go to our vs code and i'll go to my common folders where i'll create this new component called button so over here my button will obviously have an index.js right and my button will also have a styles.css once that is done i'll go to my button i'll say rfce over here I'll import button and I will also import my styles from import dot slash styles dot CSS so now my button uh, component is there so how about I actually pass a prop over here called text and I show this over here right so let's uh, copy this let's go to our header and over here we need to replace this thing with our text so how about I get rid of this and I have my button over here and I have this thing called text and inside this text I say dashboard right so if I now go to my Google Chrome and go to my localhost 3000 we see that button is not defined obviously we'll have to import our button so I'll just import that quickly so we import button from my button folder and not from my MUI so make sure that's the case right once you do that we see here that this is the button that we have so now all I need to do is I just need to style it according to my need right so over here I'll have a class name and I'll give this class name called btn and obviously I'll go to my style.css over here I'll say .btn I'll give this uh, button a background color of var blue dash dash blue then what we'll do is I'll give it uh, the color var white right and then uh, we would like to give it a padding as well so let's give it a padding of 0.5 rem and 1.5 rem i don't know if that's a lot we'll see we'll give it a border radius of 3 rem as well and now let's actually see what we get i go to my google chrome this is what i see so it's already looking like my button that i have right the only thing that i need to do is i will go ahead and i'll increase the font weight so let's say 600 and I'll say cursor pointer since it's a button and now actually let's get you know head over and see so this is how my button looks and this is pretty good maybe something that I'll do is I'll increase the padding uh, vertical padding by 0.75 and uh, that seems a little too much uh, let's see maybe 0.7 if that'll be fine uh, that seems to be a little better but yeah so this is what we have and now something that I wanted to discuss was that over here when we hover over this button you see that there is the shadow that we give right so now how do we actually do that and um, to be more precise I think everyone knows how to give the uh, box shadow property but how many of us actually know how to create this box shadow 
and because I see a lot of beginners, they just hit and try with these values and it never really works out in their favor. Like their imagination or in their imagination, the button should, you know, just let's say something like it should glow or something like that. But when they end up coding it, it doesn't really work out uh, really well. So there are actually a lot of tools for box shadow and specifically one great tool that obviously I like to use is Figma. So you can actually head over to the Figma and if you guys remember, we have made our uh, crypto tracker Figma as well. So let me just quickly open that. So I think I have it over here and I'll just teach you how to create your own box shadows using Figma and then we can export that from Figma as well. Right. So uh, let's wait for the entire page to load. And as soon as that's done, we'll create our box shadow and we'll actually, you know, uh, make a custom shadow as well. So we're here, as you can see, we do have this button, right? And this already has a shadow applied to it. So let's actually get rid of it. So now what we'll do is we'll actually click on effects and like first select the component that you want to then click on effects. And as soon as you do that, by default, Figma applies a little shadow to it, right? So obviously the color of the shadow will be this and, um, or maybe we'll keep it something like this, which is 50% of, you know, our blue color, right? The opacity is 50%. Then what we'll do is maybe increase the X, say five, right? Increase this as well, say five, increase the blood and say 10, right? And I think if you want to play with spread, you can. And um, okay, so spread is not working for us right now. But anyways, so even this shadow looks really cool and it looks like it's, you know, it is more or less like glowing. And this is the effect that we wanted. Now, once your shadow is done, just click on inspect over here and you can actually get this drop shadow element. So now all you need to do is just copy it. Let's go over to our VS code. What I'll do is I'll say dot button and I'll make a hover animation and I'm going to say box shadow. So I'll make the box shadow equal to this thing, right? And I don't really need to give it a drop shadow like this. I can just do this, right? So now as soon as I do this and I'll say transition, uh, let's do all and 0.3 seconds. So as soon as I do do that, and go to my Google Chrome, I should have a button with this kind of an animation, right? And this looks pretty cool because the button glows then, correct? So uh, if you ever are stuck with box shadows, just go to Figma and make your own or there are actually online tools, uh, tools as well. So box shadow uh, generator. And what you can do is just go to the first website. This is one of the websites that I've already used. And all you need to do is, is just you can play with these values. Right. So the orange div is the div that you want. So over here, we'll maybe have something like blue, like this shade and the shadow color also we'll give something like blue or this shade, right? Or maybe even this similar shade and maybe decrease the opacity of it. Um, there must be a way. Okay. So to decrease the opacity, it is over here. So what we can do is decrease the opacity like this, right? We can obviously increase the spread radius, decrease the spread radius, increase the blur radius and so on. And then, you know, mix and match with these values. And as you can see, it gives that glowing effect. And uh, yeah, and you can increase the vertical length, you know, um, if you want it to be exactly from the center, you can just make it zero pixels over here. Also, if you make it zero pixels, it'll be from uh, every angle that there is, right? And yeah, so there's a lot of things that you can do. And at the end of the day, just copy this box shadow code right? Like over here, this is it. So that is all you need to do. So something that I really uh, find helpful is such tools for box shadow and maybe even grid. If you ever want to create grids in HTML and CSS, you can also use grid online generator, by the way, right? And CSS grid online generator. And then you can just kind of make your own grid using such things. And uh, you can get the, what you say, CSS code. So I think, please may I have some code, then you can get the CSS code. Right. So start using tools like this, because at this point uh, in module F specifically, we all know that you guys know the basics, but it is all about making yourself, uh, you know, much more efficient. So nobody's really going to um, ask you how you got the job done as long as you get the job done. And you should obviously know how to get the job done on your own as well. I'm not saying that, but it just makes your life, uh, you know, lives a bit easier. And I really believe in, you know, uh, using such tools that are out there to actually create good design. Correct. Anyways, so once you do that, our button over here seems to be ready, right? Now we'll just add one more thing in our button, which is um, an on click event. So how about I pass an on click event over here? And what we'll do is I'll have an on click 
over here and I'll say on clicking of this just run this function right so obviously it'll be an arrow function so that it doesn't uh, kind of get caught in a loop and this just runs once and this is what we have so now if I go to my header actually I can create an on click over here and I can just say on click and maybe inside my on click I have something like um, console logging right so I can just say console.log uh, button click right right now this takes me to the same page so how about I write a hash over here and okay let's go to Google Chrome and over here if I click on my button now that should show me this button clicked in my console right so as you can see that does happen and that is what I wanted now another thing that we want to do is that since this is a component we want to make sure that the style or the component does not really break anywhere and we also need to make another uh, button called outlined right so we'll have the same code for my normal button and my outline button so what I'll do is over here I'll say I'll conditionally render my classes I'll say if outline is there then the class that I'll be using for is outline dash button right I'll go to my style.css so now over here all I need to do is technically just copy this code and have dash outlined dash button and have dot outlined dash button and now what we want to do is we want to give this uh, border as well and background color should be black so my background color is black my color is white that is fine my border will be two pixels solid uh, we are blue right and on the hover of this button what I want to do is I want to say background color becomes we are blue and not the shadow so now if we go to our code over here and if I say outlined and I say is equal to true that means my button is the outline button so now what will happen is this is how my button looks right now it doesn't look uh, the way I wanted it to let's actually see what's happening so over here we have outlined dash button so I think it's outlined and now I have my outline button which looks like this as you can see it is very similar to what we have over here right and I'll actually do one thing where you know I'll actually get rid of this uh, padding 0.7 rem I think padding 0.5 rem was fine right so we'll keep it to 0.5 rem and something that I like to do is I like to give this a uh, border as well but this time the border is just um, yeah if it's blue it's fine right so this way what happens is at least the uh, buttons next to each other they look at the same size because otherwise what would have happened is this one would have the border and this wouldn't so there would be a size difference right now at least I have uh, I've made a component and in this component what's happening is that my button um, you know I've made two uh, two buttons one is my outline version and one is my normal version obviously and with time there are certain places where this will break like I think we need to have text align center so that we make sure that our button is always text align center right and something that uh, we need to take care of is also min width so min width let's keep uh, 150 pixels so we make sure that our button does not decrease anywhere below 150 and the reason for that is basically what if we have two buttons right let's say I have one more button over here and the text for that is share that we're going to do correct so now what's going to happen is over here share and dashboards share would have had a smaller size and I think 150 is a lot so what we'll do is we'll give it a min width of uh, 100 pixels I think that would be fine right uh, 100 pixels is fine and see I'll tell you what happens when you don't have this code when you comment out both of these lines you'll see that share button is a lot smaller than the dashboard button and we don't really want that and one more thing that we realize is we need to also have a text transform and it says capitalize so that means even if my uh, starting letter is small like as you saw with my share button right it's going to still have a capital S so these are all the things that you need to take care of when you're building a common component like you know you cannot really ask the user to have a, you know pass a text or ask any other developer who's using your code to pass a text which is capitalized on its own so you need to take care of that you need to make sure that there's a text line you need to make sure that there's a min width so that even if the buttons word is very small we know that our button will at least take this much space right and uh, yeah that is about it so now what we can do is I'll just get rid of this obviously share button is not needed right now and uh, yeah that is it so now our header is actually coming uh, 
very well together because we have the dashboard icon uh, dashboard link over here but inside our desktop view we still have the button and as you know this button is clickable so we can actually pass some functions that we want to or we can obviously wrap this button with an a tag and our link will be uh, you know our link will work so all right i think this is good for this video and this is how you can make custom components that you want to use again and again in your projects right in the next video we'll actually get started with the landing page and we'll make this component we'll learn how to do this animation and we'll also start with this um, phone and gradient layout by the end of that video in today's video we're just going to start off with the landing page or the landing page component my bad so okay so what do we have to build so these are the things that we want to build so firstly we have to build these two headings which are really really uh, huge and uh, you know this one has a hover animation which shows something like this and then we have this component we have a simple paragraph then we have these two buttons and these two components we've already made so it's pretty it's going to be pretty simple to make this but then we have this component and this component has a gradient background and this has these two images right and uh, after this phone image actually this phone image is actually an animated thing which is going constantly up and down right so now this is not been done using keyframes even though there's a easier method of using keyframes to do it but we'll actually do this using frame and motion and frame and motion is this library that we'll talk about in the next class so okay let's just get started and build the left side first and then we'll come to this right so what do we need to do to do that so we already have made our landing page uh, folder inside our component so now inside this folder we'll obviously have the main component right so we have the main component and now in this main component, we're going to have an index.js and we'll have a styles.css, right? We will have a styles.css. So now over here, what we'll do is inside my index.js, I'll say RFCE obviously and say main component. And I will also have my import from my styles like this, right? So that is how that works. I'll just quickly copy this, go to my app.js and have the landing page component over here. And okay, if I import it, I'll import it like this. And if I go to my screen, this is what we see right now. We see our main component right here, right? So first things first, I need to build a flex so that this thing and this thing are, uh, you know, have space between amongst them. And another reason why I'm using flex is because in the mobile view, the image will be in a column. Right now it's in a row, but in the mobile view, it'll be in a column, right? So using flex just makes our lives much more easier, specifically in this case. And yeah, so let's actually get started with that. So I'll go to my main component. Inside my main component, we're going to have a flex div. So I think we can just have this div as my flex div. So I'll have uh, flex dash info, right? And the reason why I'm saying info is because one will be the left component and the other will be the right component and the left is technically an information, right? So we have two divs over here. So this one is basically for my uh, phone, for my phone component. And this one is the one where I'll have all of my headings. So I'll obviously say class name, then have the left dash component over here, component. And then I'll have some H1s. So first H1 I'll have over here. And I'll give this a class name of, um, let's do, uh, what is the heading? It is track crypto, right? So I can just say track dash crypto dash heading. Then I'll have another H1, which is in real time. So I'll just say real time heading, right? Real dash time heading. So obviously the text for this says uh, track crypto. Then over here we have um, real time, right? And that is what we have. So if I go to my Google Chrome and I go over here, this is what we see. So now we need to style it accordingly. And as you can see, the phone is still over here. So we need to make our flex as well, right? So I'll go to my flex, I'll copy my flex info. I'll go to my style.css and I'll say dot flex info. Then the first thing that we want to do is we say display flex, obviously. I want to say justify content space between right align items uh, for now let's just say uh, flex start so that they're at the top right it might not be needed in the future we'll have to see and then i'll also say padding and the padding that i'll give is uh, 1.5 rem and 3 rem to the sides 
So the reason why I'm giving three rem to the size is because over here I've given three rems, if you guys remember. So this way at least that thing is maintained, right? And I think uh, 1.5 rem is not really needed. Let's see if 0.5 rem works. 0.5 rem is also good. Okay. So now what we need to do is I will have my track crypto heading over here, right? And there are some things that are common with dot track crypto heading and with my real time heading, like the size and the margin and all of those things. So I'll be styling both of these together. So I'll say font size is let's do six rem, I think. Uh, six rem looks like this. And is the size same? Yes, six, 6.5, I think. Let's see if 6.5 is too large. Hmm, I think it's 6.5. And what we'll also do is I'll say margin zero. So what that will do is that will kind of, um, yeah, you see how the margin zero affects my code. Because before that, what was happening was uh, there was a by default H1 tags, P tags, they all have a margin top and margin bottom. But if you get rid of margin zero, then they kind of stick together. Right now, it's just the line height which is affecting their height. Right. So, okay, that is done. And now we'll obviously have some custom coding. So I'll say dot track crypto heading and I'll give the color of blue to this. Right. Or I think this is the color of white only we have the um, other heading which is blue right yes real time is the heading which is blue and i think let's do seven run let's see how that looks so then we have dot real time heading so i'll give dot real time heading the color of vr blue right now i actually want to do this animation where on the hover of this particular heading i want it to become something like this right i want it to have this kind of an animation so now, do you guys know what this is called? This entire thing is called uh, a stroke and a stroke width. So you can actually go and uh, Google about this. So you can say stroke uh, width to text in CSS, right? And if we Google, I think we should be able to see this adding stroke to web text. And what this allows is all you need to do is this, right? So let's just do one thing where we copy these two codes and see what we have. So let me say uh, to my crypto heading only, and let's say I want to give this color VR blue and let's see what we get, right? So if I go over here, go to my code, this is what we see. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there is a blue border to my entire heading, right? And now I can increase the width as well. Maybe I can say two pixels, right? Two pixels look like this, maybe even three. Three might look good too. Three looks like this, right? So now it is much more evident. So now in the animation that I want, what I want is that my text stroke is white and my color becomes black. And I'll tell you why that is needed. So let's say if I have my text stroke color as white as well, right? And my color is also white. So what happens is my, uh, this, I see no change. Like there is a stroke which has been added to this. So that's why it's a little thicker, but there's no change. And if you want to see that the stroke was added, just increase this to 30 pixels you'll see that the stroke was definitely added, right? But the thing is, we do not see any change. So the reason for that is that our color is white, right? So my color, if I make it as black, you'll see that now I see uh, what I needed to, right? And this is exactly what I wanted. So what we'll do is we'll actually go over here and we'll say dot uh, track crypto heading hover. And on the hover of it, I'll just change the color of this and the color of this. So this will be white by default. And what we want is on hovering, we want the text stroke color to become white and uh, we just want the color to become black, right? And I'll say text uh, or I'll say transform all in 0.3 seconds, right? So now if I hover over my text, this is something that I see and it's not really smooth. So I think uh, it's transition, my bad. So transition all 0.3 seconds and this way it's a little smoother, right? And this is exactly what we wanted. Correct. So this is also done. Then what we want is we want to have this P tag. So I'll just copy this over here. I'll go to my index.js. I'll have a P tag right below this, right? I'll have my text over here and I'll also give this a styling. So I'll say class name um, info dash text, right? I'll copy this. I will go to my Cycle CSS. I'll say dot input text and I'll give this a font size of one rem, I think. And I'll say a font size is light only by default and color will be VR gray. Right. 
Now let's see what we see. Uh, if I go to my crypto tracker, this is exactly what we wanted. And I think um, hmm, seven might be long. Let's stick to 6.5 rem only, right? And then what we need to do is we need to have a button flex. So we'll have a dev over here, which is nothing but it's very simple. I'll have my class name over here and um, yeah, I will have a button dash flex and this will be a flex as well. And this will have two buttons. So one will be obviously, uh, one will have the text of dashboard and the other will have the text of uh, share right the only difference is over here outline will be true so outline is true one will be outline button and the other will be the normal one right outlined so make sure you get the spelling right so this is not outline it is outlined correct we are already importing it so if i go and see how my uh, screen looks like now this is how it looks which obviously makes sense so let's go to my button flex and actually say that um, this button flex is also going to be a display flex, right? And I'll actually click justify content flex start this time, right? And I'll have a gap of, let's say 1.5 rem and a line item should be centered. Once that is done, my buttons will look like this. I'll also give this a margin top of 1.5 rem. So that means at least there's a margin top as well and that way this looks like this which is much more cleaner and better all right so just like that our left side is done maybe i'll give it a little more margin to them sounds good right and yeah so this is now equidistance so this has two rem this has two rem this looks a little better and yeah so with this our entire left component or left side is done now what we need to do is we just need to worry about our phone component right and we need to have our phones here in today's class like i said we'll be building the phone component now to build that phone component, what I've actually done is I've actually gone ahead and I've already imported these two files. So one is my iPhone.png and the other is my gradient.png. You guys can import these files from your Figma or if you want, you can have a new gradient and you can have a new iPhone image, whatever suits you. If you want to have some other images, the design is totally yours. So feel free to do whatever you want to, but these assets will also be linked in the document that I had provided earlier. And yeah, so without any further ado, let's actually start coding it. Right, so uh, this will be a part of our landing page itself. And over here you see we have the phone component, right? So what I'll first do is I'll make a class name for this and I'll basically call this as my um, phone dash uh, container, right? Or I can just call it the gradient container or whatever I want to, or can, I can even call it the right container. The class name is up to you. So now over here, we'll have two images right one will be for the gradient and the other will be for the iphone right so like you guys know it's very simple to import assets into react all you can do is just say import iphone uh, from and then i can just go dot dot slash dot dot slash then dot dot slash again then we have assets and inside assets we have iphone dot png right yeah similarly i can have um gradient and for that all i need to do is just say gradient and over here i just need to say gradient png so these two are the files and now all i can do is have my iphone like this and have my gradient like this and that should be good enough so if i go to my page now as you can see my iphone is there and my gradient is there obviously i need to style them properly but as you can see it is there right so now our life becomes really simple. Uh, what I need to do is first I'll give this a class name as well and I'll call this the iPhone image, right? Then I'll give the other one the class name of gradient and now we get to style it, right? So firstly, I'll be copying this class name, going to size of CSS over here. What we'll say is we'll say dot phone container. Uh, let's give it a width of 50% firstly because we want it to be on the right side of the screen. Right, and what I'll do is I'll say position relative. So now this way, what I can do is I can give my iPhone the position of absolute and I can give my gradient the position of absolute as well. Right, and this way, what will happen is both of these images will kind of superimpose. There'll be one on the other, right? If I go to my Google Chrome now, this is what I see. As you can see, we are already almost there. 
Now what I need to do is I will uh, give my iPhone a higher Z index. So I'll say Z index of 100. So that means iPhone will be on top of the gradient. And now what I can do is I can just simply say, um, I cannot define the width. So I think I'll keep the width of the iPhone as uh, 250 pixels. And we'll keep, keep the width of the gradient as 250 as well. And let's see what we have. So this is what we have. 250 is way too less. So what I'll do is I will increase the width of this thing to let's say 350 and I'll keep this as 300. All right, let's see how that looks. Uh, this still looks a little better, but I think the phone and the iPhone can be a little larger. So what we'll do is I'll say min width of both of these things is this, right? But I'll give my iPhone a width of let's say 50%. Let's see how that looks. Um, not bad. And I'll give this a width of 50% as well. So how would I give this a width of 40% and I make this as 280 or something. Yeah, so this is what we see. Uh, so yeah, this is not that bad. Right, so you guys can obviously style this according to your needs. Uh, I'll just quickly do it. Right, now what I need to do is I need to say that, um, okay, so my iPhone is like this and my gradient is like this, right? So the iPhone is technically above the gradient and the gradient is shifted a little down, right? So it's very simple. All I need to do is let's shift the gradient down. So I can just say top has been given, let's say, um, two rim and we can say left is zero. And how about we say left? or right is zero, my bad. I'll say right is zero over here and I'll say right as zero over here as well. So that means they will both be to the extreme right of the page and that is what we wanted. And now what I'll do is I'll increase the top a little more, right? So that it's a little at the bottom. I'll do it a little more, so something like this. And this now does look good, right? So as you can see, we are almost there anyways, right? And uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll increase the padding of this component a little. So let's say 4M. And let's see how that looks. So 4M completely destroys it. Uh, 4M is a lot. Let's see 1RAM. How does 1RAM look? Yeah. So this does not look that bad. This looks really good. Right. So uh, we can technically say that we are uh, fine with this. If you guys want, you guys can, you know, make this responsive as well. And you guys should. So let's actually quickly get to that part as well. So now as you can see, this is, uh, so this is how it looks as soon as the screen shrinks. So I guess we should really kind of decrease the size a little. So maybe I can make the min width of this as 300 and make the min width of this as 250. So at least it does shrink a little bit, right? So yeah, that is a little better. So this way is at least the phone size shrinks a little and then it stays constant, right? And what I would do is around to 1200, I would decrease the font size of this so that at least this uh, stays in the alignment that we asked it to stay in, right? So for that, we'll be writing some media queries. So let's just go quickly get our media queries in CSS. And yeah, just get these lines and paste this in our VS code over here. So let's say we have two 1200 pixels. And what I would want to do in 1200 pixels is just reduce the size of these two things. So like over here at 6.5, let's make it 5RAM. That means at least it will be a little uh, more sorted, right? And if you go to a crypto tracker um, below 1200 pixels, I think, yeah, this is how it looks. So I think I can make it 1250. So that means at least it looks like this, right? And then obviously once our screen size goes below, um, let's say 800, right? That is where our website also starts to break a little. So what we'll do is below a thousand, right? let's also decrease the size of these two gradients as well. So iPhone and gradient, like right now, right, right now the min width is what? It's 300 pixels, so let's make this 250 and let's make this as 200. And the top also I'll reduce to six then, right? The rest, everything else will stay the same, so we don't really need to have that, right? Uh, similarly over here also, everything else will stay the same, we don't really need to have that. And this is what it looks like, so this way is at least uh, you know, as my screen size is decreasing, my mobile also decreases a little, right? And then around 800 pixels, we can completely have this at the bottom. So what we'll do is we'll have a final media query at around 800 pixels. So now this way, I think uh, every one of you must understand that the point of media queries is just to make your website look good and make your website look responsive. So there's never a fixed, uh, you know, never a fixed uh, width at which you want to add breaks. So it depends. So just keeps, you know, kind of messing with the screen size of your entire website. And that is how you guys decide, you know, 
what are the breaking points you want to keep in your website anyways so now we'll just make this uh, flex direction column and let's see how that looks so immediately this is how that looks and now things are not really aligned properly and the reason for that is our phone container doesn't really have the entire width right so first things first what i'll do is i would make my phone container and i would say margin left or i can just give margin auto as well right and i would like to give it a display of block so this way at least everything becomes centrally aligned and now what I need to do is now I just need to make sure that my image and my image gradient are aligned properly right so for that I think what I need to do is just say dot iPhone over here and I can just say um, and dot gradient as well and let's see how that looks and I can just have my left as 20 percent right this phase both of them are now centered to the screen and um, here I can just have my iPhone as 20% and I can have my gradient um, as let's do 25% so this is how it looks this is not really centered so what we'll do is I'll say 15 to this and 20 to that let's see if this looks centered uh, not really mm. Nope. Oh, this needs to be gradient. My bad. Yeah. All right. So this is how that looks. Now it's just a matter of hit and trying these values. So whatever it works, right? And whatever works for you, honestly. But anyways, and what I'd also like to do is I'd also like to give this a margin top, and uh, let's do five rem. Right, 5 rem may be a lot, let's do 3 rem. And so this has a margin top now and this is how my entire website looks. What I can also do is I can have all of these things as a uh, text line center as well. Right, so that way uh, everything will be centrally aligned and that is a good practice to do. So we can quickly do that as well. So I think uh, for that all I need to do is, is these two headings. I need to make text line center and I need to have my button flex as center. Okay. So these two are the headings that we have. So obviously I'll go over here and um, we can also decrease the font size a little and I can say text align centered, right? So that means my headings are now centered and they are still not centered properly. So we will have to see as to why that's happening. I think that's because left component, um, hmm, left component should be taking full width. So let me say dot left dash component and what I'll do is I'll give this a width of 100% uh, that means this is now centrally aligned we'll have our paragraph text as centrally aligned as well so where is our paragraph text I think it is this dot info text so I'll have dot info text as text line center right so dot info text as um, text line center and then our button flex will be dot dash button flex. We can, how about we just give it a margin of auto. And let's see how that looks. Um, hmm. Okay, let's just have it at center then. So let's just have uh, just by content and center. And just like that, our entire page has now become responsive. And as you can see, this should ideally not look that bad. Okay. We will still have to fix it a little. So we'll have to decrease the font size a little more. So let's do 3 them. And this is how the font size looks then. And what I would like to do is I would also like to decrease this um, border that we are giving it. So the web kit uh, text stroke width, I would like to decrease that as well. And let's say, let's make it uh, two pixels, right? So that is dot track crypto heading let me just give it uh, one pixel or two pixels or let's do 1.5 pixels correct so this way is a little thinner now and even one pixel would look good and yeah right this looks good now so then we need to still figure out a way to style our phones properly because that is still messing a little bit hmm so let's see what can be done right apparently if we just get rid of our lefts 
they should be fine so by default this is centered and I can just center my should I just center my phone container a little more let's see hmm see this is the problem problem with absolute uh, positioning that you will have to take care of the uh, positions that you're giving so right is zero over here right hmm and the thing is this image is actually uh, this size I see so that is why it's happening okay so let's give the iPhone not a laptop I think 5% would be good 5% seems to be a lot as well so maybe hmm zero pixels should I give it a minus of two then let's see yeah so anyways you guys can play with these values and see whatever suits you and suits your needs right so anyways whatever works the best for you guys just do that and that is I think the apt way to do it but now our website is a little responsive so yeah so it is responsive for almost the entire screen and now what we need to do is we need to add our animation right so in the last class we also talked about how whenever we reload the page there's this animation that happens and then over here also we see that the iPhone is continuously floating up and down now even though this can be done using keyframes we will not be using keyframes for this we will be using a custom library called frame and motion and uh, frame and motion is this really really cool library that is out there and all you need to do is just say npm i frame and motion and that is how you will install it Right, so we can just say npmi framer dash motion and uh, yeah this is a really really cool library and if you want to look at the documentation the documentation of this is also very simple just say framer.com and or you can just um, yeah framer.com slash motion slash examples so this link will be provided to you guys in the document that I've shared it is already there and all you need to do is just uh, you know uh, go through the examples and there are a lot of things that frame motion provides you right from the bat right right off the bat so yeah so basically it provides you basic animations like you know let's say if we repeat this what do we have this uh, circle just appears really nicely right as you can see right it just appeared uh, smoothly the opacity was zero in the beginning then the opacity became one and that is how it happened then you have such animations where you can have different keyframes as well so imagine doing this, but uh, you can obviously do this with keyframes as well, but this is just a way more cleaner way of doing it. And in this class, we're just going to see some examples and see how we will actually integrate frame and motion in our website. And it is something which is very, very easy and which comes intuitively, right? So notice how over here we have a very simple example, example of frame and motion. In this component, we have a simple div that they've converted into a frame and motion div by just saying motion dot. Right, so we get to know that if we just say motion dot, our div becomes, an, it changes from becoming just a div to a frame of motion div. Right, and it takes three parameters or three attributes. The first one is an initial, the second one is an animate, and the third one is a transition. So the first one says initial opacity is zero and the scale is 0 0.5. Then the second one says animate, opacity is one and scale is one. And then the transition is duration 0 0.5 seconds. Right, so now if I play this animation again, you see that the div actually changes its opacity from zero and scale from 0 0.5 to one and one. And that happens in a duration of 0.5 seconds. I don't know how visible it will be on the screen recording, but still it is, right? And as you can see, there are many, many things that you can do with frame of motion. You can do animations like this. You can have, uh, you can build such components. This is a frame of motion drawer. And this is something which is very simple to build, but it's really cool and looks really good, right? There are the gesture animations. Uh, this one does not seem to be working as of right now. Uh, there is this drag animation, which allows you to drag certain elements, right? So this allows you to make your elements draggable, as you can see. And uh, yeah, this is the gesture animation. Like if I hover on, okay. So if I hover over it, the scale becomes 1.1. And when I tap it, that is when I click on it, the scale becomes 0.9. So notice how when I click on it, the scale becomes 0 0.9 and when I leave it, it's obviously scale is one, but as soon as I hover on it, it becomes large, click on it, it becomes small, right? So this is a really fun little animation as well. Then uh, there are these motion values. If I drag this to the left, it becomes an X. If I drag it to the right, it becomes green, 
right? And I know this might seem like it's lagging on the screen. For some reason, my entire system is lagging as of right now, but frame of motion doesn't really lag that much, right? And that's the best part about frame of motion. These animations are scroll attached animations, and we'll, we'll be going through all of these animations, and I'll just tell you what it means. So firstly, I would like you guys to just uh, acknowledge this fact that this is the link that, that where you have to go. Other than that, Freeman Motion's website can get really hard to navigate. I myself have had a lot of difficulty navigating through it. But uh, yeah, if you guys just go to freeman.com slash motion or slash examples, that is where you will be able to, you know, uh, see it. Anyways, so now let's actually add Freeman Motion in our website and actually get started, right? So this is what we have over here. And like I said, importing frame motion in your website is a very simple task. All you need to do is, is just go to your imports and say import motion from frame motion. And that is all that you need to do. And frame motion is now imported. Now, any div or any HTML element that you want to add animation to, you can simply do that by converting that element into a frame motion component by just saying motion and dot. Notice how as soon as I say motion and dot, my code doesn't break and everything seems to work. Now adding motion to dot doesn't really change much. If I go and inspect my element as of right now, if I go and inspect my H1, the track crypto is the one where we added it, right? So if I inspect this, it doesn't really change anything over here, but we just understand that, uh, you know, there will be certain changes that happens once we start kind of uh, adding animations. So let's add the basic animation that we saw. So there were three attributes. The first one was the animate attribute. Right. The second one was the uh, initial attribute. I'm so sorry. The first one was the initial attribute. The second one was the animate attribute. And the third one was the transition attribute. Right. If I am correct. Anyway, so these are, there are these three attributes that we have. The transition has the duration. So duration is obviously the duration of the animation. So for us, let it be 0.5 seconds. If we have the initial, let's make this opacity as uh, 0 0.5 or let me just say zero. And how about the final opacity I make as zero, uh, one, right? So now notice what happens. And let me also increase the duration. Let me make it one. So if I go to my Google Chrome now, and if I refresh, notice how track crypto should now have an animation. So did you guys see that track crypto initially had a zero opacity and now it has one opacity and something that I would want you guys to look at is this as well, right? If I refresh, notice how this number keeps changing from zero to one, right? And just like that, you have successfully added an animation and you can add more animations. You can say something like scale as well, like they did. So we can have a scale of 0.5 and then we can have a scale of one over here, right? So now the way it will look to me is that this, this is the initial parameters and this is the final one. So initially the scale was, let's make the initial scale as zero as well. So now what will happen is this will actually grow in size. So notice how track crypto actually grows in size, right? And uh, over here also grows, so it doesn't really matter. Like over here, the animation is much more cleaner. I would rather have you see this, right? And you can do, do multiple things. And the best part about frame of motion is that it actually affects your CSS. So let's say if I, if I make the initial scale as 0.5 and if I make the final scale as 1.5, right? Notice what happens. So now let's reload the page and this is what happens. And now this will never change. Because now what has happened is track crypto has been given the styling, the scale of 1.5. And this is the final style that has happened, right? If I refresh, notice that it changes. It keeps on changing, right? Notice how the scale is changing over here and eventually it becomes 1.5 and that is where it stops. So we realize the fact that frame of motion actually has the power to change your styling and change your final layout of the code. So there's this general convention that whenever you are animating something, you don't really put, uh, you know, you, you bring back everything to their original state and not to a change state. So let's say if you want to rotate your element, so I can say rotate and I can rotate this initially. Let's say the rotation was uh, zero degrees, right? I think that is how this takes rotate. We'll have to see if we have to give it in values or in numbers, but the final one, let's say if I make it 90 degrees. So let's actually see how it happens. So over here, as you can see, it is now permanently shifted by 90 degrees. Right. Whereas if I would bring it back to the original position, let's say if I had 90 over here and if I had zero over here, right. Notice how this is the animation that we see. Right. So the entire convention is that you guys give initial values, whatever animation you want to, but finally you bring the element back to its original state. 
it doesn't matter if it's a div it's anything you can just bring it back to the original state you'll be fine so apart from rotate there's also very you know interesting states like uh, you can also do something like this where you can say 360 or i can say 720 now imagine the amount of times this will rotate three times right if i had a 360 it would rotate once technically one full circle right as you guys can see that is what happens you can give positive values negative values whatever you want to this way is it will rotate the other way and whatnot right so you guys can give a negative positive any values that you want to there is a rotate y as well so you can rotate across the y axis if not if you don't want to rotate across across the you know the normal axis rotating across the y axis would look something like this right if you guys have done rotation the rotation happens about that axis so this is like you know the rotation is happening about the y axis right if i say rotate x it will happen across the x axis so this is how that would look like right as you can you guys can see this is how that looks like correct if you rotate it across z axis that is how we uh, perceive rotation to be so it is outwards right so this will look the best so this is what we had by default right just like that there's scale as well you can scale a thing by uh, y axis x axis or z axis if i say scale by y this is how this will look like it will just scale by uh, y so how about i say scale zero and we stop rotating for a second so that we see how it works right so scaling by y just increases it by the y axis whereas if i say scale by x it will increase it by the x axis so it will increase it like this right as you can see that is what happens if i say increase by z it will increase it by z axis let's actually see i don't think this is z axis um yeah z-axis is the normal one right anyways so uh yeah that is how you animate things using frame and motion and you can also change positions so let's say if i give it an initial position of minus 50 and then if i give it an x of zero so now what will happen is this is the animation that i see notice how it comes from here right if i said plus 50 it would go from 50 to zero position right so over here now this comes from the right to the back right back to the original position and what the best part about this is that you can even have a large value so let's say if i have 5000 right and if i make my duration as three seconds or five seconds let's see how that looks and let me also inspect the element for you guys so you guys can see in real time what is happening to your code so let's say this is my track crypto right so now let me refresh this page and just look at what happens to track you see how tra track crypto is getting translated so translate x is changing constantly like over here also you guys can see right so it actually affects your code and eventually it will um, you know come into the screen like notice how our scroll bar is also changing but eventually it just slides in right and it slides into the normal position so the best part about frame motion is that it affects your css so you need to be really wise about it as well so i wouldn't really give it any large values but i think something like this makes sense and giving your animations a smaller duration means that the animation will be quicker and snappier that way is right so this is what i would like to do usually and maybe make it 0.5 as well if you want it to be a little more snappier and that way the animation will be a little faster right and that is all and now if you want to convert any or add animation to anything you can easily do that you can also give animation to y axis by the way and it works the same way so now it will be shifted shifted by y like this right so that is all that you need to do to convert anything into a frame and motion object so over here also we do the same thing i'll have motion dot and motion dot over here and now what i like to do is i like to give it the same animation but with a little twist so what we'll do with real time is apart from giving it a duration i'll also give it a delay of 0.5 seconds or maybe less than that so what happens is first track crypto comes then real time comes right and that happens in a really smooth way correct and similarly, we can have the same animation over here. I can give the same thing to motion.p. Right, this way my, uh, now my paragraph is styled. And all I need to do is, again, just copy this. If you guys want to make a constant for this, go ahead and make a constant for it. Right, and let's give it 0.75. So this is the clean animation that happens. So it's like one after the other, track crypto, real time, and then the text. Right, and that's, that's a really cool animation that I really like to do. And same thing you can do with the buttons. Or uh, rather than giving you know frame of motion individually to buttons, you can just give it directly over here. And uh, what you need to do is now just have uh, this thing. And what I like to do with the buttons is just have an initial opacity zero, 
instead of a y let's give them an x okay and over here also x and let's give them a delay of 1.5 so what happens is my track crypto real time text comes and then the button comes and that's really a clean simple animation that you guys can give right and that is all that you need to do now if i talk about how i've animated the mobile phone it is also very similar to this but the only difference is this time this is a never ending uh, animation so it repeats so it's it's on a loop right and the way to do it is very simple and it's a standard code i myself had to google how to do that right so i'll just quickly show that to you guys if it's possible right and it's a very very standard way of doing it so let's just go to our crypto dashboard december and I'll just quickly just uh, copy and paste that code. You guys can copy it too. It's a very simple code. And yeah, so let's go to the landing page component that I have over here. Mm, the components. Inside my components, the landing page, we have index. And this is the animation that you need to do. So let me just copy it and I'll just explain it to you guys. Again, know that this is not something that I built. This is something that I Googled myself, but it makes sense. So what we're going to do with our gradient is that we give it an initial value of minus 10 Y and a plus 10 Y. So it keeps oscillating from 10 and 10. If I make this 20 and 20, right? So I don't know if you guys understand how the math of this works, but the math works in such a way that if it goes minus 20 and 20, that means it's traveling 40 pixels. So minus 20 up, then 20 down. So minus 20 to zero, then another 20, right? So that is where just having minus 10 and 10 works fine. And the transition has been given a type of smooth. The P type is mirror. And what happens with mirror is, let's say we have 30, 30. And let's say I don't have the trans repeat type of mirror, right? That is what's going to happen is it's going to go down, then it glitches back up. It goes down, then it glitches back up, right? What we want is if, it go, if it's going down, we want it to come back the same way. Right. Duration is obviously the duration that it takes. Correct. And repeat infinity. So repeat infinity just means that it's going to repeat that many times. If I just have five over here, or let's say if I have three over here and if I refresh my page, so it goes down once, right? One animation is done. Then the second will be done. And when it's back, the third gets done as well. Right. So just three times it goes up and down. Right. And that is about it. But if we have infinity, that means it will constantly just keep on going up and down and it will never stop. Right. So you guys can have animations in the sense that you can you guys can stop it when it's happening or you can just keep it going like this. Right. And this is a really cool way. And like I said, this is too much. So minus 10 and 10 works for me the best. Right. And that's about it. So this is a really neat, clean animation. And uh, yeah, and that is how you can add a frame of motion to any website that you want to literally any website that you want to and that is all that you need to do there are these three things there are a lot of things as well so i would really advise you guys to just go to google and search frame of motion examples and that will give you a lot of examples there are a lot of websites as you can see i have done a fair share of my research as well so just go to these websites they're all really good and frame of motion is a widely used library nowadays so you will never face any issues with it it's completely smooth and as you guys can see it actually affects your css code so it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like magic. It still affects your CSS code, but yeah. Right. So just like that, you can easily add frame of motion to your website. And that is all that you need to do. In this class, we'll be getting started with a dashboard page. And this is what the dashboard page should look like, where we'll be fetching the API, we'll be getting all of the data, we'll be having this tab section, we'll be having the search section and all of these things. Now, something that we need to do before we actually get started with our grid component and our dashboard page, is that we need to add React Router DOM to our entire React, uh, React project. Now, as you may already know that React helps us build single page applications or SPAs. And what that means is by default, it doesn't really support routing. So to add routing, we have to add this package, which is called React Router DOM. Now to add this package, it's very simple. All you need to go is go to your VS code. Uh, I'll open my terminal and all I need to do is just say NPMI React Router DOM. And as soon as you click on it, you will be able to um, uh, install these packages. And once that package is done, you'll now be able to integrate Rea routing in your entire React project. Right, pretty simple. So now let's actually see what all routes will we actually need. So one is obviously the slash da dashboard page. One is obviously the compare page. Then we obviously have the watch this page. So these are three basic pages. Then obviously the home page will be the slash normal component. But then we see that when I go to a specific coin and I click on that coin, 
I will actually have the specific coins page. So we have our link, then we have slash coin and then slash Bitcoin. Now, if I go to Ethereum's page, I will have Ethereum there. So if I go over here, it'll be slash coin slash Ethereum. So now, does this mean that, and as you guys already know, that we'll be showing at least a hundred coins in our crypto project. So does this mean that will we have to make a hundred different um, pages? No. So the good thing about React DOM is that it provides us with dynamic uh, routing as well. And it allows us to use parameters and all of these extra things that we will, you know, eventually discuss throughout this uh, series. But uh, right now, as of today, our job is to just make the simple dashboard page that we have. So let's actually get started and let's actually code that out. So now you guys already know that we have created this pages folder. So what we would like to do is I would create a home page over here and call it, uh, I'll create a home.js file. This will be my home page, right? And now inside my home page, what I would want to do is I would basically have these two components over there. So how about I get rid of these and put them over here, right? And I'll also import these two. So header comes from components slash com slash header and main component comes from component slash landing page slash main component, right? And that is all that we need in our home page as of right now. The footer is something that we will be needing in the future. We do not need it as of right now. And now what we need to do is inside my app.js, I'll be having my basic routes. Now, as you guys may already know that adding routes is very simple. All you need to do is just wrap your entire, uh, you know, just have this in, in your entire app.js and that is about it. So let me actually make our jobs easy and I'll just copy paste this and now I'll explain it. So browser router is this thing provided by react router DOM obviously. And this is what enables us to kind of define our routes. Our routes are further inside all of these components and routes just means that you will have multiple routes obviously and then this is specific route. So now we have a specific route over here and the path is slash. So now this renders my home page, right? And if you guys see this is my home page, how about I change this and I make this into my home page, something like this. And then what I'll be able to do is I'll just be able to import this directly from my page slash home. Similarly, how about I make another page called the dashboard page, right? Dashboard.js. And what I'll do is inside over here, I'm going to name this page as the dashboard page, right? And since this is already getting exported, I can now import this as well. So as soon as I import this, I have both of my imports. I have these two things and we'll talk about these later, right? Let's just see if these two routes work for us or not. So now, idly speaking, if I am on my home page, you should see everything seems exactly the same, right? There's no change. Uh, yeah, everything seems to work exactly the same way. And now if I say slash dashboard, that takes me to the dashboard page. So now I know that my routing is working, right? Over here as well, I will have to definitely fix it inside my header and inside my um, uh, the mobile drawer as well. So we'll quickly go over there. We'll go to our header over here. Now over here, we're using a tags. Now there's no need to use a tags. We can now directly use, um, link tags. If you guys have heard and uh, link will be coming from not MUI material, but rather it will be coming from react out Dom. And I think inside link, I need to say link to correct. Yeah. So, uh, the home will work this way. If I say link to now, uh, let's say slash compare page will be at slash compare, right? Similarly, our um, dashboard uh, button is this. So I'll just have link and then over here I'll have two and then over here I'll just say slash dashboard. And that is all that I need to do, right? And we should be good. And of course, over here also, I'll just add a link and I'll say link to and then slash uh, watch list. And that is all. Right, and just like that, now our uh, page should work. So if I say dashboard, it takes us directly to the dashboard. If I say home page, it takes us directly to the home page and whatnot. And you guys will also notice the difference between anchor tag and link. Anchor tag is anchor tag is the tag which actually causes a little loading. So let's say if I have an anchor tag over here, like I did instead of this, uh, there will be a little loading. And obviously the good part about using react is to avoid that loading. So if you guys haven't noticed it, let me just quickly show it to you guys. Right. So over here, let's say we have our anchor tag and quickly comment this out and put my button inside of it. 
So now just look at the difference that uh, is there, right? So now if I click on this dashboard, uh, wait, did we render two dashboard buttons? Yeah, my bad. So now if I just click on this dashboard button, it will show some loading as you guys can see over here, there's some loading required, right? Whereas if I just have link on the other hand, there will be no loading. So link is obviously faster, it is better and it works much more smoother, right? So I would advise all of you guys to use link and that way your website will work smoothly and it will work like an actual react application or how an exact react application is supposed to work. Right. So now we can actually get started with our dashboard page. And as you guys already know, making the dashboard page is very simple. We already have a folder for our dashboard components. So all of our components will go over there and inside my dashboard page, first things first, I will have my header, right? So this is the good point about making components. You can call them again and again. And just like that, our dashboard page also has our header now, right? And the next thing in a dashboard page will be the tabs component. And that tabs component is something that we'll be talking about in the next class. We'll be using anywhere for that. So let me just quickly initialize the basic files and then we'll quickly move to the tabs uh, component. RFCE, I'll have a tabs component over here. And now what I can do is I can just go to my dashboard page and technically have my tabs component over here directly. And just like that, our tabs component is also here. So my dashboard looks like this. I have the header, I have the tabs component. I know something that we forgot was to add uh, links over here. So I'll just quickly do that too. All of these things are things that you can also take care of on your own. So if there's something that I accidentally miss, so I do expect you guys to quickly take care of that. Right, and obviously it's nothing um, too difficult. Right, so link to then over here we'll have the compare, over here we'll have the watch list, uh, watch list, and over here we'll have the dashboard. So now our entire app has React Router DOM. And by the way, React Auto DOM's documentation keeps on changing. So feel free to, I'm pretty sure there might be a newer way of doing it. There is some error and that is link is not defined. Let me import link from React Auto DOM. Right. And like I was saying, so always feel free to go to the documentation and just read through whatever version they're at. Right. And they keep on changing their uh, syntaxes and things. So do not get confused. Either ways, any uh, syntax that you use will work. So don't worry about that. But yeah, it's always useful to use the latest one. So in today's class, like I said, we'll be building this tabs component. The reason why we will not be building the search component is because the search does not make sense without first we us showing the data, right? So the first job will be to make the tabs component. Then we'll be getting the data. Then we'll be doing grids list. After that, we'll go to search. And once search is done, then we'll go to pagination and uh, back to the top button, right? So, okay, without any further ado, let's just quickly get started. So the tabs component is obviously a component that we take from MUI. And so for that, all you need to go is go to the MUI website, quickly click on get started. As soon as you do that, you have the installation, you have this components, click on the components. And over here inside navigation, you will see there is this thing called tabs. So now, like I said, adding MUI components is the easiest task in the world. All you need to do is just copy this entire code and you will have a tabs component. But over here, you'll see that uh, there is one complicated tabs component, whereas there's this tabs component, which seems to be much, much more simpler. And I'll tell you as to why the code for this is much more smaller and cleaner as well. Right. So all we need to do is, is just copy this and let's take this to our VS code. And now inside our VS code, we had already gotten started with, our, uh, started with our tabs component. So I'll just paste it right over there. And uh, something that MUI does and uh, something that I don't really like is importing React this way. I feel it's a little unnecessary and let's just import it separately. It makes our lives, at least to me, it looks like our job is easier, right? So this component was called as tabs component and this is what we have. So now all I've done is copied the code and I've named the component as tabs component because like in the last class, our uh, dashboard page does import tabs comp component. Right, so this is what we have. And now let's see if it works or not. And there's a high chance it will not work. And the reason for that is we haven't really imported any of labs. So let's actually see if my theory is correct. And as you can see, it says that module not found, can't resolved, MUI lab tab context. 
So for that, all we need to do is just say npmi and add it MUI lab, and that's all. And this will quickly download your MUI lab files. And now let's just quickly have a look at our code. So obviously we have a box. So if you guys didn't know, box is the version of MUI for devs. So we don't really need boxes. How about we convert every box that we see into a div? It will make our lives easier. And again, we don't need to give it, um, you know, such stylings. Let's just get rid of it. Let's just get rid of this as well. And let's see by default, what do we have? So now if I go to my Google Chrome, it still says, um, tab context is not found and we do see a lot of errors, but yet our code is completely working. So I'll just have a look as to why are we getting this, but okay. Hmm. Maybe if I restart anyways, so without, uh, regardless of this fact, I'll just quickly have a look as to why this is breaking, but, um, either ways our tabs is, uh, it seems to work just fine. The only issue is that it is by default, not really showing, um, you know, the text because I can, as the, our background is black and the background that MUI or the color that MUI chooses is also black. So if you guys want to see how it's actually working, so let's just quickly do something where, uh, you know, let me just say style over here and let me just give this a background color of uh, VR white. And that's about it. So as soon as I do that, uh, hmm. we do not see background color white. Huh, that is strange. Okay. I just wanted to show you how it looks. So we can also make that happen by just going to our index.css and making my entire body white for just a second. And as soon as I do that, okay, we see this, right? So our entire body is now white. And as you can see, this is what we see. So our MEO tabs is actually working. And now there are certain things that we will do to make them look the way uh, we have over here. Because over here, we have definitely given them a little, you know, custom styling. So the way to do that is very simple. All we need to do is, uh, first I'll get rid of this. I'll make this black again, right? We'll go back to our default stylings. And over here, there's this thing called um, inside our tabs. Inside our tab lists, we can actually make this full width. So there's this variant of MUI tabs, which is full width. So for that, all we need to do is, I think that is also available over here. Yes, this one, full width. So we just need to add variant is equal to full width prop. And just by adding this, and I think we need to add this to our um, tab list, or let's see, what do we need to add it to? We need to add it to our tabs component. So over here, let's just add it to our tabs list, I think. And let's see if that works. If it doesn't, we'll add it to our tab context. And as you can see, our uh, tab list works just fine. And now our entire tabs component is full width, right? Unlike uh, three, we don't really need three tabs. We just need two tabs. So I'll just get rid of the last tab over here. And uh, yeah, okay. So now our code is pretty much uh, all set apart from styling. So let's just have a look at what's exactly happening. So we have a tab context. Then we have this div, which is tab lists. I don't think so. We really need this div. We can get rid of it. And yeah, so we have a tab context. Now tab context is a component, which is um, technically responsible for knowing what page we are at and whatever values over here. If it's one, it'll take us to, it'll show tab panel one. If it's two, it'll show tab panel two, right? And that's how it works. And the reason why these are one, two, three is because this thing. So if we were to change this according to our needs, so we'll have a grid view and we'll have a list view, right? So not only that, how about we change this value as well? So I'll change this value to list, I mean grid, sorry. And I'll change this value to list, right? And something that you'll notice is that now our code still works. And the only difference is that now my tabs are actually called grid and list, right? As you can see, this is what we see and this is completely fine. Now, the only thing is that we need to customize it. We need to make sure that the, this text that we have over here, which is in black, right? We need to make sure that it is white by default. So how do we make that happen? Now, customizing MUI is something that a lot of students find really difficult, but all you need to do is, is just find the right class. And now you'll be wondering, how do we find the right class? Well, it is more or less a hit and try uh, method, but over here, as you can see, we have MUI tab, um, text color primary or MUI button base or MUI tab root. 
So we can just kind of try with these things. So how about I say MUI tab group? So I copy this class name and what I'll do is inside my tab, I'll go SX and then I'll say um, and and space and dot and then I'll have this and now I'll just give this a full time color of the uh, white and I'll just explain why we needed to do that. Let's first see if this works or not. And let me refresh. So, okay. So this class did not work out, right? Uh, okay, so by default, it is also not showing our tabs. So this is because our grid was not selected. So over here in the default value, we need to have a grid, right? And now my grid should be selected, but my list now, the, sh the default state should be white. Right, so let me go again. And like I said, it's more or less an iterative uh, method. You'll have to hit and try a lot. And let's see what happens if I select this class now, MUI button basically. Right, and if I do this now, or was it dot and? So just give me a second. Let's actually see how we actually used to do that. So if we go to my dashboard over here in my tabs, you guys can see the way to customize it is by hmm, giving a VR white to our basic tab view. Okay, so that should also work. So all right. So in this case, it's pretty simple to do. All we are doing is um, we don't need to make our lives that complicated. I'll just make a custom variable over here, which will be called styling. It has a color white with a 50 view width. Uh, this is not technically needed. Font size is 1.2 rem, font weight is 600, font family is enter, text transform is capitalized. And what I'll do now is, apart me by not making our lives complicated, and I'll just simply have style over here. And that is something that I'll do for both these things over here and over here. And as soon as I go to my Google Chrome now, you guys can see that my grid and list views are working. Right? Perfect. So this is working just fine. And something that I will also show you guys is how to actually customize your palette because right now, uh, this blue that we have on our screen, this blue and this blue are not really matching. So let's say if the theme that you have decided to work with is black and red, the MUI tabs will still be by default blue. So how do you change the theme color or the palette color of MUI? So for that, there is this property called, uh, there's this hook that they have, which is called create theme and you'll have to create a custom theme for it. Right. So all you need to do is, is just have create theme and theme provider. And I'll just copy this quickly and I have this inside my VS code. Right. Or I can just copy this. And what this allows me to do is this allows me to change my primary color to any color that I want. So let's just quickly go to our VS code and I'll just add this over here and create theme. And now all I need to do is wrap my entire MUI component inside a theme provider and inside the theme provider i need to pass the theme variable so i need to say theme and theme will be equal to theme now this theme that i'm passing is equal to this theme which is a create theme uh, variable and this has this palette now you won't really see any change right off the bat because blue still remains blue but let's say if we change this color to something like ff triple uh, four times zero right this becomes right now Notice how even the opacity uh, animation that is there is red now, right? So this is how simple it is. And ideally what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to have this create theme variable inside your um, app.js and you're supposed to wrap your entire app.js inside this theme. So if you want, you can do that too. And by doing that, your entire theme or wherever you're using MUI components will change to that color palette theme because by default, this is the color that we have, right? And okay, I still haven't really explained how this tab is working. So tab context is the uh, context that is responsible for handling your page. So whatever value we have over here and whatever value I write over here, that is the tab that gets selected. If I write list, this is list and this is list. So I'll be shown this component, right? As you can see, list is a component that I see. And no matter how many times I click on this, it doesn't really do anything because my value is permanently set to list. Right. Similarly, if this becomes grid, it becomes grid. So we have this on change function and what that does is it just simply sets the value of my tab as the value that I'm setting. Right. And that is all that is there. And now these are my two tab panels. And now over here, what will happen is we'll have a div and over here, we'll have the mapping done for our grids view. So mapping for grids. 
and similarly inside this we'll have the mapping for my list view and that is all that i need to do to make my entire react application have mui tabs and as you can see it is very simple and uh, mapping for lists my bad so now over here we have mapping for grids and over here we have mapping for lists right and it changes very smoothly everything works just fine and we have absolutely no issues right so um, in the next class now i think that is good for this class in the next class we'll quickly make the api call and we will be mapping this component so we'll make one more component and we'll map this data and see what we can do with this and uh, yeah that is all so hope to see you in the next class and uh, i know this video was short but we have successfully added any our tabs to our entire page we just have to fetch our data from the CoinGecko API. So if you guys remember to access the API, what we had to do was go to CoinGecko.com, go to their products, click on their crypto API and explore docs. And just by that, we will be reaching their crypto documentation. One thing that I'll do is I'll make this dark mode. Uh, this looks much better, easier on the eyes, right? And yeah. Okay. So this is a documentation link, my bad. So now what we have to do is this is the API link that we will be hitting. And what this does is it allows us to get a specific number of, uh, what do you say, a specific number of coins, right? By default, that will be hundred and in a specific currency. So the currency that I have decided to keep are uh, the currency for our project is going to be USD, right? You guys can make it INR, any, if you want to make it variable, you can make it uh, variable as well. The order will be in the descending order of the market cap per page. We'll be getting hundred and we're just fetching the first page. Right. If I click on execute, let's see what we get. So this is what we get, which is an array of, um, what do you say of the crypto object right now, this API link is something that I've discussed in the lecture where we talked about this coin API. So if you don't know what the object structure looks like or anything, please go back to that lecture. Right. Other than that, what my job is, I just have to copy this URL. I'll go to my code, right inside my tabs component, or in fact, um, yeah, not even inside my tabs component, inside my dashboard page. What we'll be doing is we'll be creating, uh, firstly, we'll be having a use state. So I'll have a state called const coins, comma, set coins, right? And I'll have a use state. And by default, this is an empty array. Correct. Now I'll import my use state. So I am so sorry for that. So if I want to import my use state, I'll do it like this correct my use state has been imported and i'll also have a use effect okay so my use effect will run whenever my page loads and inside this use effect what we'll be doing is we'll be making a very simple api call so what i'll do is i'll say fetch right and the url that i'll be fetching is this one right so once that's done in fact okay in we can either use the fetch or we can also use Axios. So uh, I think everyone of you guys must know how to use fetch. So let's not use fetch. We will be using Axios to make our API calls, right? And Axios is this HTTP library that is again uh, for JavaScript, which helps us to make these fetch requests. And the best part about Axios is that there are some things that it does right off the bat. So like in fetch, what we would have to do is we would have to say fetch then dot then Right, then inside my dot, then I would get a response. Then I would have to say response.json, right? And then I would get my final data, correct? My final data object like this. So the thing about uh, this is how I would do it usually with my fetch. But like I said, we'll be using Axios. And the thing about Axios is it makes our lives much, much more simpler, right? So what I'll do is I'll just say npmi and I'll say npmi Axios. Right, and I'll just import Axios. And meanwhile, that's happening. I'll actually show you the differences that Axios has versus Fetch. So not only is Axios faster, but something that it does right off the bat is it returns the JSON. So we don't really have to say uh, Fetch and then dot JSON, right? We can just directly say Axios dot get, and we can get the URL, right? So there's no methods. Now the methods will be like Axios dot get, Axios dot post, and so on. And other than that, it'll just be like access that get, you get the URL and whatever response you get, you do whatever you want to, and then catch is the catching part. And that is all that you need to do. Right? So as you can see, these are the major differences, right? It has a request object. It has some XR access, uh, RF things. This is something for security based, right? So it's more secure. You can say there's a by default automatically transforms the JSON data 
uh, which is a two step process where we have uh, we have to call the dot json method right so that is the main uh, what do you say that is the main uh, advantage of axios it's much more faster so let's let's use axios so we are uh, we just have to say axios obviously we'll import axios from axios right axios dot get then i'll be just getting the okay i've actually pasted the code and this is my url right so i'll just copy this and I'll just paste my URL over here. And once done, uh, we have the response. So let me just console.log response first. So response. And let's see what we get. Right. So response and uh, console log error if you if there is some error, obviously. Right. Error. And um, yeah, that is about it. Right, and yeah, so let's let's just see what we get. Something that I think I need to do is I need to import my use effect from React as well. So our import looks like this now. And um, let me just go to my Google Chrome. Let me just go to my crypto tracker, then my dashboard page. And I will now be looking at my console. So I do get the response object and then there's a response or data and that data contains the array of 100 coins. Right, and that is exactly what we needed. So what I'll be doing is I will be and if you want to have a closer look at the response object, you guys can see that we see a response config, right? This contains all of the configurations. Uh, if there's any ENV, uh, it's an HTTP request. The headers are over here, right? And so on. If you guys want to look at the headers, there are the headers over here as well, right? Content type is application JSON, char set UTF-8, uh, cache control is public. Right, expires. This is when the call will expire technically. Then there is request uh, parameters. Then there's a status of 200. Right, so again, like I said, uh, Axis takes care of a lot of things. Right, there's no need to have a res.json and stuff like that. So Axis is just, a, it's it's more or less the same thing, but yeah, it's just a little bit faster. So now what I'll be doing is I'll say set coins is equal to response dot data because I believe it is response.data which has our coins. So over here, yes, response.data has 100 coins. And now my coin state should be there. So what I'll do is I'll actually pass my coins over here now and I'll pass them like this. Now the reason why I have coins in my parent state is so that uh, you guys will now realize that when we make the search component or the pagination component, we will be needing the coins, right? So what I'm doing is I'm passing my coins, which is the area of 100 coins that I have into my tabs component. And as soon as I click on this, right over here also, I'll have my coins, correct. And now all I need to do is just map it. So how about over here where I said I'll be having the mapping for my grids, I'll just say coins dot map, right? I'll say item comma I, and then what we'll do is we'll to make a life simpler. I'll just say return right now. And what I'll return is nothing but it's going to be a P tag. The P tag will contain I plus one dot item dot name let's do item name first okay so this is what i'm uh, returning this is a mapping coins is this thing that we have right over here i'll give this a key as well so that there's no warnings and now if i go to my google chrome this is what my grids look like right it is a hundred coin the last one being the radix and the first one being bitcoin and we are just accessing the name if you guys see for every coin we have an image we have a uh, symbol, we have a name, we have a market cap, we have the current price and all of the details that we need. If you look at my list, my list is still empty. And the reason for that is also very simple because over here, obviously inside my tab panel for my lists, I just have this, right? So this will be my grid view. And if I have a similar code over here and let's do item dot ID in my lists, right? So uh, my list will just have the ID as you can see. Right, Look, notice how this is USD coin, fifth number, but this is USD coin like this, right? Uh, Tether, uh, Tether Binance coin is number four, BNB is number four, the name of Binance coin is BNB, and the symbol that we use or the ID that we're using is uh, Binance coin, right? So again, this object is something that we have already discussed, but it's very simple. It just has, you know, all of the details that we need, like it has the image as well for that matter. So I can even have something like, um, you know, if I wrap this inside a div and we have this P tag, but apart from the P tag, I also put the image tag. And what I do is I say image SRC and inside my SRC now I have item dot image, right? And again, I'll have my key over here, obviously. 
but yeah so let's just have a look at how the grid looks this is how the grid looks right these are bitcoin this is the bitcoin's image this is ethereum's image this is tether's image and whatnot so we have all of the images that we need correct and yeah here we have the lists as well so now you guys can already imagine what we'll be needing to do so let's say if we were to be building our uh, grid uh, grids what we'll have to do is we'll have to make a grid component first like the component that you see on the screen when i go to the dashboard of my hosted website over here we already have a grids page or a grids component so this is the grids component which takes the coin uh, that we have or the coin image the coin symbol coin id uh, percentage price total volume market cap all of these things as parameters or props and that is how we are rendering it right so this is the next step so we, in the next class we will be building this quick grids component then over here we will be building the list component and that is how we will be proceeding right now something that i would want you guys to also do is that over here right now if i copy this image i can just copy this and open it somewhere else so this is called image dragging and what i like to do is in my projects i like to disable image dragging right so disable image dragging and css i'll just google that code and all you need to do is just copy and paste this specific code and what this allows you to do is uh, we'll just paste it in our index.cs and what this allows me to do is that it makes my images not uh, draggable like right now it is still being draggable if i refresh it shouldn't be draggable for some reason this one is give me a second if i go to my dashboard page or my home page sorry is my this one is draggable yeah this one is draggable as well let me see if i did something wrong uh no maybe this is not the code the dragging one is the code right hmm so disable image dragging yes it's it's the other code it's um this one yes it's this one it's user drag so what this allows me to do is actually it allows me to disable image dragging this was uh this is select my bad this is just selection this will allow me to disable image dragging and what that does is that it prevents my images from being selected and copied and you know taken to a new tab and the reason why this is really effective is because like over here even this image is not right and the reason why this is very effective is because um, let's say uh, you know i'll show you guys a real life example as well let me go to apple's website okay and inside apple's website what i'll do is i will go to the iphone let me just go to the iphone now inside the iphone right um let's just see as soon as they use an image somewhere like this is the image right so how about i just copy this and i take it to a new tab and now i can actually see the folder in which this image has been placed and this is a url link right and by the way if i send this link to someone let's say i send this link to a friend they will be able to access this image as well now imagine if you were building a social media website or you're making something where you know people put images privately right any user can just drag it and paste it out inside and then they can they can just share this url link because obviously every hosted image will have some url link right so that means any person on the internet can get the access of that url link so this is kind of like the way I like to see it is not only does it make your website look professional that these images are not draggable, but it also allows it also prevents you from, you know, uh, making your images very, very public. So now if someone has to get their this images URL link, they will probably have to, you know, inspect element or something like that. I mean, it's still doable, but the entire point is it just becomes a little more cleaner and a little more tougher for them to technically just copy this image and get an access of this image. Right. Anyways so uh yeah that is all for this video in the next lecture like i said we'll be building the grid component and once the grid component is done we'll be building the list component so these two will be really really easy for us to do and it won't take more than 10 15 minutes each uh component to quickly make them and once that's done we'll make the search view and we'll be done with the dashboard page if you're just going to uh kind of map make this separate component which is called the grid component and we'll be mapping it through the array of the uh, or the list of the what do you say the list of the coins that we have right so let me just quickly go to the dashboard and as of right now this is what we have on the screen and again this is not the best 
obviously. So we'll just be making a new component, which will be inside my dashboard page, right? So if you guys have a look at our folder structure as of right now, we have the components folder inside the components folder. We have different pages and all of the different components of the different pages will be inside such folders. So over here, let's make one more folder and call it the grid, right? So this will be my grid component. It will have an index.js and it will have a styles.css. Correct. These two files are the only two files that I need inside my uh, grid. I'll say RFCE and I'll just call this as the grid, right? And over here, obviously, you have the styles. I will be importing my styles. I'll say import dot slash styles dot CSS. All right. So this is what we have. And now I want you to understand that over here with every item that we are mapping in the coins array, the coins array is a list of hundred coins that we fetched using the API, right? Over here, we are passing it through this entire, uh, through this prop, correct? So our coins array actually is nothing but it is an array of a hundred coin objects. So instead of item, we'll have a coin over here. And what I would want to do is I would have this mapping as just nothing but the grid component that we have. Now this grid is coming from the components that we have made and not from MUI. And over here, I'll just be passing my coin like this and I'll have a key as well and I'll just keep it I. And that is all. So this way my entire coin object is going to go inside my grid. And I'll tell you the reason for that as well. I'll give this a class name as well and I'll call this as the grid uh, dash flex because we know we will be having a flex of this grid, right? So first things first, let me just style this quickly. So I hope my styles has been imported over here. No, it hasn't been, so import dot slash styles.css. So now what I'll be doing is I'll be going to my tabs uh, styling, which is over here, and I'll just say dot grid flex. This is nothing but this has a display flex, justify content of uh, space between, right? Or even we can do center, never mind, let's do center. Right, align items will be centered. Uh, flex wrap will be wrap. Correct. And one more thing that we'll do is, I think I can give it a gap of one run. So gap of one run. And that should be good enough for now. If we need any changes, we will do so. Right, maybe I can give it a margin of three rem. So there's a good margin of three rem, uh, you know, which is surrounding the entire flex and that is all. So this is what we have. And I think 3DM will be a lot. We'll have to see if 3DM, uh, what should we do with 3DM? So I think I can do 1.5DM and 2DM, uh, start with 2DM. All right, so now this is my grid component. And inside my grid component, what we'll do is we'll have my coin over here. So how about I just put coin.name as it right now, right? If I go to my Google Chrome, this is what we see. So we can see that uh, it is a flex. And if I reduce the size, you guys can see that it is flex wrap as well. Right, so it works uh, neatly. And now let's do the styling of this part. So I'll give this a class name, call it the grid dash component or the grid dash container. That's better. And let's just have a look at what my grid dash container will be now. So my grid dash container will be nothing but it's a square, it's a box, right? And which has this background, which is a dark gray shade. It has uh, the icon flex over here. So the icon is in flex with the symbol and the name. It has this current price percentage. It has this icon and which is in the format of a chip. If the price is less, we are showing it in red. If the price is more, we are showing it in green, right? Then obviously we have the uh, current price of that coin and then we have the total volume and the market cap. So let's actually make this, right? So first things first, what I would want to do is I would want to style my grid container and I'll just give it a very simple styling. Uh, let's give it a height or let's give it a width of first three, I think. 300 pixels will be good, All right? Let's give it a width of 300 pixels. Let's give it a background color of we are dash dash dark gray. And you guys must be wondering that how do I know that I have this variable? Because inside my index, as you can see, I have a dark gray variable, All right? So this is the color that I've been using. So dark gray, you guys can change your color. It's not an issue. I'll be giving this a border of two pixels, solid we are dash dash dark gray again, so that it doesn't change anything. And by default, I'd like to give this a height of 300 as well, just to see uh, what exactly is happening. So now if I go to my Google Chrome and look at my crypto tracker, this is what I see. So as you can see, pretty similar to what we have already, right? Maybe what I'll do is I'll give this a border radius as well. So maybe a border radius of uh, 0.5 rem will look good. 
So 0.5 rem looks like this. Uh, how does this look? So this has more than 0.5, so maybe 0.75, right? And what we can do is either I can decrease the size of this. So maybe we can do 250. Let's see how 250 looks. So 250 is this. So 250 holds, holds five, but I think 250 is not good. Let's increase it only. Let's make it 350. So that we just have four uh, coins in one page. Yeah, this looks better. This looks exactly what we have over here as well. Okay, so now what we'll be doing is, uh, again, the task is very simple. Over here, we'll make some devs. The first one will be called uh, info-flex container, I think. That, that This is fine, right? And what this will have is, firstly, it will have uh, our image. So it will have an image and this image will have an src and the src is obviously just coin dot image right uh, we can give this a class name as well i can give this a class name and call it um, coin dash logo right then we can have another div over here and inside this we can have two p tags correct and one of those p tags will be for coin dot symbol and the other will be coin dot new coin dot new i'll call this uh name dash coin all right so again you guys can give any class names that you want to i'm pretty sure all of you already know that so let's style my info flex now and if you guys want to see next to each other how it looks this is how my content looks right now so we'll be styling it properly now so now i'll have my dot info flex which will be nothing but a display flex Right, it will have uh, justify content flex start. Obviously, align items will be centered. Right, and uh, what we'll do is we will have a gap of one rem. All right, and yeah, that is good enough. Then we have a class name called coin dash logo. So, what I'll do is I'll have dot coin dash logo over here, and I'll say, um, height is maybe equal to 2rem uh, width is maybe equal to 2rem right so 2rem seems to be too small so maybe 3rem would be nice right let me have a look is it 3rem yeah 3 3.5 we can do 3.5 as well so 3.5 rem right and what we can do is i can give this a margin of one or i can give this a padding of 1rem let's see how a padding of 1rem suits the box so padding does shift a lot of things uh no let's not have a padding then let me just give this a margin of uh, one rem right so it's inside and yeah this looks a bit cleaner already right so again it is not exactly the exact replica but it will do right maybe i can have a one rem and a 1.5 rem something like this and that looks better and now what i'll do is since i have i'll have a class name for this and I, i'll call it coin dash uh, symbol right and i can have a class name for this and call it coin dash uh, name right so then over here i'll have dot coin dash symbol and coin dash name so dot coin dash name right so notice that my symbol now is white and is all caps whereas this is smaller so that is what we'll do firstly so my symbol is uh, color will be obviously white so that is not an issue we are dash white but now the thing is that uh, this has a text transform of uppercase or capitalize or is it uppercase i think and uh, it has a font weight as well the font weight will be 600 uh, I think it's 500. We'll have to see what the font weight is. 600 looks good. I'll give it a font size of 1.2 rem, which might be a lot. Uh, 1.2 rem is looking good as well. Right. I will give this zero margin, obviously. And similarly, I'll have a zero, almost the same uh, styling over here as well. The only difference is this will be capitalized. This will be dark gray or gray, sorry. It will be gray. Right, uh, this will not have font weight of 600, the font weight will be light, right? And, um, or maybe, maybe even normal, let's see how normal looks. No, light looks better. 
correct and uh, yeah and the font size will be a little smaller so one gram is good and margin is zero as well over here cool so now what i'll do is i'll give my name call a flex of column right so i'll have my dot name call and i'll say display flex as usual right i'll say justify content or i'll just uh, say flex direction column firstly because that's important and then i'll just give this a gap of 0.5 run so there's a gap of 0.5 run over here right so this is how it looks now cool so this is very similar to what we have over here right uh, again, it, the reason why it's not looking similar is probably because of this margin. I haven't really given it nicely. And this is how it looks. So pretty much uh, similar. We will really keep on filling this component as we move further. So this looks fine for as of right now. Right. Now the next task is to build this thing. This is something that we'll be coming to when we start the watch list page. As of right now, I don't think so that is needed. So we'll just start with our coin underscore percentage. So if I show you guys how my coin structure looks like, uh, let me just go to my console. Let me see where am I consoling my entire, um, yeah, here is my data and this is my data, right? So now my Bitcoin has uh, a name. We use this, the symbol we have used this. Now price change percentage 24 hours. So this is actually the price change percentage 24 hours and this is the price change that we'll be using. So this basically indicates that this is the percentage amount in which Bitcoin has fallen or risen uh, in the last 24 hours, right? So the reason why this is good is because it provides daily updates, obviously. So uh, I'll just copy this key value and over here what I'll do is I will make another div, right? Or I, yeah, I'll make another div which will be called my chip flex, right? So chip dash flex and then inside this I'll have the percentage chip. So I'll have the price dash chip, right? And the price dash chip will look something like this. So coin dot price change percentage, right? If I show this to you guys, this is how it looks. And for some reason, this is coming. Okay, so we'll have to put this outside this loop. My bad. So now this will be below this, right? So this is how it looks. Correct. So now our job is to convert this percentage into uh, to look something like this and then have an icon next to it. So for icons, I think we've used MUI icons before, but firstly, let me just quickly style this in a way which is appealing, right? So obviously we have this chip flex, which will be a flex like any other flex, right? So I'll have that. So over here, I can just say dot chip flex. I'll say display flex, right? Just for content will be flex start like usual. Uh, gap will be one rem like usual. Align items will be center like usual. Everything is usual. Then we have dot price dash chip if I am correct, right? Yes, we have price dot chip, and this will be given. Let's say, let's give it a border of two pixels solid, and we are dash dash green. Okay, let me give it a border radius of one rem. Let me give it a padding of 0.5 rem and uh, 1.5 rem, right? Let me give this a text align center also, obviously, and let me give this. Um, font weight of 600, a font size of 1.2 rem, right? Like the one size we have over here. And let me give this a color of VR green as well. So it should look good now. Let's have a look. This is how the price chip looks. Again, need a little more uh, border radius. Let me make this two rem. And this looks better. But now the thing is, firstly, this price is way too much. But obviously, this percentage value is way too much. So we'll round it off and we'll add a percentage sign as well. So let's go over here. What we need to do is I will be saying dot two fixed. And now to fix, I'll say two. And I'll also add a percentage sign. So now this will look like this, which is much, much more better. And yeah, so that is cool. Now, something that I forgot was adding a margin over here. So I can give this a margin left. So uh, let's do one rem and 1.5 rem or however that margin was so over here. We have um, 1.5 rem, right? So yeah, this is how that looks, uh, which is not bad. 
I think I will reduce the size of this chip a little bit. So maybe reduce the padding to point three five and point one point two five and reducing the font size to one rem. And let's see how that looks. Yes, this chip looks much much more cooler, right? So again, now this is just the uh, green one. I'll tell you how to make the red one. So that's very simple. So basically, if my coin dot price percentage underscore twenty four hours. If this thing is uh, in negative, right? So let's do over here. So if, let's say if this thing is greater than zero, so we'll have this one, right? If not, then we'll have something else, right? So I'll just copy this over here right now, and over here instead of this, what I'll do is I'll just say red, and if red or price dash red or chip dash red. So if chip dash red styling is given, so what I'll do is over here. I'm going to say dot chip dash red, and the only two thing that I need to change is this thing and this thing. That is it. So both the greens will become a red. And again, the logic is if coin dot price change percentage is greater than zero, that means it's green. If it's negative, that means it's this, right? If I go over here, as you can see, all of this is red. Uh, this one is green. This one is green. Correct. So it's green and red depending on whatever the case was. Now what we'll do is I will uh, quickly add the icon as well. So to add the icon, that is very simple. If you guys remember, we are using a new icon for that. So I'll just go to my MUI library over here, and I will be adding my icons from MUI material icons. Correct. I'll go over here and um, hmm. I think it is loading maybe. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so now it's over there. Material icons, and what I'll do is I'll just find. I think it's called trending up. If I search it, this is the icon that we want. We'll take the little rounded version. So I'll have the trending up icon. I'll copy this. I'll go over here and paste it. Right, trending up rounded icon, and I'll just paste it over here. Now the thing is, what I'll do is I will be wrapping this div with this class name as well. And let's see what we get. Ideally, the styling should look the same. If it doesn't, we'll fix it a little bit. So right now, my green icons look like this. Okay, so we will have to fix it, right? So I'll say icon dash chip. I think that'll be nice. So I'll create a new icon for this now. And we have dot icon dash chip. And over here, what I'm going to do is basically again the same thing, more or less. So uh, my border will be two pixels. Border radius will be fifty percent this time. Okay, the padding is not uh, not needed. Maybe I can give it a custom height as well. So I can say two rem. Width is two rem, right? And I can say again get rid of all of this. Not important. I can say display flex. So this is how I like to center things. Just display flex and um, justify center, align item center, and that is the easiest way I feel you can. Center anything, right? So again, if you guys have other methods, uh, transform or something like that, use that. And yeah, so let's see how this looks. So this is how that looks. Like I said, this looks completely fine, right? So now what I need to do is now I just need to have the same thing for my trending down icon. So again, just like there's a trending up, there's this trending down. So D O W N. And all I need to do is copy this thing, have it over here. Instead of trending up, we have the trending down, and instead of icon chip, we have icon dash chip dash red, or I can just say chip dash red. So this way is uh, this icon is down, but the chip isn't. So whatever has been given the property of red, what I would want to do is give it a uh, important as well. So. Important. So this way, we know for sure that the styling will be applied. And yeah, so now if I look, my trending down icons have uh, red, and the green ones are green. Right. So pretty simple. Now what we would want to do is let me just increase the size a little. I think. Yeah, this is still better. Okay. So now what we would want to do is that we would want to give this a basic hover animation. So what I'll do is let's say if it's dot price chip, what I would want to do is I would want to make the background color as uh, we are green, right? 
and I would want the normal color to be here white backslash white and I would want this transition to occur uh, all in 0.3 seconds oh and something that we need to do is I need to say hover over here so this becomes a price shift hover property so this way if I hover over this this becomes green and white right similarly I would have to do the same thing for my chip dash red and what I will be doing is I'll say chip dash red hover and this time the background color becomes red and this becomes white so same thing and then I'll have the same thing over here for my um, for my icon chip correct and for icon chip it's the same thing I think icon chip should work as well okay so icon chip is not working but this is working and this is working for this okay so I just have to make an icon chip um, hover dot icon dash chip dash hover or I think we can just have this over here and maybe give this okay I understand what's happening so I'll give this property not only this to but to icon dash chip hover as well there we go so this way is this will be green and white too and this will be this as well right so this way is this adds a nice clean little animation that you can use and that is how you have added this uh, chip flex as well everything looks fine right again major styling is done uh, we'll keep on adding different different types of styling as we kind of uh, you know progress further with this application i'll keep coming back to components keep making them look better because again making it perfect in just one go is not going to be really possible for us but yes so then i'll have an s3 over here and i'll just call this coin dot price right and i'll just have a and it's called coin dot current underscore price if i'm correct and this is how that will look now notice the difference between this and this so apart from it being red and green the other difference is the commas like over here it has the commas right this does not correct and the other thing is this is also not rounded so first you'll be rounding this now digit and then we will be basically adding commas so how do we add commas uh, by using this two fixed string property so if I just say two fixed string what it does is any number it just adds commas to them right uh, I think there will be an error and I know as to why that error is there because uh, it's going to say um, dot two fixed string is not a function oh two locale string my I'm so sorry it's two locale string right if we add two locale string what it does is it adds a comma to my entire um, value right so this is how it looks then correct it rounds it up a little bit as well but this is how it will look uh, right it adds uh, dots and it adds comma so if there's a uh, that's 23,343. This has a comma now. Now, on to basic styling. So, I'll just say price coin dash price. Correct. I will obviously have this inside a div as well. So, now what I can do is I can just have everything inside this div and I will just give this a class name and call it again uh, info dash container because all of our next information will be inside of this div. Right and what we'll be doing is i'll be adding a margin inside of this so we don't have to continuously keep adding margin i guess that'll be a smarter solution so i'll just give this a margin of 1.5 rem and then uh, dot info container h1 i can just say again the color will be green right so we are green by default and uh, font size let's make it 1.2 rem Right, font weight let's make it uh, 600 so if I go to my Google Chrome this is what we see pretty good for some reason the color isn't um, green so we have the info container okay it's not an h1 my bad it's an h3 so the point price has been given this so it becomes green by default so now what we need to make sure that if it's green then only it's green otherwise it's red so again we'll be doing conditional rendering and I'll just keep on showing you guys different different ways of doing conditional rendering one was this method having it render like this 
one was having a conditional rendering inside our inline styling so over here what i'll do is i'll say color and then i'll say this thing so if this is greater than zero it will be green so what i need to say is if this thing is less than zero that means we'll have the color as vr dash dash red else we'll have it as vr green but it doesn't really matter so i can just say vr dash dash green over here right and this will be a question mark correct so if my coin price has uh, is great less than zero then it will be red otherwise it will be green and inline styling works perfectly as you can see no doubts no issues completely fine the red ones are red the green one is green right so there are multiple ways of doing conditional rendering and anyways so let's move further now the last thing that we have is total volume and market cap so those are just two simple p tags that we have so one will be for the total volume and the other will be for the market cap and as of right now i think they both have the same styling it's not an issue so we will just have a class name for that and i'll say this is total underscore volume correct so this will be a uh, coin dot total underscore volume dot two locale string so without two locale string i'll just demonstrate it again without locale string this is what we see over here right uh or wait i did not save it yeah so without locale string this is how the number looks it's just a continuous number no commas but as soon as we add a two locale string and save it it adds commas right so it's a really powerful tool and it's a really cool uh, function to use so total volume will be equal to this thing right and similarly i'll just have another p tag for my market cap so market cap and this will be in dollars correct coin dot market underscore cap and this is what i have so now what i can do is i can go to my grid get rid of this height and even reduce this width a little bit to make it look a little cleaner correct so if i do that this is how it looks and uh, it seems too packed as of right now so we will be fixing that just in a second so what i'll do is i will obviously i need to style my um, total volume of course so i'll just do that quickly so i'll say dot total volume i'll give it a color of vr gray right so instead of green i'll say gray i'll give this a font size of one rem i think or maybe even 0.8 rem would be good let's do 0.8 rem and i will give this a font weight of 500 let's see how that looks so this is how that looks which is not bad but it does seem a little congested i will agree on that factor right so maybe instead of seeing 300 we can see something like 320 right and uh, hmm we'll have to give it a height as well so let me give it a height of uh, 320 320 will be fine right even though it's not in the center to make it in the center we can give it a, a display flex and make everything column and that will make our lives very simple to be honest let me just do that if i say display flex and if i say flex direction is column and then if i just say um, justify content center or align item center right uh, center gives us this not the best align items center as well Nope, we don't need a line item centers. For some reason, our display content center is not working. Hmm. That is a bit weird. But anyways, even this is completely fine. You guys can style this any way that you want to. Right? Uh, maybe you can just keep it back to 300 pixels only. And what I will do is I'll just add a bigger gap. So we'll make it 1.5 right? Right? That way, that means there's some space between it. Anyways, so this is the way my grid component looks as of right now. If I go back, I can see all the different, uh, I can see five grid components. And yeah, it does not look the same. I definitely agree with you on that factor. Maybe we'll add a little padding, maybe we'll change things. So that is something that we'll keep on doing. Like I said, uh, you know, we'll keep on continuously doing that anyway. So that's not an issue. But one thing that we left was the uh, hover effect so now i'll show you guys the third way of doing it right the third way is having a custom um, 
what do you say the third way is by having a uh, different conditionally rendering uh, the class names because over here the first way was conditionally rendering the entire component the other was conditionally rendering the styling so now the third way that we'll be doing is having conditionally rendering uh, the particular class name right so i can just say if this is less than zero then say grid dash container dash red right and just uh, put this in quotes and just say and and so and and unlike if and else and and just means if this condition is true then do this and there's no else so unlike this where this is if and this is else right this is just truth so if this is true then do this so now what i'll do is i'll give my dot grid container a hover animation as well and that hover animation i'll just say border color is equal to br dash dash green correct and uh, transition will be again all 0.2 or 3 seconds correct similarly we'll have another hover animation for grid container red so my grid container red will be nothing but it'll just be dash red over here and the hover animation will be border color vr red and important right so if i go over here hover on this this is red right this one's green so it works completely fine there's no issues and yeah so we have this working we have this working and just like that our entire grid view is now finished so this was a long lecture but we did end up finishing our entire grid view in the next class we will be doing our entire list view which will take approximately the same amount of time but after once that is done two major big css uh, styling chunks of the entire thing will be done and then we'll move on to some more functionalities like adding the search uh, functionality and adding the pagination functionality and adding the back to the top functionality and once that's done our entire dashboard page will be done so now in today's class what we'll be doing is we will be quickly making the list component so uh, this is the component that we need to be making and uh, yeah this, this is the component that we'll be making then if we if time permits we'll add a nice animation as well this delayed animation that you see right and once that is done we'll then quickly move to the search component in the next video so without any further ado let's just start with what we have so this is currently the status of our list component so let me just quickly go to the code and actually see what we have so in my list component i have nothing but i'm just simply mapping this to a simple p tag and that's about it so firstly what we'll be doing is i'll be making this into a table because uh, the list will actually be a table instead of you know just a div and every uh, the, over here we'll be mapping a list component right so that list component will obviously be inside my t body if that makes sense or i can just even get rid of the, get rid of the t body that's not important by the way if you didn't know and we won't be needing a t header as well so just uh, the table and a t row will be fine right so over here what i i would like to do is i'll make a list component just like i made my grid component I'll have an index.js file and a styles.css. So this is about it. Over here, I'll say RFCE. Then I'm going to say list. Right, I'm going to say import dot slash styles.css. Correct. So this is what we have. Now what I'll do is over here, I'm going to say coin. I'm going to pass my coin object. And over here, I'm just going to say coin.name. In my tabs component, instead of this p tag, I'll have a list component, which I'll be mapping like this. And then I'll pass my coin like this. And that's about it. I'll be importing my list component as well from my list, not MUI. Right. Let's just have a look and see what we have. So this is what we have. Uh, right. And every list that we have right now, this is a div, but it will not be a div. It will actually be a TR. So every list will be a table row. And now I can give this a class name. So the class name that I would want to give this is a list row, obviously. And every row will have a TD, right? So I'll tell you guys a very simple way of, um, you know, adding uh, your previous styling. So what we will actually do is we'll actually copy all of this code, all right? And I'll just copy all of this code and what I'll do is I'll convert every div that we had into a TD. So this InfoFlex div that we had, right, I'll be making this as a TD. 
correct and this will be another td right or i th yeah this will be another td correct so this and this and um this and this will be another td then what will happen with this is that this will no longer be inside the info container so uh, we can technically get rid of this let's try to get rid of this and add a td over here so my td will be wrapping my s3 right just like this and then similarly i will have uh for some reason something is okay right and i will have tds over here as well which will be wrapping my p tag correct just this and that is about it so now if we have a look at what my list component looks like first there will be a lot of errors i saw that coming because we haven't imported our trending down and trending up icons correct so the first things first i'll be importing these as well and now let's just quickly have a look and see what we have inside the list view okay so this is what we have inside the list view if we are almost there all right so something other than this that we had to make into a td was i think we can technically get rid of this and just have a td directly over here so all of these will be tds as well right and um yeah oh oh the thing is no never mind we cannot make this into a td because this needs to be all right let's just look have a look at where are we going wrong then so i think the reason why this is like this is probably because we have a td over here which has everything exactly so we don't really need to do that what we'll do is i'll close the td over here and make another td over here right and that means at least these are separated yeah and now this looks perfect correct so obviously this is not perfect but this is a start so as you can see now you guys can probably see the resemblance between this and this so the way to make this uh, much better is by giving it the styling that we want to so over here what i'll do is i'll say dot list row i'll make this a display flex all right i will yeah i'll make this a display flex i'll say justify content a space between all right i'll say align items is center and uh yeah so let's just see what that looks so this is what it looks like i'll give a gap of 0.5 rem to everything and something that i would want to do inside my table over here i would like to give this a class name as well and call it the table row or just sorry the list dash table so what i would want to do with list dash table is that i would like to give this a width of 90% width of 90% right or maybe 95% and I would like to give this a display block correct then what I would like to do is give it a margin of left auto and right auto right so that way this is how it looks and as you can see this is already a little better than what we had right and now something that you'll realize is this total volume and this market cap is something that is totally unnecessary so we don't need it so what i'll do is i'll go to my list component i will quickly get rid of this and this these two things are not needed right this looks much better what we will also do is for every td that we have over here so dot list row td i'll be saying text line is left so that means everything will be left aligned and that gives a little more uniformity to our code like over here we'll, i'll be fixing this as well and what i'll do is everything will have a width of let's do 18 percent so that is this is how it looks now as you can see everything is aligned at least vertically speaking so now what we need to do is this particular uh, image td that we have we need to not give it such big of a width so what i'll be doing is this td i'll be giving this another class name i'll be calling it uh td dash image technically i don't need this i can just say td dash image and now what i'll do is i'll just give this a custom width and i think i can give it a width of like 3 rem so width of 3 rem would be fine right so by that it should have shrunk let me have a look and see what is wrong so if i go over here okay this td has a width of 18 percent and 3 rem is not applied all right so I think I'll have to say important and I'll have to say margin dash right is uh, 0.5 rem. 
Uh, let's see how it looks without it. So this is how it looks without it, obviously. So I think I'll have to give it a margin uh, right of 0.5 trim. So this way there is going to be some gap over here, which I don't see happening. Maybe if I give it a bigger margin, let's say 1.5 trim. Yeah, 1.5, this looks better as well, right? Anyways, so 1.5 looks like this. Hmm. So let me give it 1.5 rem. Right, so this way at least there's some gap. And let me just have a look at, okay. All right, so I think what we'll have to do is I will have to reduce the overall width of this thing as well. So I think that can be done by just uh, reducing the width of this table that we have since we're 95, let's do 80%. Let's see how does that look. So this is already a little in the middle and this is all something which is fine, right? Now what we need to do is we just need to make it a little more beautiful and I feel we can do that firstly. Uh, this should have a little more gap, right? So see after a point, it's just about how you style it and how you, you know, give different margins. How do you settle everything? If I make everything centrally aligned, that is also fine. So that those looks factor is something that is in your control. To me, this is also completely fine. It doesn't look the best. We can definitely work on this and make it a little better. But even as of right now, this doesn't look that bad, right? Uh, anyway, something that I'll do is definitely I will give every list row a margin top and bottom or just a margin in general. And I can just give a margin of 1.5 rem, which might be a lot. But yeah, see, so giving it a vertical margin also helps our lives a little better, uh, makes our lives a little more cleaner and nicer. And yeah, maybe I can give it a margin of 2 rem in fact, top and bottom and 1.5 rem. Yeah, so this makes our lives even much more cleaner, right? So I think this was the touch that we were missing and this gap is a good gap and our list is also uh, neatly arranged. So once your grid is made, making the list was not that hard, right? And something that I'll do is I'll give my list row a certain animation as well. So I'll give it a hover effect and I'll say background color will be equal to VR dark gray, right? And what I would like to do is, I would like to give this after a transition of um, all 0.3 seconds like usual. And what we can also do is give this a border radius of let's say 0.3 rem. And let's see how that looks. So this is how that looks. Again, not the best. And we definitely need a padding inside my this thing as well. So what I'll do is I'll give this a, let's keep the margin as this and let's give it a padding of one rem as well. So that means every, any, anyways, it'll look a little more cleaner. Yeah, this looks better, right? And giving it a bigger uh, border radius will make our case a little better. So this phase, it's a little better. Correct. Now, something that I like to do is I like to make these two things left aligned, this centrally aligned or left right aligned and these three things right aligned basically. So what I'll do is I will go to my list view and I will say uh, my coin price. Okay. And my total volume. So these two things will have a TD dash right dash aligned to them. And I just feel this uh, looks better in my personal opinion. So what you can do is you can have uh, text align right to this. And this phase what happens is these two, three become right aligned. I think what I can do is with my price, I can let it be uh, centrally aligned. If that makes sense, so TD dash center aligned. And this phase at least this can be centrally aligned. And that looks a little better as well. So text align center. So this phase, this is left aligned, this is centrally aligned and towards this side it becomes right aligned. So this phase the distribution looks much more cleaner or at least in my opinion it does. Right. Even with the chips, what I like to do is like over here, point 0.81 is slightly longer than this. So what we can do is we can, and this is something that we didn't notice in my grids, but what I would like to do is in my coin uh, per price chip, I would give this a min width of let's do um, 100 pixels and see how that looks. 100 pixels is a lot. I think 50 pixels. Mm, no, this is still getting reduced a little bit, maybe 60. Yeah, so 60 is nice because now at least all of them have the same, uh, you know, distance for, uh, you know, making sure that this does not break. We'll make the price by default at 64 pixels and the text line is centered anyways. So see, there are these tips and tricks that you need to do to make sure that your code looks really clean, right? And now this looks way, way, way better. I think we have actually created a better component uh, over here 
than we have you know over here now something that i would want to do is apart from this or we have already added this hover effect as well if you notice over here we have tooltips so if i hover over something it actually shows me that exact things uh, tooltip right so tooltip is also this component provided by mui by the way and what that means is that when you hover over a certain component what it allows you to do is it allows you to give it a certain text so let's just look at where tooltip is over here right inside my data display and if i hover over an icon it shows me what that icon is for or if i hover over something right and to make a tooltip it's very simple just add tooltip and that's it that's all you need to do so let's say if i were to add a tooltip to my um this particular td which is the td for my current price right i can just wrap my entire thing inside a tooltip entire td inside a tooltip and what I can do is import this and say the title is uh, current price and this does not disrupt the styling at all this does not change anything rather it makes my life easy because now if I hover over it it shows me the current price that I'm hovering over the current price right so things like these actually are great for UX correct because since we don't have a conventional table where we are showing the heading as well if you want to show that that is completely cool I don't mind you doing that but since we don't have a conventional table, I would suggest that you use uh, technologies like tooltip and like over here, I'll say this is the coin logo, right? And you should in general use tooltip. I think using a tooltip not only uh, helps your website become better, but it also helps with your um, SEO because now, you know, your website is going to be compatible for people who, um, let's say if your image is not over or something like that, right? So I can say coin info over here. Uh, similarly over here this becomes coin percentage change in the last 24 hours right so I can technically wrap all of this entirely inside my I can say this is the price change in 24 hours so price change in 24 hours right HRES so this way is uh, if I hover over it says price change in 24 hours right and if you feel this is not aligned centrally you can use tooltips like over here it says um, bottom start right so if i give my tooltip a specific direction like over here they're doing and the way to do that is just placement right so if i say placement is equal to bottom start correct i should be able to place it properly so if i say over here placement is equal to bottom start right and if i go over here now i feel this tooltip is better than the tooltip that we had because this is aligned with this thing correct so again the alignment is totally up to you like over here center is not working for this either so what we'll do is place in bottom start to that particular thing as well correct to my coin info and this phase now this will be starting from here did you guys see that change correct so there are certain there's a lot of things that you can do with these as well and especially tooltip is really important for our uh, total volume and total price because there's no way for a user to know what it is till the user you know um and understands the grid and then um technically uh, what do you say read about it anyways so we'll have our total volume over here and then we'll have our uh, market cap next to it now when we make this entire component a little responsive that is going to be a little painful for us and i'll tell you exactly why and I would want you guys to do that off screen as well, because that is something I feel you guys can do yourselves, right? And anyways, so now market cap is also working exactly fine. So total volume and market cap. And obviously we don't have to keep their placements as bottom right or whatever. I can keep it as bottom dash center or bottom dash. Yeah, I think center would look good. Let's see how center looks. Uh, something is wrong just a second is my uh, cannot read properly so I'm fine reading X okay that must be a glitch anyways as you can see right now this is not really responsive so we will be making this responsive soon enough but anyways right hmm we did mess up somewhere let me see as to what is wrong. Is my placement or right? This is what we are using, right? Tooltip, uh, placement maybe. What if I get rid of it and then try it? Yeah, no, it's fine. I think I had messed up something. 
for some reason let me try it again so placement I will have over here uh, placement will be bottom center or bottom end let's do bottom end yeah bottom end works fine right or even bottom center will work fine whatever you guys want anyways okay so now coming to making this entire component uh, responsive so what we'll be doing to make this responsive is that firstly if you guys notice that when this shrinks i firstly get rid of the icons right after a certain point i just got rid of the icon right the second thing that i will be doing is after uh, 800 pixels what we'll do is we will convert the number into billions and millions so what happens is this is a big number it has nine digits right what we want is in the mobile view i'll be converting this into something which is just in uh, terms of b or m and whatnot like this is all billions if i go over here these hold millions right so these are the cryptocurrencies which hold millions in market cap so this i feel is much more better and cleaner than having to uh, you know read so many numbers right so this is one thing that we'll be doing and the second thing that we'll be doing is getting rid of this icon so what we can do is firstly i'll say over here we have the icon right so i'll say td dash icon and that over here as well i'll do the same thing and now what we'll do is i'll go to my um, media queries and i will be adding that inside my media query correct so let me just get the code for that over here we have a media query so uh, below a screen size of 800 or even you can set that value so wherever your entire list component is uh, you know kind of failing or kind of uh, not responsive anymore that is where you will have to do that so over here i can do something like td dash icon and i can say something uh, like display none and instead of this let's make it thousand so what happens is in my code at least in this version if i inspect my element and if my screen size goes up below a what do you say a certain amount which is thousand this goes away right obviously this code is still not the best this is overflowing a lot and we don't want that to happen something that i'll also have to do is inside my tabs over here i would have to make my um, table more than 80 percent so how about after a width of 1200 i'll just make it 990 percent or 95 percent even that way i know there is going to be a lot of real estate for me to work with right this way at least i have more real estate correct and uh yeah anyways so first things first i will have to give this a definite size because this is shrinking so what we can do is we'll go to the grids over here we'll have the icon chip and inside my icon chip even though i have given it a height and a width i would like to make this as important so that is i don't think so now it should be shrinking any further right and it completely goes away is there a point yes it is still shrinking so we'll have to see as to why is this shrinking Hmm, maybe because of my width of my T, uh, you know, TD being 18%. Let me just have a look. So if I get rid of uh, the 18% part of this TD, right? Uh, hmm. Yeah, over here. Then it's fine. Okay. So this is firstly where it's, you know, causing us an issue. So width shouldn't be 18% after a certain point. So we'll have to fix that as well, right? So maybe what I can do is after a certain point, let's say 1200, I can not 1200. I think thousand is just fine after or 1100. Let's do 1100. Exactly when it starts to shrink, what I'll do is I will just say the, uh, or I can just get rid of it over there, right? So see, it's totally up to you how you want to deal with situations. You can get rid of it completely. It makes your life much, much easier because trust me, I have wasted a lot of time on this and it doesn't really get easy. Next step is reducing total volume or getting rid of total volume. So what we'll do is I think below um, thousand, we can get rid of total volume or before doing that, first thing, let's try to reduce the size of the text. So what we'll do is I'll say list row TD and then let's just reduce the size of the text. So what? By the way, if you didn't know, you can reduce the font size and percentages as well. So I can even say 80% and I can say important. And that means after, a, you know, after going below a certain value, the text should decrease. 
over here there's chances that it might not because of this reasons uh, we don't have any text inside our td we have it inside these classes so we will have to change that okay anyways so this was an option you can reduce the size one by one right or you can change them accordingly or what you can do is just get rid of um, what is this we can get rid of td dash total volume right so over here i'll just make another class td dash total volume and we'll just get rid of this right so you can use tricks like this to get rid of certain things and towards the end what we'll also do is i can just say total volume and i can say display none over here right and so that means after a certain point this will totally go away so this will not bother us and this is what we have and this will work fine for a little while and after that what you'll have to do is as soon as we get below 800 pixels we'll have to reduce this thing and we'll have to overall reduce the font size of everything so at this point the ideal way of doing things is that by giving everything a little um, you know sizing of changing the size of everything according to the media query and we also need to change this thing so let's do this first right so over here what we'll do is we'll build another func another folder over here which will be called functions so now this is where all of our functions will be and i think i've already created it yeah over here we already have a page called a uh, folder called functions right so now now what i want to do is i want to say that after you know below 800 pixels or below 900 pixels or whatever media query i decide after that i don't want to show this rather i want to show um, the value that this function returns so for this i've actually made a uh, made a very simple function and i'll just quickly show that to you guys and this is the code that i've written for the december one right so over here as well if we quickly go to my functions folder which is over here and if i show you guys the function that we have written so i think it's called convert numbers and what it does is it just simply compares so it just compares that is my number less than 1000 if it is we'll just return the number if the number is greater than 1000 and if it's less than a million we're going to add a k to it like 100k 200k and so on if the number is greater than uh, 1 million and less than a billion we're going to add an m to it that means 100 million 200 million right if it is greater than a billion we just add a b to it now this is an algorithm that i have chosen and what it does is we just have to call this function and return this number right so this is a basic if else if else if function that i've made there is another application of this as well that I think I did it in the January uh, version of this code that I wrote again. So in the January version, we had a, a much more cleaner code for this, if I remember correctly. I'll just quickly show that code to you guys as well. So it is up to you to, you know, if you want to write your own algorithm, feel free to do that. Right? Nobody can say anything to you. But yeah, so we have crypto dash Jan. I hope this opens. Yes, it did. Okay, so over here, the function that we had written was notice that the folder structure is same everywhere right convert numbers.js and this is the function that we had written so now what it does is it just uh, kind of does it regarding to the length so firstly we write number dot two locale string and what we do is we split it because of commas because number dot two locale string will give us commas right so now if there are five digits that means it's in trillions if it's four digits that four uh, you know things that means it's in billions uh, if it's something else, that means it's in millions, right? If it's three, then it's millions. Because what will happen is, let's say a thousand will look like this. So array dot, like number with commas dot split will give me one comma zero, 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 right? In an array. So this is what it will give me. Correct. So now I know that my, uh, what do you say? Array has two. So that means I need to add a K, right? Then I know if let's say I have, um, this as my thing right so that means if there are three objects like uh, array dot split or number dot split with commas will give me three uh, objects or my three strings inside my array right so at this point i know that we need to add an m so over here if it's three we're adding an m similarly for billions we're going to add a b right so even this uh, entire function is something that you can use and what you need to do is we'll just go to our vs code again and I'll make that function inside my folder. So I'll say convert numbers. Mm, this is not it as well. This is it. 
right so there can be many ways to solve a problem that's totally up to you so i'll say convert numbers.js and over here what i'm going to do is i'm just going to copy this and now all i need to do is go to my list component over here i will copy this totally and i will paste it again and this uh, td will actually be called class name and it will be called um, mobile dash td dash mkt right and this one i'll call it as uh, desktop dash td dash mkt right so what that means is this is the table data for the desktop one and this is the table data for the mobile one correct so i'll say desktop over here right and now the only thing that will happen is over here i'll say convert uh, numbers and i'll just pass coin dot market cap and that is all that i need to Right, and I'll be importing convert numbers from my um, this function that I have over here. Convert number, it's not numbers, my bad. Convert number, and I'll just import it from my functions. And that is all. Now, what I'll do is in my list view, I'll say desktop dash td dot mkt is going to be visible at all times. But when my view is, let's say, uh, 800 pixels, I'm going to say display none to this thing. Okay. So that means my desktop view will be gone, correct? Obviously, it will be inside 800 pixels. And please bear with me, for some reason, my Mac is also, um, the frame rate is dropping. I'll have to look as to why that's happening. Maybe because this video has exceeded 30 minutes, but anyways. So this will be display none. And um, the other one, which is going to be mobile td.mkt will be display block, right? And by default, what's the case? That by default, the other one, which is uh, desktop mobile.mkt will be display none, right? So that way is what happens is, this thing now is billions, but before 800 pixels, right? This was not, correct? So this is just a few ways by which you can make this responsive. Even right now, this is not going to be fully responsive because you will have to eventually decrease the font size. So one tip that I would like to give to every, uh, you know, beginner or every React developer or any web developer in general would be if you're making things responsive, make sure that you decrease the font size uh, eventually. Right. And that is the best thing to do because, uh, yeah, you need to decrease the font size with the screen size because obviously if your text is way too large, it's going to cause you a lot of trouble to fit your text into that real, uh, you know, screens. Uh, what do you say? Whatever real estate you have with the screen. Anyways, so with this, our entire list view is also done, even though it's not fully responsive, but it is a little responsive, right? Come making it completely responsive is something that you will have to do. And yeah, so our list view is done. Our grid view is done. Now what we need to do is we need to build the search bar. We need to do pagination. And after that, our dashboard page will be done. We will be building the search component, which is just a simple filter component. And all we will be filtering is the coins that we are sending in our tabs component. So for that, let's quickly go to our VS code. I have my server already up and running. And now what I need to do is inside my tabs component, as you guys know, I'm already passing my hundred coins that I have. So now what I need to do is I need to basically make a search component. And first I'll quickly make the UI for that. And then we'll be writing the filter function for that. And that is also something which is very easy. So let's start with our search folder. Inside this folder, we'll obviously have an index.js and a styles.css right inside my uh, search index.js i'll just have my rfce search component and that is about it i will also have an import dot slash styles dot css right and uh, let me quickly import this inside my dashboard page as well and then i'll just quickly render it and see so if i have it over here and import it this is what we see on our screen this is what we need to make obviously but as of right now we should be seeing it on the screen and yeah here we go we do see the search component over here right so now all we need to do is we just need to make an input and for that if you guys look at look at our search field carefully what is happening is that we have an icon and then we have the input so this will be a search component, this will be an icon, and this will be the input. So it will actually be in a flex. And a lot of students don't really know how to do it. And But I have always found it very simple. So let me just show you the way I really prefer it. Right? If you guys want um, to use any other method, you guys can. But this is the method that I personally feel is the easiest, in my opinion. 
so i'll first obviously have an input i'll have a search and let me also import my search icon from mui right so we'll go to mui we'll go to mui icons and if i go over here and go to material icons i just need to tap on that and uh, i'll see my material icons and i just need to write search in between so now this is the basic search icon that we need uh this one right i'll go ahead and use the rounded icon because obviously we are using rounded icon so let me just copy this code go to my vs code and import this over here so all i need to do is have this over here these two icons and now my search flex will be obviously a flex box right so i'll have a dot search flex over here i'll say display flex uh display flex i'll have justify content flex start for obvious reasons i will have a line item center again for obvious reasons i will put a gap of 1 1.5 rem let's start with that i will give this a padding of 0.5 rem and um 1.5 rem let's see how that looks then now what i'll also do is i'll give it a color and i'll give this a color of var dash dash gray so this phase what happens is uh, if i go to my google chrome now and i go to my crypto tracker this is what i see as you guys can see we are already getting there something that i would also like to do is i would like to give this a background color of the uh, dark gray so dark gray and i would also love to give this a width of i think let's do 80 percent and uh, margin left auto and margin right auto so that way it will be horizontally centered as well right so now if i go to my screen this is what we see and as you guys can see this is exactly what we had wanted not exactly but we are getting there right i would also like to give it a margin in general of let's do one rem so that way there will be a little gap at the top and bottom obviously so this is how that looks uh pretty cool and i would also like to give this a border radius of three rem so this phase these edges are uh, colored as well all right okay this looks a little bit and maybe we can reduce the width to 75 percent so that it matches with our entire uh, length or um, 77 or let's just do 80 that's also fine not an issue right and i think we can move on with the next part so something that i would like to do is do this as well this way is um, okay 1.5 is a lot of padding so maybe one rem is fine yeah one room seems to be fine and that's good okay so now what i need to do is we need to style the input that we have so that is also very simple to do just say dot search flex then say input over here obviously not in caps and now all i need to say is background color is the same as my vr dark gray correct my width will be 100 percent width is going to be 100 percent right i will have my font family and my font family will be enter all right so the font family that we are using there not a lot of students know but you have to specify the font family inside any input that you're making the font size let's make it 0.8 rem all right and have a look at this is what we have and right now you guys can see there is a border and there is this outline so we need to get rid of that and even the color is black so i need to say the color will be gray all right i need to get rid of border so i'll say border none and i will also have to say outline none so for that what you need to do is you need to say over here you need to say focus and inside focus you say outline and none so this way what happens is even if i click on it okay it is still there maybe i am doing something wrong will this work yeah this works correct okay and the font size i think let's keep it 1.3 rem let's have a look at how that is this is how it looks so this is still fine right so this is still fine right so our search component is done maybe i'll increase the size of the uh, icon so for that also you just have to use font size this way i think the size has increased a little bit and this is much better right so now let's just quickly edit a little more in our input component i'll give this a placeholder text of search right i will have um type text obviously i'll make two use states so i'll have a cons search over here and set search right and i'll say u state is this so i'll have value so my value will be 
Okay, let me import my use state as well. My value is going to be my search, correct? And I'll have an on change event. And that on change event will be a very simple event. So I'll have an E over here and I'll just say uh, set search is equal to e.target.value. So that way is now everything that I'm going to uh, search is going to get saved in this use state, obviously, and everything else is working the way it should, right? So now what we need to happen is we want whenever my search gets updated, I want to filter my coins, right? So firstly, what we'll have to do is we'll have to make this state global. And the reason why I'm going to do that is also very simple. That is just because I want it to reflect inside my dashboard page. And I will be telling you guys why as to why I'm doing that. So just uh, trust in the process right now, I would say. So what I'll do is I'll make a search and I'll say an on change function over here. Okay. So this value will be search and this on change function will not be nothing but it will be just on change. All right. Or I can maybe even do this. I can say E and if this makes more sense on search change. And I'll have E over here and I'll make this on search change. All right. This makes more sense to me. And now what we'll be doing is we'll be going to our dashboard page over here at the top. I will have my set search. I'll have a function called const on search change. I will write E and basically the same thing. So I'd say set search is equal to E dot target dot value. And that is all. I will also get rid of this. Uh, the comment is no longer needed. I feel and over here I'll pass search as a prop search will be search, uh, obviously, and on search change will also be on search change. All right. That is all. So now if I go to my dashboard and if I run this, this will still work as it should. Right. And now if I console log my search over here, you guys will see that I'm actually getting my search values over here. Console dot dot search. Uh, or I can just say e dot target dot value. Right. So if I go over here and console is not defined, I misspelled it. So I'll say console obviously and if i now inspect my search element and if i go over here to the console and if i console it you guys will actually see that i can actually get all of my search whatever i'm searching right so that is cool so now my search is getting reflected what i now need to do is i'll just have a filter function so i can just say something like var filtered coins and this coins will be nothing but it will be coins dot filter and the coins will be filtered on the basis of let's say item. And all I need to say is um, item dot name dot to lowercase. Uh, or I can just say search include. So do I want my search to include the name or do I want the name to include search? I want the name to include search dot includes. I'll, I'll just explain this. Just give me a second. Search dot to lowercase. And all I'll be doing is I'll be passing this inside this. So now let's let's see what will happen. In fact, let me remove this to lowercase function. And I feel that is not needed as of right now. I'll, I'll still explain it when I do need it. But anyway, so right now what I'm doing is I'm filtering the coins on the basis of the fact that if the coin name is being, if does it include whatever I'm searching. Right, and I'm passing the filtered coins inside this because if you guys know, filter function returns an array. All right, so this way is what is happening is if I write B now, right, as you can see, B is included in this Shiba. If I say A, it just says Shiba. If I say Bitcoin with a capital B, it is going to say Bitcoin, right? Over here, also Bitcoin, over here, also Bitcoin. So now my searching is actually working in real time. If I say XYZ, it's going to show nothing, but if I say, let's say, Ethereum, and if I just say THE. It's going to show this THE, it's going to show this THE, it's going to show this THE, and so on. Right? So we are just making a basic filter function. And the reason why I said dot two lowercase is because right now this is case sensitive. If I say Bitcoin, it's not going to show me anything. But what I want is if it's capital B, if it's small B, it shouldn't really matter. So that is why what we're going to do is we're going to make the case the same. So that is why I said two lowercase everywhere. So what that would do is, uh, okay, obviously two lowercase is a function. So I need to have this, right? So what happens is now if I search and if I say Bitcoin, it still shows me Bitcoin. If I say Bitcoin, it still shows me Bitcoin. 
Alright, but now if I say BTC, it won't show me anything. So what I would want is, I would want to search on the basis of the symbol or this thing. Either one of them. Right, so that is why what we'll do is, I'll say either this or I will say the same thing, but this time it will be item dot symbol. So what that would do is, it will allow me to search on the basis of symbol or the name. And that is about it. I think I have an extra... Um, yeah so this would work now so the way this would work is um just give me a second i think i need to get that out so this needs to be outside this right so either we are going to filter on the basis of uh this thing or on the basis of this thing and i still feel for some reason one of my brackets is not matching now this is kind of right so either it will be on the basis of this name or it will be on the basis of symbol so if my search includes the symbol or the name it's going to show me it right so if i say btc now it's going to show me bitcoin if i say bitcoin it's going to show me bitcoin and that is how you would really implement your simple searching functionality Right, and as you can see, it's working, it's working in real time, everything happens really quick, and the user gets a feel like they're actually searching through, but they're not really. And the best part is that we're passing a filtered coins array inside the tabs, so it doesn't matter if I search for Bitcoin over here, and if I switch to my tabs, this is only show me these for components. So that is what I feel is the best thing about this thing, that it just shows uh, me the entire thing, right, regardless of, um, if I switch the tabs or not, if I delete this or not. Now, one thing that you need to do is you need to build a case where if I search for something which is not there, it needs to say that, you know, you cannot find any, uh, you, you do not find any items of this name or something like that. Like if I show it here, if I type, you know, random, randomly, if I type something, it says no items found and it says clear search. So as soon as I click this, my search goes away and I can actually see this, right? So uh, yeah, that is how you would implement the search bar and a search bar is also done. This video is not that long, it took us 15 minutes. If you have any doubts, I understand that, but understand that this is just a basic filter function that you're filtering. And we could ideally have this inside of here as well, but I didn't want to handle so many states. So I just did it using this thing, right? And the best part about this is this works even if we have zero items or if you're not searching for anything or whatever, right? Now what we want to do is, in the next class, we, we will be building the pagination component. And the pagination component is not something that we'll be taking care through the backend, but it's just something that we're doing on the front end to just give the user kind of an uh, you know experience where we are doing, going to do that. Also something that I realize is we haven't worked on the loader. So we will also do that. So first we'll do the pagination component. After that, we'll quickly make the loader. And while we're making the loader, we'll also make this back to the top button. Now, if I talk about the logic for a pagination component, it is very, very simple. And before the logic, let's just quickly get this component from MUI because again, that is the easiest task to do. Let me just go to the MUI website. I will go on get started. I'll go to my components. Now over here inside my uh, navigation, there is this pagination. So if I click on it, this is the pagination component that we have. And this is a very simple component. We will be styling it custom as well. But as you guys can see, this is something which is very easily uh, doable, right? If you scroll down, you will also realize that there is this uh, on change even that we can add to it and which is this one. So all we need to do is we'll just copy this thing and make it into a new component and see what we get, right? Or I can just copy this entire page code, right? So let me go to my VS code. I will be making one more component inside a dash folder, which will be called the pagination component. And inside my pagination component, I'll again have an index.js and I'll have a styles.css. So over here, again, RFCE, I'll have pagination over here. And in fact, I don't need to do this. I can just paste my code, right? And instead of saying this, I can just say pagination. That is good. Right, I'll also do some cleanup that I usually like to do. I do not really like to import my use state like this. I like to keep my life simple. Something like this is good. Right, so our use state is there, this is there, we don't really need stacks. We will be using a simple div. And over here also we'll have a very simple div, no typography needed. And this is all that we need. 
So now if I actually import this inside my tabs component and I'll just quickly show you what my UI looks like. So not inside my tabs, I'm so sorry, inside my dashboard page. So I'll have my pagination component like this over here and import it like this. So if I import it and go to my Google Chrome and go to my current, just we see that there is some issue, okay. So I understand what it is about. So I'll have to say pagination component over here. I will have to switch this to pagination component. Inside this, I'll have to say pagination component. So the error was that this is pagination and this was pagination as well. So that is why you are getting that error. Anyway, so if I go over here, scroll to the extreme bottom of the page, you guys will realize that over here, I do see my pagination component. Now this is not really visible to you guys because of the fact that it is black. So first order of business is to actually style this properly. Right, now the styling of this is very similar to the styling that we did for our tab. So I'll just quickly get that from the previous code that I've written. And like I said, there's a very uh, custom way of styling MUI projects. And it's also something which is very simple, right? So let me just quickly bring that code to you guys. And um, yeah, so inside this, if we go to my uh, pagination component, which will be inside dashboard, and inside pagination, inside this, I can basically get the entire code, but I would just like to get this SX attribute. I'll copy this, I'll go to my VS code, and that is all that we need currently. So I'll just have this over here, and as soon as I add this code, you guys will understand that my entire pagination component gets styled, and this gets styled in a way which is suitable uh, to our needs, right? So you need to understand that all we did was we got these classes, we said and and we, I had this dot and we were selected and then I, you know, I just made sure that the background color was blue if all of my tabs were selected. So the background color will be blue, the border color will be blue and the color will be white. So that is the reason why if I select something, the background color is blue, the border is blue and the color is white. As you can see, two is written in white. Right. Similarly, if something uh, inside the ellipses, what was happening was without this code, I was still getting these dots or this border around my ellipsis, so I didn't want that. So I said a border zero to my ellipsis, and then obviously the text needs to be white in color and the border of the text needs to be gray if it is not selected. As you guys can see, this is all gray, right? The text is white obviously, but um, the border is gray. So that is what the styling is for. Something that we also need to do is, I just need to give this a class name and I'll give this pagination dash comp right, or component, and I will just go to my styles.css, I'll firstly import it from dot slash styles.css, and I will have it inside my pagination. Over here, I'm just going to say this, and say display is flex, justify content center and align item center. That way, it's going to get centrally aligned, and I can even give it a little uh, padding if I want to, or a little margin if I want to, so I'll give it a margin of, uh, 1.5 rem so that phase there is a little gap between this and this and i think we need to give it a bigger margin bottom so maybe i can just give it a margin bottom of um, 2 2.5 rem let's try that this is how that will look and as you guys can see now there is an equal gap between this anyways so my pagination component is visually looking uh, exactly how i want it to but it needs to have a functionality now, before that, I need you guys to understand how this is going to work. So in my case, I have just chosen to get or fetch 100 coins, right? You might be fetching 200, 250 is the maximum. So you can actually fetch up to 250 coins at a time. Now, if I talk about my pagination component, it has two, three states. The first one being this page state, right? Which is just for the page number. So if we are on page one or if you are on page 10, right? Page one, two, three, four. So whenever I change a page, it just triggers this handle change function and I just set the new page value, right? If you guys see over here, pagination has a count and by default, I'm hard coding this value and I'm seeing that I'll just have 10 pages. So now if I have a hundred coins, that means under 10 pages, that means I need to show 10 coins per page, correct? So if I talk about in terms of an array, let's say I have an array from the index of zero to 99, what needs to happen is the first page, so page one, will have zero to nine, correct? These are the indexes that will be there, right? Then if I talk about page two, right? If I talk about page two over here, the objects that I'll be having will be 10 to 19, right? If I talk about page three, it'll be 20 to um, 29, 
right so just like this i'll have 10 10 10 in every page and the last page right i'll just have dot 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 and the last page will have some uh, again 10 items obviously but the indexes of those will be 90 to 99 right i hope you guys are with me on this because an array's first index is zero the zeroth index item and then the 99th and this means there will be a hundred items page one will start from zero and page uh, it will end at 10. if i talk in terms of let's say if my array is called coins for example coins right i need to say coins dot slice so if it is page one Right, I'll be saying coins dot slice. I need to say zero comma nine. Right, if it is page two, I need to say ten comma nineteen. Now, do I need to write a custom uh, if else uh, you know if else or switch case for this? No, I can just develop a simple algorithm. So the algorithm that I have actually come up with is very simple. Let's say if my page number is, uh, I have a variable called page number, and this is my page number. My page number is one. Right, what will be my slice equal to? My slice will be equal to uh, page minus one, all right, into 10, and then this will be nothing but, uh, yeah, this will be nothing but page minus one to 10 plus 10. So I'll, I'll just explain this. So we'll have an item called the first count. So initial uh, index, the initial index will be page minus one into 10. So now just notice what happens. If my page is one, page minus one into 10 will be zero. Page two will be two minus one is one into 10 will be 10. Page three will be three minus one into 10, which will be three minus one is two, two into 10, 20. So my initial index will be this and my slice will go up to this plus 10 or ideally this plus nine in fact. Right, so what exactly is happening is that, um, yeah, that is about it. So page minus one into 10, and this will be page minus one into 10 plus nine, because this will be till nine, right? And if I talk about in terms of slicing, this one is inclusive and this is not inclusive. So this will actually be 10. So if I talk in terms of a normal slice convention, so the way that would go about is that this will be a close bracket and this will be nothing but it will be a zero over here and this will have obviously the next digit. So this will be 10 over here, this will be 20, this will be 30, and this will be 100. So this is how my slice works. So this is zero comma 10. So over here, instead of nine, we'll have this. I, I hope you guys were with me. So basically this is just the filter function that we need to have or the slicing function that we need to have for our page component, right? And you guys can have, if you guys want, you can have a switch case as well. And this will change according to your needs. But this is the algorithm that I came up with. And now all we need to do is I'll just cut this quickly. And I will pass these two things again as props over here. Because the count will be selected from the main dashboard.js page. Right, so I'll have this. I'll have handle change over here. And these two things are completely fine. Uh, this is the logic that I have. I'll go to my dashboard page. And I will quickly paste these two things over there. Instead of handle change, I'll just say handle page change. Right. Now, all I need to do is pass page comma handle change over there. So I'll have page over here. And I need to pass handle change as handle page change. And that is about it. Right. So right now, if I go and change pages, nothing really happens, but the state of this is changing. Right. And already even are my coins changing too? Okay, this is the crypto page. I'm so sorry. If I go over here and change my page, as you guys can see, something is wrong. Hmm, we have handle change over here. We have handle change. I'm passing handle change. So maybe I need to do this. Right, let's see if this works now. Okay, look, something is off. Page, comma, handle. Let me just make this handle page change. And if I go to my dashboard page over here, and we'll page change, handle page change. Right, and just like that, now this should work. As you guys can see, this is now completely working. And all I need to do now is just slice, right? So something that you guys need to understand is that I will make a new, uh, this will be all of my coins. So I need to make a new array of coins and call them paginated coins. All right, and that is how we will be functioning. So I have another use state called paginated coins. 
and what I need to do is on page change I will not only be updating this I will also be updating this so I'll say uh, we are previous index is equal to value minus one star 10 right and my set page needed coin will be uh, coins dot slice right I'll have previous index plus previous index plus 10 and that is about it now all I need to do is if I go over here I need to pass page needed coins and over here I'll also say this uh, previous index will be 0 and this will be 10 because by default I need to just show the first 10 coins so now let's have a look and see what we have so I can just see 10 coins if I do 2 you guys will see that I should have seen the next 10 coins but something is off let me have a look at what is wrong I am passing my page needed coins uh, I am passing my page needed coins over here as well and I am slicing them over here mm. previous index previous index plus 10 this is value minus 1 and uh, let me see as to why what is happening mm, uncontrolled page state uh, let me refresh and have a look so this is the first uh, set of coins and i see no coins already okay so something is wrong set page needed coins is an array so i'm saying coin dot slice and obviously coins is going to be there previous index previous index plus 10 i think this is the correct logic right maybe i'm missing something over here i'm going to say coins dot slice okay so over here instead of coins dot slice i need to say response dot data dot slice because sometimes states work that way right and now this should be working completely fine if i say two it is again showing me something a component is changing the control page state of the page to be uncontrolled so the reason as to why that was happening is because if you guys noted in the pagination function or uh, let me just get rid of this quickly and tell you so if i go to my google chrome and if i try to change my page as of right now this is the error that we are getting now the reason for that is because we are not really passing anything in our handle change function if i go to my dashboard.js what you'll see over here is that we have an event comma value and these are parameters that we need to technically pass Right, so what I need to do is over here, I need to say event comma value and I need to pass them somehow over here as well. So I'll just say event comma value over here as well. And now if I do that and go to my Google Chrome, refresh the page. And now if I change my this thing, it completely works. And something that you realize is that it happens very effortlessly. Right, now something that you need to understand is now our search functionality is not no longer working. Because if you guys notice over here inside my dashboard page the reason why my function was working was because of this so now there's an actually very simple way of doing handling this is that uh, what i would want uh, you guys to handle this that if we are searching then just show the filtered coins if you're not searching then just show the paginated coins so if i'm going to search i would want to just show them the filtered coins right else just show them this coins and the pagination component as well if I am searching something or if I'm not searching something right only then would I want them to show the paginated functionality otherwise or pagination component otherwise there's no need for the pagination component now this why I'm doing this is as to because let's say if I'm searching for something right if I'm searching for Bitcoin there's now no need for my handle page even because obviously I just want to show the searches right if you're searching we don't really need pagination because we'll al already be searching for something which is very specific and otherwise it would have also been very very complicated to handle both the things because then you would have to do paginated or you would have to slice the filtered coins and then pass that and so on so to make a life simple if you're searching something just get rid of the pagination component as you guys can see if you're not just have the pagination component and let the pagination component do its job right and that is about it with this our entire pagination component is also done so now this is something that we should have done um, especially the loader is something that we should have actually started off with because APIs in general, as you guys know, might take some time, you know, to actually process and fetch the data. 
so there is obviously a need for a loader in any uh, api or you know any website which is not really hard coded it has something to do with you know data fetching or something like that so it's always a good ux to have a new x basically refers to user experience and that is something like i said in the beginning of this uh, series is something that we actually take very seriously right so now how do we make the loader now you need to understand that loader is nothing but we just need to show a specific component while we are in a state where we know we haven't received or you know uh, as you guys are aware of what promises are every api call that we make is a promise now by default a promise is in the state of pending unless it has been resolved or rejected so basically what a loader is, is that it's just a spinny component as you guys already know, like if I show you the loader for this, it's just a simple spinny component that you guys saw in the first two seconds, right? That is there while our promises has not been resolved or rejected, but is still in the pending state. So that is the original definition of loading. But what we need to basically do is before fetching, just make sure, just show our loader. And once our fetching is done, just get it off it in simple terms. So for that, we'll also be using MUI. And if you go to MUI, you will see that there is this feedback thing called progress. And if we click on it, it's nothing but it is a circular, uh, you know, this is just a simple component. It's literally just this line that we need to import. So for that, what we'll be doing is we'll just be going to our code. I will be making a common component since the loader is a common component and we'll be using it in every page. I just need to add a loader over here. And all I need to say is index.js. I don't even need a styles for this. And just say RFCE, make my loader like this, and just paste this part over there, import this, and that is all. So now, I mean, I do really need styles for this. So let me just quickly make that as well. So let me just say dot slash styles.css. And over here, I'll say styles.css as well. I need to just have a big div and call it loader dash container i think that would be cool uh, container and once that is done i just need to copy this paste it over here and uh, say display flex because you want it to be centered i'll let you know as to why i'm doing this so display flex just by content center align items center i need to say width is 100 view width I need to say height is 100 view height. I need to say background color is we are black. Right. The color that I will have is also the color that is we are dash dash blue. Right. And uh, position needs to be fixed or absolute. Right. And Z index needs to be a thousand. So that it's always at the top. So now if I technically extract this and if I go to, let's say my dashboard page and if I get rid of all of this code and I just have the loader component, I'll just show you how it looks like. Right. And if I go to my save this and if I go to my Google Chrome, go to my Twitter tracker, this is how it looks. As you guys can see, this is the loader that we want to show. Right. Now what I want uh, to happen is nothing but I just need to say something like if when, as soon as we start fetching, so I'll make a new state, which is called loading or is loading. I think is loading is better, right? Set is loading by default set is loading will be true. And what we'll do is over here, I'm going to say as soon as we get our uh, data from a use effect, I'll just say set is loading as false. And even if we get an error, let me just say set is loading as false so that there's no loader and you know, maybe you can give the user some feedback. Now, all I need to do is I just need to wrap all of this. Uh, yeah, in fact, I'll just wrap all of this inside. Um, first, I need to do this so that I don't get any syntax errors. Then I just need to say is loading, which it will be by default. So if it is loading, I just need to show my loader. Correct. If it is not loading, I need to show this. And that is technically all that I need to do to have my loader. And something that I like to do is get my header out of the way. Right. And I'll tell you as to why I'm doing this in the future. But anyways, so if I am loading something, I would just want to show my loader and otherwise I would not. So now if I hard refresh, you guys will see that we actually get the loader for a millisecond. Now, the reason for that is CoinGecko's API is really, really good and really optimized and it's really efficient. 
so you will hardly face any issues at least in the dashboard page maybe in the compare page when we make a lot of api calls you know back to back uh, you will need the look to show the loader but this is just in case right and that's that's the best part about this anyways so once that is done we can now move to the back to the top button and that button is also something which is very simple to make it is nothing but we just need to have a button which is floating on the screen and if i tap on it 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 needs to take me back to the top of the page right and there's actually a very simple uh, javascript code for this and pure javascript code that is so back to the top yeah how to create a scroll back to the top and all this does is if i scroll down it will show me this button and if i click on it it takes me to the top of the page so let me just quickly show you guys the code for this because that is also very simple we'll have a basic styling for the button and what happens is i'm by default seeing my display is none for the button so as you guys can see i don't see any button but as i start scrolling i see my button the reason for that is they have an on scroll function over here which basically tracks if i've scrolled more than 20 pixels it will make my button dot style dot display as blocked right i can maybe increase this to 100 so if i'm i've scrolled more than 100 pixels only then will my button be visible right if i make this 300 it will be a little more right so that means i can just make sure whenever i'm done i've done a bit of a scrolling i can then just show this button and i click on it the function that it runs on clicking of it is this doc function which is nothing but it just says document.body.scrolltop0 and that is all you need to do over here it says document.body.scrolltop greater than 300 which that means is if you have scrolled for more than 300 uh, pixels right and that is all that you need to do now the code for that is also simple so all we need to do is we just need to make a simple quick component which will also be a common component because we'll be using it then and again right so i'll just say back to top and i'll have an index.js over here and i'll have a styles.css over here right and all i need to do is rfce make a simple button and the styling of which will also be very very simple i just need to make a class name for this and say uh, back dash to dash top dash btn that is a big <laughs> that is a really big class name but anyways now i need to have an MUI icon over here. I'll quickly go over here, get my MUI icon from material icons. So I'll go to material icons, click on that, and just go to the top icon. So I just need to say arrow. So the arrow that we're looking for is something like this. Maybe there's a better one. Um, no, let's just stick with this quickly. So I'll just go to rounded. This is the arrow that we want. I'll copy this and I'll have this inside this. Sorry, not the import. I need to have the import over here and have my button over here. And that is all that I need to do. Right, now I'll make sure that the color for this is blue. So for that, I'll just go over here, say color and say we are attach blue. And back to the top, styling for this is also very simple. I just need to say uh, position is fixed uh, display by default is none obviously I don't want to show this button but right now let me just say block or let me just say flex like I said flex is a trick that I like to use to make to center my items or center my icons align item center over here I'll give this a width of um, 3 rem a height of 3 rem Right, I misspelled the rem over here. I need to say border radius is 50%. Right, and also give it a border. So I need to give it a border first, two pixels solid. We are dash dash blue. And um, I'll give this a margin of 1.5 rem as well. So this way is if I go over here now, and if I copy this, take this to my dashboard page, and add this button somewhere over here, or maybe I'll just add it over here with the header and import this. What I should see is my back to the top button. And as you guys can see, back to the top is not defined because I haven't saved the import. And now it shows me, and this is what I see, which makes sense because I think I haven't really um, imported my styles over here firstly. So I need to say import dot slash styles dot css and i also forgot something when i said position fixed over here i need to say bottom uh 1.5 rem 
I'm going to say write 1.5 right and I don't need my margin if I go this is what I see as you can still see my button is always there now when I click I need to run those functions so firstly I also need to say cursor pointer that means I know that this is a button and on clicking of it something happens and the function for which I'll just copy from here so you technically just need to get this that is all that you need to do and like I said the code is very simple just have this over here and then you just need to give this my button ID to the button obviously don't forget to do that so I'll just give this ID to my button and um, on click of this we'll have on click on click of this I just need to run this top function this is the top function which makes sure that my button uh, when I click on it it goes back to the top as you guys can see it is working but it is technically right now teleporting right also something that happens is that over here I need to say flex that means if I scroll down only then will my like as you can see if I'm already on the top my button is not visible but if I scroll a little bit only then is my button visible right so that makes it more useful and something that I need to take care of is that if I click on it it just directly teleports me and that is not something that I want to handle that what you need to do is you need to go to your index.css inside your HTML you need to say scroll behavior and you need to say smooth smooth and what that allows us to do is now if I tap on this it will scroll smoothly to the top of the uh, page right and that is just a good UX to have as well so it is these things which actually make your project really um, clean and good to use or friendly to use. So keep on adding such little little things here and there which makes your life easy and makes the life of the user easy as well. So with this now we are officially done with our dashboard page. In the next uh, video we are going to talk about the custom coin base that we need to make and it will have dynamic routing. So basically what will happen is as soon as I click on Bitcoin it needs to take me to the Bitcoins page. So for that, firstly, we'll be doing this dynamic routing. And obviously we have already made the router. We have already made this list component. So first we'll import this and then we'll have our coin description and then we'll move to the main part of the project, which is this uh, chart functionality. And once that is done, we'll move on to the compare page. So once you make the coin page, you will realize that the compare page is not really hard to make. It is one of the easiest things that you can do because of the fact that we'll be making our code really really modular and really really uh, easy to use uh, dynamic routing now the reason for that is let's say you have 100 coins now we won't be making a hundred custom pages or a hundred custom routes and we're making a hundred custom you know uh, files for these things that is just silly so that is where dynamic routing comes in where we'll have slash coin slash id of the coin because if you guys remember the coin Gigo api actually allows us to fetch a specific coins data based on the id of that coin so i'll just quickly show you that you guys that url as well so today's uh, lecture will just be about us making our page uh, dynamic and then accessing that um, you know that id and then just simply uh, fetching our data based on it right as you can see, guys can see we have a slash coin slash id route where if i write bitcoin which is the id of bitcoin's page and if i just execute this we will get a lot of data revolving around bitcoin as you guys can see this data is absolutely massive and the reason why it's massive is because it contains a lot of uh, you know a lot of key value pairs and obviously all of these we do not need so we will be writing a function to kind of just you know use the key value pairs that we need or we require in our project to make our lives much more simpler and to also not take up a lot of space or a lot of memory of the systems at which we will be viewing this website in right so without any further ado let's just get started so first things first we will be building this dynamic route to access the um, id of that particular coin so let's say for that all we need to do is we just need to write this entire thing so we have slash coin slash colon id now this is something that is provided by react router dom and i'll just show you the exact application of this as well so over here let me just say coin sorry it won't be a page it will it won't be a folder it'll actually be a page so i'll just say coin.js and then inside this I'll say RFCE and let me just say coin page over here right so now once that is done I will just uh, obviously be importing my coin page into my app.js and now let's actually head over to our coin page so if I go over here and if I say slash coin right and slash one two three let's actually see what we get we get our coin page not a big issue 
Now, the entire point of dynamic routes is to access this particular number because what we want to do is we want to get this from the URL, URL parameters that we have. Now, there's actually a function provided by, um, you know, React Router DOM for that, which is basically called React uh, Use Params, right? So if I show you the application of that, you just need to call that function something like this, where we have Use Params, and all I need to do is just this. And I'll just explain to you exactly as to why this is helpful and why do we need it as well. So let's say I go to my coin page, I have uh, this inside my code, and I'm porting this from obviously react router dom and what i'll be doing is i'll just say id is equal to id right let me go to my uh, google chrome now and if as you guys can see now whatever i write over here i'll be able to get that so if i say bitcoin i'll have id dash bitcoin if i say you know if i say xyz whatever i'll get this if i say abc i'll get that and the reason why that happens is because this use param is a hook provided by React Router DOM and it basically allows us to get whatever we have initialized over here. So now if I say this is not the ID and if I say this is the coin, right, or coin ID, what I would have to do is I would have to go to my coin page and over here instead of destructuring it as an ID, I would have to destructure it as something like this. Now the reason why that is there is because let's say I say const params and I just say console.log params right so let me just show that to you guys and uh, go to my google chrome id is not defined obviously because we've gotten rid of it let me just say this and now if i inspect element and i go to my console you guys will see that our react router gives us this object which is nothing but it has dot coin id inside of it and what is inside of dot coin id the string that we have after this slash so thus what we understand is that when I write this code, whenever I say slash coin slash colon something, if I say ID, we are basically declaring a variable over here ID that can be accessed through our URL and then I can just destructure it like this and just pass it in my code. So this way is what happens is that now if I let's say go to the page of Ethereum or go to the page of any other coin, what will happen is if I say Ethereum over here, right? I can access this value as a variable and I can say, okay, I know that my coin is Ethereum. So I will be fetching an API call in my use effect where this slash ID will actually will be the slash of my uh, particular, you know, URL param, whatever I'm getting. So that is what we mean by dynamic routing. And if you guys want to know more about it, please, you can Google it. It is a very useful technique that people use everywhere. Even the very Google search that we use uses it. So let's say if I write hi, hello over here, notice that inside my search, hi plus hello is actually there. So URL queries or URL params is something that every every uh, you know website uses and they use it very openly. Sometimes to even pass very uh, crucial information like tokens and whatnot. So this is the way you pass data from one page to the other without complicating your lives by adding you know Redux or context or something like that. So this is just an easier way of passing variables or certain values from one page to the other through URL uh, parameters, right? So, okay. So now what we need to do is, now I just need to have a use effect over here. And inside my use effect, what I'll be doing is I'll have my ID over here, because obviously I need to call this once I get the ID, I'll say if ID is there, then we need to make that API call. Now, as you guys know, making API call is very, very simple. All I need to do is just get my axios and just say axios.get and then dot then dot then and get my data. Right, so let me just copy this code as it is as of right now. And we will also be making this code very modular because as of right now, it is not really modular and I do understand that. But right now, I just want to show you guys how to use this ID parameter that we have. Right, so then over here, I'll have string interpolation. And the reason for that is obvious because I need to access uh, you know, slash coin slash ID. I need to access my variable. So this is what I'll have. And towards the end, I'll just say ID over here. Right, now once that is done, we'll get a response. I'll just quickly show my response. And uh, one thing that we'll be doing right off the bat is actually making our loader. So the loader is obviously going to make our life very simple. So is loading, comma set is loading. And I'll just say is equal to use state and by default, let's make it true over here as well. Right, so this way we'll be showing our loader as well. And let me also add my header over here. So let me just say header. 
obviously I'll be importing header from my components then I'll just be saying is loading if it's loading show the loader right uh, loader if it is not loading then obviously let's say just say hi and this is the ID right and that is good for now and obviously i'll say set is loading is there i'll just get rid of these two things and let's see if we are actually getting a response right have i imported axios yes i have have i imported use state no i haven't let me import my use state have i imported use effect not really so i've imported everything is there set is loading is there by default my loader is true if i'm getting my result then i'm saying set is loading is false so let me go to my google chrome and see if this actually works and let me just get rid of it and let me refresh it says it gives me an error it says um, request field with the status code of this obviously so abc is not really a coin so it's not going to give me anything but if i say bitcoin right let's see if we get the data of bitcoin yes we do the status is 200 the data is we get the id and we obviously get whatever data is there right we get the images we get the categories we get the links so we actually get to see that we are getting a lot of things right now even the image that we're getting we're getting it in three sizes so we're getting an image large size small size thumb size right we are getting the last updated we're getting the market data which contains a lot of data by default right and it contains it in every uh, currency as well so if i talk about current price which is this so current price is in every uh, possible available currency we just need usd right so as you guys can see, there is a lot of unnecessary data that we are already getting. And all of this is something that we don't really need. Like if I talk to you guys in terms of description, let me show you guys the description. The description is in so many languages. There's even a Korean language as you guys can see. So obviously all of these things are very useful, but as of right now, they're not really useful to us because you know we don't really need to uh, take care of so much of data. But like, again, like I said, this is your project. So if you guys want to take care of so much data, feel free to do that and you know go ahead and do whatever you want to with this data. Maybe add some UI, maybe add a toggle, maybe make this uh, website compatible in many languages. At least that means you guys can save the Korean um, you know, language or something like that. Maybe you guys can show the data in different currencies as well. So maybe have a toggle for the currency as well. You guys can use uh, Redux, use context or something like that to save the currency in which you are viewing it personally. And uh, all of these little, little things will actually take this project to, um, you know, good or great heights. But right now, as of right now, this is not really needed. So what I have actually gone ahead and I will be doing is I've actually taken the pain of making a function to strip all of the user's data that we don't need. Uh, right. So I'll have a coin data uh, state over here. So I'll have set coin data and obviously it will be an empty object or I can just let this be. So what we'll be doing is we will be stripping all of that data that we don't need. So I have already made a function for this, which is called um, setting coin object, coin object. And so let me just copy this and I'll tell you as to what is happening in this entire function. So I'll go to my VS code itself. I do not need this tab and I'll explain this code in a second. Inside my functions, I'll say convert object.js and I'll just have this. So we have this coin object and what it is doing is it takes set state and data. So data will obviously be the data that we have and set state is the state. And I just have uh, ID, which will be data.id, name will be data.name, symbol will be data.symbol and so on, right? As you guys can see, Earlier in the object that we have inside our tabs, what was happening inside the grid, what was happening was there was something called coin.image. But over here, if we look at the object, a coin.image is actually data.image.large. So it would have been coin.image.large, right? If we talk about the price change percentage, it would have been data.marketData price change percentage. Current price would have been data.marketData.currentPrice.usd, right? So instead of, uh, you know, changing all of this code uh, or all of this uh, grid code to make a life simple what i've done is i've actually gone ahead and made this function so now what will happen is inside our coin page all i need to say is i need to say uh, coin object right i'm getting the function i'm going to say set coin data correct and i'm going to pass response.data so this phase, what happens is my coin set coin data or my coin data will now actually contain all of the useful information that I need. So even something that I can do is I can set as loading false later after doing this. And I can just say now 
coin data dot image let's just look at the image right if i go to my google chrome this is the image that i have right so now if i talk about it we can actually just directly not even care whatever we have and just call my list component all right and pass my coin as my coin data and just have my list component over here and that is about it that i need to do and you guys will see that we already have our list component ready to use right now obviously there's something missing in that which is the wrapper so what i actually like to do is wrap my list or anything that i'll be making in this page into something that i would like to call the gray wrapper you guys can give it any class name that you want obviously and what we'll be doing is um, wrapper sorry and i'll just style this in my index.css and this will be kind of like a common component right and all i need to do is just give it a background color of dr gray and uh, just give it a you know margin of uh, maybe 1.5 rem and give it a border radius of 0.5 rem so this way is this is how it looks i'll have to say dark gray so this is how it looks and as you guys can see this is exactly what we needed i'll just make this a little better by giving it a 0.8 and thus it does look something like this obviously and maybe i can even give this a display of block right give this a width of 90 percent i think that looks really good and give this a 1.5 and auto that means this is more or less how it looks as you guys can see similar to this maybe i can also give it a padding so i can give this a padding of 0.5 rem which makes all of our lives a little more easier obviously padding top is not needed so zero rem and 0.5 rem so this is how that looks and just like that we have a pretty cool uh, component that we can you know reuse again and again so just like that in the next lecture we will be building our coin info component which is this component which we will have uh, you know a read more and read less functionality in. and there's actually a trick to kind of add the description as well in this this coin info component that we have over here now this is a very simple component to make provided that we already have the name of the coin that we can see on the screen and we also have the description of the coin. Now there's actually a catch to the description and we'll be talking about it just in a second. But apart from that, this component also had a, has a simple logic of this read more and read less functionality, which also takes care of some edge cases where let's say, you know, if we talk about a coin which does not have a lot of uh, description, in that case, we will not really get any, you know, read more or read less. Like over, even though over here we see it, there are certain coins in which, you know, there's not a big description. So we don't really need to, you know, concatenate or, you know, slice any of the string. So, uh, yeah, so without any further ado, let's just get started, right? So, okay. For this component, first thing that we will need to do is we will be going to our VS code and obviously we'll be making a component now this is the first component of our coin page so you will actually make it inside the coin folder so over here we'll have a coin info uh, component which will have an index.js it will have a styles.css right just like the usual and something that we'll also do is over here make another folder just to you know show our folder structure clearly um one of the components that we will have to make in the future is the um chart component Right, so I can just say line chart over here. All right. So okay. So if I talk about my coin about my coin info component, we'll have to say RFC over here. I'll say coin info, and I will be uh, obviously importing my styles. But apart from importing my styles, I'll also say uh, give this a class name and call it gray dash wrapper. If you guys remember, gray wrapper is this class name that we gave. And anyways so we'll have a title or a heading over here and we'll have the description right to now make our life simpler i will tell you what the heading is the heading will be um obviously my coin name so let's give it an h2 or maybe an s3 we'll come to that in a second right so i'll have an h2 over here i'll say heading and the description will be nothing but it will just be a simple p tag obviously which will have my description Correct. So this is what we have. Now let me just quickly import this inside my coin page and pass in my heading and my um, 
what do you say my description right so obviously very simple to do that my heading will be um, coin data dot heading or I think it's called name coin data dot name and my description will be description which will be coin data dot description let me look at my coin object do I have a description or okay I just have desc over here also I think I have just desc and if I talk about my coin object do I have a coin name yes I do have a coin name perfect so over here I will have a description which will be description over here as well so now if I go to my Google Chrome and the coin from is not defined I will be importing my coin info the moment I do that I see something like this on the screen okay wow so immediately something that I first notice is that I will be requiring some padding inside my gray wrapper so let me just quickly go ahead and do that so let me give it a padding of 0.5 in general I know this really spoils the padding that I have over here but we'll come to this later now so this is what I have for some reason the padding was did not really apply to my text right so maybe I can just give this um, uh, one oh, one rem padding let me see how that looks this looks pretty cool and maybe I can have a zero rem and one rem this way is this is what I have and I'll just give a margin to my heading top and margin over here right so that is something simple to do I can just give um, h2 comma p and I can just give them a margin top or a margin of one rem and zero rem that way is this should get fixed which it doesn't let me say important does it get fixed over here no it didn't Hmm, I'll have to give a custom style only then. Never mind. So if I go to my coin info component, I'm already, you know, I have my styles imported. So I'll just give this a coin uh, the class name and I'll just say coin info dash heading and I'll say class name coin info description. So now I have a coin description coin info description and a coin info heading, which I can obviously style like this not really an issue and I can say margin one rem right let's see if this works so the margin worked but for some reason my margin for my uh, gray wrapper isn't working I will have to take a look as to why that is happening but apart from this there is did you guys notice something off apart from this so if you notice look at the description it has anchor tags inside of it so now that gets me to think and that basically gets me to think that how do I really tackle the situation because what really is happening is that if I talk about the description itself it contains these anchor tags so if I really go to my VS code and if I go to my coin page and if I console.log my coin data once I get it so let's me if, let's say if I console.log this data and I say response.data. I remember it for description dot en so if I console log this what I'll actually be seeing is that my description is a string which contains these anchor tags as you guys can see we are console logging it and it actually contains these anchor tags so these anchor tags are inside the string and if I talk about my element what is happening is all of these are basically text so it's, it's assuming this to be a text and what I wanted to happen is what I want this to consider this to be I wanted to consider this to be something like anchor tags right I think I'll have to go to my bitcoins page to actually see that so let me go to my bitcoins page and over here if I talk about these things are actually anchor tags now let's talk about litecoin right or SHA-256 so if I go over here and if I see SHA-256 I can see that this is SHA-256 which is actually wrapped by an anchor tag so what we need to do is we basically need to wrap my um, I need to tell my component that these anchor tags need to be considered as an anchor tag and not as a string I, I hope you guys are with me so basically what I need to do is I need to somehow set inner HTML of it right and now this is something that we used to do in with our um, uh, pure HTML CSS and JavaScript maybe you guys learned about this in F2 or F3 when you used to say you know a certain component dot inner HTML is equal to this and inside that inner HTML we used to actually pass an HTML 
and that HTML used to consider be considered as an HTML and not as a string. But over here, what's happening is it is not considering our HTML as HTML, rather it's considering it as strings. So how do we change that? Now there's this thing called dangerously set inner HTML inside our React. And the way to do that is very simple. All you need to say is dangerously set inner HTML. And you need to say underscore HTML DESC. So this way is what happens is now if I go to my Google Chrome, all of these SHA-256, this has become an anchor tag. So if I make our lives really easy, let me just go over here and let me go to the styling of it and say A tag and give this a color of VR blue, dash dash blue. Let me give this a text decoration of um, underline, right? Uh, underline and let me have a look at this now. So if you guys see, Mm, I will have to say something like important, I believe. If I go over here now, all of my links are blue and they are underlined, right? So now if you look at the dis difference between that P tag and this P tag is now this P tag really, this these quotes start from Bitcoin and at the, and then they have an anchor tag and then they continue. Whereas if I had the same thing, but instead of saying dangerously set in HTML, I use my other way of, you know, passing it just as a normal string variable. What was happening was, what was happening was over here. Now look at the difference between this and this. So what exactly is happening is notice how it starts the code, code start from B and it ends at the, right? If I look over here, what is happening is the code start and it just directly ends at this part. So this shows me that my anchor tags are actually a part of the string. Whereas when I say dangerously set in the HTML, all of the HTML code inside of it actually gets outside of the P tag. I hope, I hope you guys are with me on this because I'll give you another example. So let's say we are not passing this. Let's say if I'm just passing a string and I'm going to write some HTML code, let me say H1 over here. And let me say, um, you know, let me say hi, right? So, this is how it shows and if I go here now inside my p tag I actually have my h1 tag and that is how I am actually visualizing this correct and that is that is generally what it's about if I give this a height of auto does it fix my issue of <sighs> no it is not there's something really really off with this entire component I'll have to look as to what's happening but anyways Right, I, I hope you guys are with me on this H1 part because what exactly is happening now, whatever we write, whatever HTML we write inside the strings, it is technically becoming an entire, uh, you know, it is taking, considering it to be HTML and not string. So now all I need to do is over here, I'll just go and obviously make the color not this, text decoration important as this. And what I'll do is I will say on hovering of my anchor tags, I want to give them a color of VR blue. So color of VR dash dash blue and important. And that is about it, right? So this phase we do tackle that. And if I talk about the concatenation part, that is also very simple. So what we'll do is I'll create two uh, descriptions. One will be the short description. So this will be disk dot slice and let's slice it till uh, 300 or 200. Right, and the other will be const long desk, which will be nothing but will be the entire description. So by default, I'll be showing the short desk. And what I want to happen is that now, as you guys can see, we're showing the short desk. So what I'll do is I will probably say plus, I will add a span over here, right? Or I can just add it over there. So I'll just, it'll all make sense in a second. So I'd say plus, span inside text because obviously and I'll say read more dot 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 and I'll give this the color of so style is equal to color of V A R dash dash gray. Right. So this way is now my short description actually looks like this as you guys can see I'll have to give this a space so I can give a space over here itself. And as you can see, see it says read more. 
And what I would like to do is I would just like to make this cursor pointer. So let me go over here to my description and make it cursor pointer. So cursor pointer, right? And how about I give this a padding of one then? Does that fix the issue? Uh, to some extent it does, right? And let me just say padding bottom. Or padding, just padding in general. And I'll have to get rid of the double margin that is there now. So there's this yellow margin and there's this yellow margin. That is something that we don't need. So as you guys can see, if I highlight this and get rid of the margin bottom, or let me say padding bottom, I need to fix that and I need to get rid of padding top of that. <sighs> okay. So let this just be the description one and I'll give this a padding bottom of one then. And I'll have to give my um, heading a padding top of one then. I have no clue as to why I'm, I have to do it this way. But right now, like I said, the priority is just coding it and then figuring out. All right. So now this is also, con you know, as you guys can see, this is clickable. So what I need to do is now on the click of this button, I need to switch it. So what I'll be doing is I will be having a use state, which will be called const. Um, let's just make a simple flag right now, set flag. And I can just say equal to use state false. So what that would mean if flag is false, I would by default want to show uh, this. Otherwise, I would want to show the long desk long description right and on click of this basically on click of this i just need to toggle it so i just need to say set flag is equal to not flag right so this way what happens is if it's true it will become false if it's false it will become true and that is all i need to do so now if i go over here use state is not defined let me import my use state from react see my code go over here if i say read mode this is what i see if i say this it'll say you know so over here i'll do something similar where i'll say instead of this i'll be saying read less so that means my life becomes a little easy it says read more read less and that's how easy it is to make your you know custom read more read less component and also something that you guys can do is you guys can say that um we can basically have another p tag and just say if you know description dot length is greater than 200 only then we need to have this p tag if it is not then we'll just have a simple p tag with no read more read less or anything like that with just a simple dangerously set element which will be my desk and that is it so we'll keep our life simple that way so now the logic is if my description is longer than 200, then we'll have the short desk, long desk. If, if it's not, just have a simple description. Otherwise, there's no need for, you know, for us to show this read more, read less. And another way of solving this is by just having this as a P tag. So this way, this is how it looks. I personally prefer this more than that. And yeah, and that is all you need to do. And now your entire info component is there. Something that I guess you can do is that instead of changing this you can make this 300 or 350 so that way you know obviously this is a little more information that a person would want to read in one go right and just like that our entire coin info component is done the catch and the only catch that was there was this dangerously set inner html which you guys can consider to be similar to your dot inner html right and i believe this is something that not a lot of people or you know even a lot of advanced developers are not really aware of this and all you need to do is pass your description as dangerously set in the HTML and you need to pass it as HTML. And that is all that you need to do. So this was it for this lecture. Now in the next class, we'll obviously be fetching the coin prices and we'll be showing the chart because now we actually need to go ahead and build the main part, which is this. So we'll be talking about what exactly chart is. I might talk about line chart and uh, line chart that we'll be using from the Chart.js is the library that we'll be using for that. So I'll be talking about that using Chart.js. So if you guys remember, we actually went ahead and we worked on our coin page where we were fetching the coin data. 
we made the list view, we made this component, we added this read more and read less functionality. And, but something that we missed in the last class was that if I go to my dashboard and over here, if I click on a specific grid item or a specific list item, I'm not really redirecting my user to that coin page. So first things first, let's just quickly do that. And it's very simple to do because all we need to do is go to our coin page, go to our, um, sorry, go to our grid component and we just need to wrap our grid, grid component with a link tag. Now, if you guys remember, link is something that we will be importing from uh, React Router DOM, right? And let me just quickly wrap my entire div inside of that, right? And I need to say link to, and I think after this, I just say slash coin. And obviously this needs to be in um, string interpolation like this. And then I need to say slash and then coin dot ID. So this way is we know for a fact that we're going to link the specific, uh, whenever the user clicks on the link, we're going to take them directly to our coin page and the slash coin ID will be the ID that we're going to use, right? So if I go over here and now click on my link, it takes me to slash coin slash Bitcoin immediately, right? Similarly, we can do the same thing inside our list view. And all I need to do is go over here, uh, wrap my entire um, row inside of this thing and i just need to say slash link over here and that's about it and obviously i don't need to change anything i just need to import my uh, link from react router dom again and slash coin slash coin dot id and this way if i go back to my uh, particular list item and i can click on any coin it will take me to slash coin slash ethereum right now something else that we need to quickly fix is the fact that whenever this loading is there for some reason it shows these two you know uh, the scrolling option. So we need to quickly get rid of that. So I'll just go to the loader, go to my style, the CSS, and I'll just say overflow, uh, Y hidden and overflow X hidden, both of these, right? This way is at least now, if it's there, there is no, okay. There still seem to be some scrolling there. We will have to fix this properly. Maybe I, if I say position fixed, that should fix it, right? Yeah. Now it's perfect. Cool. So that is done. This is done. And now what we need to do is now we need to build our chart component. So if you guys remember, let me just quickly go to a specific coin page. Let's go to slash coin slash Bitcoin. And over here, what is going to happen is there is this chart that we're going to be making. And this chart is something that we'll be making using uh, your charges, right? But before that, let's talk about what this chart is about. This chart is basically going to be about the prices that we fetch right? Or the prices of Bitcoin or the total volume or the market cap in an X amount of days. So we know for a fact that the number of days is a variable and this is also a variable that are we fetching the prices or are we fetching the total volume or are we fetching a market cap? Rest is nothing but is the number of days on the X axis and the prices on the Y axis. So without, you know, making our lives really complicated as of right now. And uh, let's just get started with first by first fetching the prices because we need to, you know, we need to first fetch the data to actually show the data, obviously. So we need to make one more API call. And before making that API call, I will be, you know, kind of uh, making our code a little more optimized. And the reason for that is basically because uh, as of right now, you guys, if you guys notice that all of our API calls are being done inside the use effect. Now that is not really a good, um, you know, a good practice to have like over here, we are fetching our data again in use effect over here as well in the dashboard components assign use effect. So that's not really a good, uh, you know, um, what do you say code organization or a good practice to do. So before that first, let's just fetch the uh, prices. And when, when we do that, I want to actually show you guys the idle way of, you know, organizing your code. So that is where we'll be using this functions folder as well, because if I tell you guys, uh, right now, this might seem a little unnecessary. Right. But the more API calls that we do and the more functions we write, we will realize that making these th these API calls into small modular function actually makes our lives really, really simple in the long run, obviously. So, yeah. So the API call that we'll be hitting is I believe slash coin slash market chart, because what this does is it gives us the price market cap and the total volume. Right. So all I need to say is I just say, try it out. This is the API link. So if I say ID will be Bitcoin. Uh, currency will be USD, the number of days, let's do 30 or let's do seven at first and the interval will be daily, right? So if I execute this, what you guys will notice is that I get an array. I firstly, I get an object, but then it says prices and prices is an array. And this is an array of seven total prices, 
right so uh, i will come to this so basically i understand that it fetches the last 7 days prices correct and obviously over here this is the price of bitcoin in uh, usd so what is this if i copy this number if i inspect right and if i go to my console i can actually see that this is nothing but this is actually the date at which this was the corresponding price right so to do that what we'll do is i'll just say uh, we are my date is equal to new date correct and i'll just create a new date with this number and the moment i do that and i say my date uh, my date right you guys can actually see that i see tuesday february 28 you know 2023 uh, 5 30 am and ist now you guys actually realize that over here we are today is 6 march as of the day that i'm recording it and last seven days ago it was 28th feb right so i get to see that this is how this api is working so i have my date and then the corresponding price of it now apart from prices this uh, this particular endpoint also returns market caps with the same thing so it, it is a date object and this thing right so the uh, market cap at this particular date and similarly over here i get total volumes uh, again this is the particular date at which and this is the value at this corresponding date so now this gets me to think that this is exactly what i actually need to make my graphs because inside my graph all i need is a y axis and an x axis correct where my x axis is nothing but it's just the dates and my y axis is the price value or you know market cap or total volume or whatever my option is it's that particular value if i say more than seven days if i say 30 days what you guys will see is that i have 30 specific dates and then from 5th uh, february it's taking to 6th march right so again that's about 30 days and from i get 30 days in my x axis and this is the price that is on my y axis so it makes sense because the graph is nothing but it is x comma y right it's like over here this will be x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 x4 y3 uh, y4 right so i hope you guys are with me because it is nothing much it is just basic simple maths all of which we learned you know in school maybe in seventh or eighth uh, class we were learning all of this how to create graphs so a graph is nothing but it is coordinates x comma y coordinates and in our specific case x is the date and y is the price so that is all that we need to actually build this graph as well so after we make this api call we'll have every data that we need to uh, you know everything that we need to basically uh, create our entire graph and we'll be then almost done with our coin page so without any further ado let me just quickly copy this url obviously and let me first fetch the data and then we'll see what we need to do right so i'll go to my coin page again and what I need to do is basically say that once I get my entire coin object, then I need to make that call, right? And so I'll say axios dot get. I need to get in this particular URL. Now over here, you need to realize that this particular thing is the coin ID. So I need to say ID, right? And the currency is USD. Now the days is something that I would leave for you guys to, uh, you know, decipher. So days in the future, we'll be making days as a use date. So let me just do that right now because date, days is something that we plan on changing, right? So it makes sense to have a use date over here. By default, we can set the number of days to be 30, correct? So it will fetch the data for the last 30 days. And I'll just need to say dot then over here, right? Then I'll say response. And then obviously I can do whatever I want to. Maybe for now, let me just console log the prices because that is all that I need to do. So I can just say prices and this will be response of data dot prices and that is all that I need to do. So now if I go to my coin page over here, if I go to my console, you guys will actually see that I'm actually getting my prices, right? I get the an array of 31, um, obviously. So now something that I need to, uh, you guys need to realize is the last two values are of the same date. So that is why there are 30, even though we fetch data for 30 days, it gets us 31 days because these two values are basically of the same date. This one is the current one, like right now, right now. If I copy this value, right, and if I create a new object of date with it, you guys will realize that this is the uh, date of, you know, the latest price of the particular um, coin, right? So if I say my date over here is equal to new date, right? And I just say this, correct? And then if I say my date, you guys will realize that this is exact timing at which uh, this is the you know latest fetched uh, data 415 
and it's 437 so this is the latest one and if i go one above it the second last this one or i think one above it would be this one 29th right if i copy this and if i make a variable with that uh new date paste it over here and say this is my date 2 right and then go over here and say my date 2 you guys realize that this is uh 5 30 so this is in the morning 5 30 a.m right so the same day but two values we get in the last so that's why we get uh, an array of 31 even though we ask for an array of 30 right but regardless of that we still get our prices completely fine and for some reason i'm also console logging my entire description let's not do that let's get rid of it all right so now we are fetching our uh, prices and we are also fetching this i also need to make a catch block so i'll just quickly do that over here right and we are all good to go okay perfect and now something that i feel we can do is we can make our set coding is false after we get this correct so now something that you guys need to understand is now we'll be actually converting this all of these api calls and we'll be making specific functions for these and the reason for that is very simple because we will be needing to fetch this data again and again so let's let's think about the logic that's going to take place let's say when i make this select let's see you know let's just consider that we've made our graph and everything is working fine so when i change the days right i since my days is nothing but it's a use state i will just change the value of it okay understood but what needs to happen every time I change my days, it needs to fetch data again. So it basically needs to get all of this again, right? What happens when I change this? It needs to basically fetch this data, this part again. So instead of price, I need to return total volume. So over here, when I'm saying response.data.prices, I'll be saying response.data.total volume or response.data.market cap, right? Depending on, on whatever my API call needs to be. So I come to a realization that you know these api calls are something that i'll be needing to make then and again and now and again sorry so these are certain api calls that i'll be making again and again throughout my entire you know course of this project now because let's say tomorrow when i go to build my compare page what i will have to do is i will have to fetch the data of two coins because i will be fetching not only the list data of bitcoin and, and ethereum but i'll also be fetching the coin data like the prices of these two things again right so this comes, uh, so we will basically get to a point where we will realize that we actually need to make a lot of API calls and they are basically the same API calls. So instead of, you know, duplicating or copy pasting our code again and again, it's a good practice to have all of your API calls at a specific, in a specific folder separate from everything so that you guys can call it again and again. So that is where our functions folder comes, uh, comes in, right? So what I'll be doing is I'll be making a function called get coin data. Firstly, so this will be get coin data.js. Then I'll have another functions folder which will be get coin prices. And the job of this function is nothing to get. One will be getting the coin data and the other will be getting the coin prices. All I need to do is I just need to say export const and get coin data. So this will be my function, correct? And all I need to do is inside this, I just need to get that uh, API call that I'll be making. So this API call, I'll just cut this entire thing without even reading it. And let's just paste it over here. So I'll be making my Axios call, obviously. So I'll be importing Axios. Over here, we see that ID is a parameter that I need. So I'll be passing it over here because obviously I need to know what ID I'm fetching, right? Now, instead of doing this thing, what I would want to do is, is just return my response.data, right? And I will save that response.data over here. So I'll say const my data is equal to axis dot this and then just return my data so if you guys don't know what's happening basically i return this thing over here my data and then once i get my data i'll just return it over here and that is what i need to do all right and yeah that is basically what i need to do and over here what is going to happen is i will first call that data um, right or something that let's do is make a function over here as well so i'll say function uh, get data all right and what we'll do is we'll make this function as an async function and i'll tell you as to why we are doing that so firstly let's just get rid of all of this uh, this api call i'll just bring it below and just give me a second i'll make everything clear to you guys in a second all right so function async get data apparently get data has some issue uh, My bad. So it's an async function get data. 
right and what i'll do is i'll just say get data over here so if my id is there i'll be getting the data all right and over here what i need to do is i need to say const coin data is equal to get coin data right and i'll be passing my id over here and i'll say async i mean sorry i'll say awake right and this thing i'll import so basically what happens is now my coin data will actually call this function this function is an async function and the reason why this function is uh, not this function not an async function but this function is an async function and the reason why we are waiting over here is so that we can get our data right if i go to my coin data my coin data is nothing but it is this function we are just making that api call and we are returning our data right over here what happens is now i can say if coin data is there right if coin data is there what i would like to do is i would like to basically set that entire object so if you guys remember what we were doing was we were saying coin object okay i was saying coin object and then what i was saying was um set coin data right comma we need to pass our coin data so i can just pass my coin data over here so maybe instead of saying coin data i can say just call this data for now right so maybe just say data then call this data and pass the data over here so if i go to my coin object what does coin object do it just basically says uh set state and data and we're just setting my state right so we are basically doing that and one more thing that i need to make sure is that over here i am returning respond per data yes so i'm returning the entire object right so now what happens is this function my use effect runs it runs this function this function is an async function now the reason why this function is an async function is because this function needs to wait for this coin data function that's why we use the keyword await because this function itself is a promise which will take some time to happen right similarly what we'll do is i will cut this thing and i will do the same thing over here i'll go over here i'll say export const right i'll say get coin prices this will be nothing but it will be a function as well like this and i'll just have my access call i'll say const prices is equal to axios i'll be importing my axios from axios then i will be needing id comma days over here so id and days are two parameters that i'll be passing then i'll just return this so instead of saying uh, you know doing this i'll just say return response dot data dot prices correct i don't need to set coding as false over here that's not needed and then i'll just need to say return prices that is all as of right now right so i exported this i go over here i need to say the same thing so if my coin object is there now if my coin data is there i just need to say const prices is equal to await uh, get coin prices right i'll obviously import this now it was taking true values id and days and now i can just say if prices is there right if prices because it's an array prices dot length is greater than zero then i can just say console dot log uh, let's just do woohoo right now right and let's see if this is going to work or not so if i go to my google chrome i hopefully shouldn't see any issues if i refresh you guys can see that i get my prices and i get a woohoo so that means i get entire data right now this thing is still loading and the reason for that is basically because we haven't said um, set loading is equal to false so set is loading is equal to false and that is when my code stops and now i should be getting all of my data right perfect and that is all that i needed to do so now my entire code is not only uh, you know uh, not only a more modeler but now i can keep calling these functions so now imagine every time i need to get my prices all i need to do is i just need to say coins prices is equal to await get coin prices i need to pass the id of the coin the number of days for which you need to find the get the prices and that's about it it will return an array of uh, you know whatever prices or whatever market caps or whatever i want and then i can go ahead with my code so the good point about this is now that these two things are technically dependent on each other so in the previous case what was happening was i was making one promise then the other over here it's like if my data is there only then will i move ahead and then if my price is there only then will i say set is loading false otherwise i won't right so uh, that way is this is a little better right and obviously i'm saying if prices dot length is greater than 0 that just makes you know makes it a little better i can even just say if prices and that should be fine as well right whatever i want and uh, we're using async await so now understand that the only reason why we're using async await is because we needed this function to be async because over here we need to wait for these two promises right and that is all 
So inside my use effect, everything is the same. The logic is the same. We've just made our code a little modular. So now every time I get my prices, all I need to do is I just need to say await get point prices. And that is about it. That is all that I need to do. Right. So this way, at least my code is a little modular and I can keep reusing this code as well in the future. And the benefits of this is something that you will understand in the next or the in the coming lecture lectures, not exactly the next lecture, but I think the next to next. Because in the next lecture, what you're going to do is we're going to finally build our line chart. And after that, we're going to talk about the functionality where, you know, we have this select and where did the select go? Yeah, we have this day select and we have these two things, right? Obviously, this is the compare page. We will be doing it in the coin page. But uh, yeah, I think you guys understand that we'll be making this component and these two components after we get done with this. So if we go to our crypto dashboard December, right? And if I go over there and if I quickly go to my Bitcoins page, in fact, you guys will see that we have a really nice chart, right? So we have this chart, which basically is fully responsive. It has days on the or dates on the X axis and it has prices on the Y axis, right? Now, if I change the number of days, the number of days change. If I change the number of, or if I change the price type, the graph changes, everything is fully responsive. If I inspect this element, and as you can see, this is fully responsive, right? Changing the number of days, change the number of days, changing the number of, what do you say? Uh, changing this changes the price type and that's all, right? So, so now to make this, it is actually very, very simple. So the library that we'll be using is called React RJS2. And if I quickly go over here, just to tell you guys how we will actually use charges. So you can refer to the charges documentation for that. And over here, you see a very beautiful graph, which has uh, months on the X axis. If you look over here, right. And we have the, uh, we have a number on the Y axis, right? We have actually two Y axis because we have two data sets, right? Now to make a line chart, it is actually very simple. And all you'll be, all you'll be needing is um, just an array of, for your X axis and an array for your Y axis, right? So if I go over here, there's this thing called config. Now the config is just like your options. It's basically like some settings of your uh, graph, right? If I talk about it in the sense that, um, you know, what your config is, your config is just some certain options. Should it be responsive? Should, where should the legend be placed, right? Should the title be displayed? If the title is displayed, you know, what is the text of the title? Like over here, we can see uh, charges line chart is a title, right? Display is true. If I make display false, this won't be visible, right? If I say legend position top, right now, this is the legend. If you didn't know, legend is basically a small box which shows you which color represents what, right? So that is the legend. Then is it responsive and all of those things. But then over here, what you see is this data element. Now, what exactly is this data attribute, right? So if I go to my setup, what do I see is that inside my data attribute or inside my data variable, this is all the data that I have. I have a thing called labels and I have a data set. Now, in terms of charges or to make any chart in the world, if we speak in strictly in terms of mathematics, right? If we want to make any chart in the world, we need an X axis and a Y axis. The X axis actually refers to your, um, obviously, our months in this case. And in our case, the X axis will actually refer to the number of or the dates, right? And the Y axis is the price. Whereas over here, the Y axis is just a number. So if we talk about it, my X axis is what we call labels and my Y axis is what we call data sets, right? So over here, we see labels, which is just, uh, there's this inbuilt function, utils.math and so on. So what we can do is we can just make our own array for that, right? And let me make my own array where I'll say this is, let's do Monday, right? Then let's do Tuesday or let me just say M-O-N, then T-U-E, right? Oh, my bad. Then uh, Wednesday, then Thursday, right? And let me then do Friday. Let's just have five, uh, you know, values on our x-axis. Then after that, what we'll have is in our data sets, we remove this util. So instead of this, what am I going to have is I'm going to have another array, right? And let me say five, 12, eight. I'm just uh, thinking of random numbers to plot a graph, right? 15. So this is how my graph looks. And if you think about it, my graph is nothing but it is 
an array for my y axis and an array for my x axis now the array for your x axis can actually be a string it can also be numbers it can be whatever you want to right over here instead of this if you guys can see i wrote monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday and these are all the values that i see right if instead of this i tomorrow you know change something and i just make these random values if i say one two three four five right i will still be able to see it and if i cover on a specific point it shows me data set is one and the value is two right or data set is 12 sorry this is reference to 12 and uh, the x value is 2 right so obviously if i go back and make it monday uh, monday tuesday friday i'm so sorry for this so what do i see i see tuesday and then i see the data set one's value is 12 right um, data set one's value is 8 on a wednesday correct so this thing is what we call a data set so basically inside charges you need two things you need an array for your y-axis and an array for your x-axis the array for your x-axis is what we call labels and the array for your y-axis is what we call uh, data set now technically you can have an array you can have multiple data sets so what that means is you can have multiple y-axis right so now multiple y-axis means uh, if we go to our compare page that is where we'll be having multiple y-axis right so let the page load okay so over here what do we see is we have multiple y axes right so what that means is i have two values one is on the left side and the other is on the right side correct and the left one is what we call uh, bitcoin and the right one is what we call ethereum if i change this you can go for dogecoin right as you can see the green one is my dogecoin and the left one is my bitcoin correct so that is what we'll be having for our multi charts or multiple lines and to do that we will be adding multi multiple data sets correct now adding multiple data sets is actually quite easy all you need to do is you need to copy this entire object that we have over here and you need to paste it below right now something that you might notice is data sets is nothing but it's an array of objects and what does my object contain it contains a label right so maybe we'll say data set 2 over here it contains again a data attribute or a data array which contains another array so we can have different values right let me add certain values uh, just again simple values off the top of my head and that is about it and now what i can do is i see border color now border color is utils dot chart colors dot red maybe let's try blue maybe that's a color if we go over here we see blue right and the background color that we see is utils transfer to transparentize and then again we can add blue over here right so the moment i do this the background color of the legend team changes right so now these are uh, basically nothing but you have now two data sets right and what that means is you have two y values two corresponding y values for the same x value so it's nothing but basically you can add multiple y values but the x value needs to be the same you cannot have multiple x axis values right or at least for our use case we won't be needing multiple x axis values and that is basically about it now there are a lot of other things like you can even give you know you can give um there's this thing called uh you can change the size of this these circles that are there right you can uh, add a lot of more customization and you can add curves right you can make your uh, chart curved you can add all kinds of uh, what do you say uh, features and all kinds of functionalities and all of those things is something that we'll be adding in the next class when we actually combine or when we actually start coding in our react project and in today's module we're actually going to cover the charges that we talked about in the last module so now if you want to actually get started by installing a charge so what you need to do is you need to install two packages so the first one we have is npmi chart.js and the second one that we have is react dash chart dash js dash two right or is it react dash uh, charges to let me quickly have a look so if you go to our package.json over here we have react dash charges dash two my bad so there's no uh, dash between chart and js anyways so we need to install these two packages and uh, the code to actually implement your charges is very very simple and for that all you need to do is you need to have a line chart component so we'll go to our coin folder and inside that we already have a line chart page so now over here what am i going to do is i'm going to have an index.js file rfce i'm going to make my line chart component right so now my line chart component is actually going to be very simple and if i it's it's a very standard code and you will also have to copy this from me as it is and we'll just quickly explain what we're going to do right so this is how my line chart component is going to look like and the funny thing is we are first importing a line 
which is our main line chart from charges react charges to but we also need this import on line number three the funny thing is if i remove this for some reason our code starts to break and our line chart doesn't you know work so i really haven't gotten to the bottom of this but uh heads up is that please don't get rid of this line right this import is very important as well so even though your vs code will let you know that you know you're not using this line and all of those things but you do need this import for charge js to work at least for now right so over here the line chart component is very simple right let me just quickly explain what we have we obviously have uh, this options so these options are the options that i was talking about if you want to make your website you know chart js responsive if you want to display the legend or not so over here right now we will uh, not really display our legend if our uh, you know charge or if our line chart is not multi-axis and by multi-axis i mean when there are two what you see charts only then will be or two lines only then will we be showing the legend otherwise you won't be showing it it is responsive interaction mode is uh, index and this is basically something that allows us to hover and it is the cool animation that we see on hovering you if you want to remove it you can and yes and obviously chart data is the data that we'll be passing so this contains both the arrays for the y-axis and the x-axis right so this is about it if i go to my app.js now or if I go to my coin.js, my bad. So what we need to do is we first need to import this component. So obviously I'll just import my line chart uh, inside my gray wrapper over here and I'll have it like this, right? So if I right now pass this and uh, if we just see how that looks, if I go to my Google Chrome, go to my local host and if I refresh, we don't really see anything. And the reason for that is because we haven't passed any values. Now to pass values, either we can directly pass the uh, values that we're getting from the prices. But before that, what I like to do is I just like to pass in the hard coded values that we have, right? So we'll go to our charges documentation yet again. And as soon as we go over here, what I'll be doing is we'll go to our setup and remember the, uh, what do you say? The object that we had made. So we'll be making an object structure similar to that, right? So let me just copy this. And what I will do is we'll go to a VS code, we'll make a new state and this state is called chart data, obviously. So we'll call it chart data and set chart data. So now over here we have a new state and this will be an empty object for now. Or yeah, let's just keep it an empty object for now. So what we can do is we can actually, as soon as we get our data, right? What I would like to do is also do this. So, um, we'll set our chart data as well over here and the way i would like to set my chart data is basically i would like to pass in that object right this object that we have yes correct now the thing is that we haven't closed our array let me close my array there we go right so this is the object that we need to pass and obviously over here right now we don't have any labels so what is my labels going to be let's just create a random array again so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday should be fine, right? Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And let's just say this is my labels and my data set only contains one data set. We don't have a labels. We won't be having these utils colors, by the way. So the colors that we will be using are the colors from our variables, but sadly we cannot use them directly. So we'll have to pass them in like this. So let me go to my index and over here I'll have my blue color correct and uh, let's go back to our coin.js page over here have this right and my background color we can keep transparent we don't really need a background color so i can just pass in transparent and y axis id is y this is an id that we will talk about when we do our compare page right and my data will obviously be also be random so let me just hard code it right now 12 15 12 9 6 are these yes right so 20 let's see how that looks so now i've added my chart data values so if we go to my react project now i should actually see the chart so okay <coughs> something is wrong okay we are not passing our value inside my line chart so i'll obviously pass that so i'll say chart data is equal to chart data and now I think we should be able to see our chart. Yes, we can. Even though it doesn't look the best, we need to give it a padding and everything. But other than that, the chart is there. So, and the chart is also not responsive. So this is also something that we will be doing as we, um, you know, go ahead and code our entire website. 
But as of right now, our chart is ready, at least for, uh, you know, uh, at least the hard coded values are ready. So now what we'll be doing is we need to add our array for our dates on the x-axis and our array of prices on the y-axis. So if we remember correctly, if we go to a console and over here, if I look at the prices array, what do I get? I get an array containing two values. So one is the obviously this value and the other is this one. Now this one is clearly the prices array, right? It's the price value. So what is this? If I copy this value and if I go over here and if I say, you know what, let me say we are, uh, my date is equal to new date. And if I paste this value, right? And if I now console log my date attribute, what do I get? Or my date variable? I actually get an entire date. And what is the date? It says Feb 23. So as of right now, it's 25th March. So that is exactly 31 days or 30 days before, uh, you know, 30 days earlier. Correct. So what I understand is that inside the prices array, I get two things. The first or the zeroth object is actually my date object and the oneth object is actually my price. So to make my prices array and to make my, you know, to make my Y axis and my X axis, it becomes very simple. So all I need to do is I need to say over here like this prices, right? So all I need to say is I need to say prices, um, prices dot map. And what we'll be mapping is, let me say item, and let me just return return item zero. So what this does is it returns an array of just item zero, right? And what is my item zero? It is actually just my uh, date, correct? In fact, what I would like to do is I would like to return this, correct? And now if I talk about in terms of my data set, what is my data set? It is nothing but it's just my Y values, which is just my prices, right? So just price one, and that is about it. Correct. So now if I actually go to my chart, what do I see is I actually see my chart, right? If I refresh, obviously the chart is not responsive right now, but this is how it looks like. Now this doesn't look right because obviously firstly we have a really, you know, uh, long string of our X axis. So we need to uh, shorten this a little bit. And so what we'll be doing is we'll actually be manipulating the data a little. So over here, we have our date object, right? So we don't really need our entire date object. What we need is just the date slash the month. So for that, we'll be making our uh, uh, helper function again. And the helper function is also very simple. It's just going to be convert <coughs> date.js. And this function is just export const convert date. It is a function and it takes two value or it takes just one value, which is the number, right? And what we'll be doing is we'll be creating we are my date, right? And I'll be saying we are my date is a new date. We'll be converting it into this. And then what we want to return is so uh, I want to return my date dot get date, correct? So this will give me the date. Then I will add a slash in front of it. Then what I need to add is I need to say my date dot get month right and let's look at have a look at what this does so then obviously i will be um, this is not coin date this is convert date right so i'll be copying this function if i go to my coin js i have this function over here and i have my price zero correct and if i import this function from my functions what do i see uh, let me refresh i see 23 1 24 1 25 1 and so on but this isn't right because um, 23 one is not really 23rd February, right? If you guys remember, our date was February. So now why is that happening? So apparently in the date object, when we say get month, the month starts from zero and not one. It makes sense because every array starts from the zeroth object, right? So my February is actually month one in JavaScript. So all I need to do is add one because January is the zeroth month, correct? So I just need to add a plus one over here and now my dates look right. So 23 Feb and 25th March, which is exactly today's date. Correct. So yeah, so our line chart is now actually coming together where our chart is there and it was very simple to do, right? Now what I need to do is I need to make it look right. So now how do I do that? So to do that, we'll actually be using some, um, you know, we'll be adding some little features and to do that, it's also very simple. So all of these I found out by, you know, uh, extensively doing some research on ChartJS, going through their documentation, seeing how do you customize it and all of those things. If you want, you guys can do that too, but I'll help you. I'll make your lives easy. 
and all you need to do is just this right let me just copy this and now uh, don't worry about that code i'll explain everything but yes so if i go over here and add these values what do i see uh, the first one is border width. So now border width as border width refers to is um, as border obviously as border width refers to is the width of the border, right? Right now one is a very uh, you know thin line. If I add two, it's going to be a little thicker, correct? So this is something that is up you know up to you as you saw. Two is also two looks good too honestly, and you can have any width that you want. Fill two means that you will have a background color. So if I go ahead and show you guys this, so what I have done is I've actually, I went to the Figma and actually got the RGB value of my blue color that I'm using, right? And then I added an opacity of 0.1 to it. So now what happens is my chart actually has a background, correct? And it's a transparent background, so this looks good. Then we have tension. Now what tension does is tension gives a curvature to my line. If I have, let's say a tension of zero, it is basically straight lines, correct? As you guys can see, these are all straight lines. Correct, look at this point. This is really pointy. It's almost like a triangle. But if I add a curvature, let's say of 0.5, what happens is this becomes curved a little, right? As you guys can see. But 0.5 is a lot of curvature. If we add one, that is a, a lot, a lot. And at that point, it doesn't look like a graph at all, as you guys can see. So the values that I really liked were 0.25. Right, if you want to add 0.2, you guys can go ahead. If you want to add 0.15, I think 0.15 also looks good. But because, yeah, there's a little curve there and um, so it just looks decent, correct? Anyway, so the background color is transparent. We have the border color and point radius. Now, point radius, if let's say we have a point radius of 10, let's see what it looks like. So point radius is basically the radius of every point, as you guys can probably tell. So obviously, I do not like to have these points. So we just say point radius is zero and the entire points, you know, everything goes away. Correct. And that was all that you needed to do to add your chart JS. Now the best part is, let's say if we go to the top of our page and if we change days to 60 or days to 90 or days to 120, if I go ahead and refresh, I see a graph of 120 days. So now I actually realize that all I need to do is over here when I have, right, if I go to my Bitcoin page and over here I have the select. So if I need to just change my value of my days and if I fetch my data again and I show my chart data again, I'll basically be having the entire graph, right? Because over here, as you guys can see, right now our number of days is not changing. It's not variable. I've set it to 120. If I set it to 200, I'll fetch 200. If I set it to 20 or 30 or 60, I'll just get uh, the, you know, prices of 60 days, correct? As you guys can see, this is the prices of 60 days. So, uh, yeah two months, right? From 24th Jan to 25th March. Correct. So the next task is to actually add that drop down and that select. So we'll be making that. We'll also be making a little, our code a little modular and uh, you'll see uh, when we do that. And after that, we'll be adding our prices type, right? Our price type. So this is the price type toggle that is there and it allows us to change the entire graph as well. So again, it's one and uh, the same thing. So firstly, we'll add this, then we'll add this. Right, and then we'll be officially done with our coin page. And uh, something that you'll realize is because of the fact that we've made our code very modular and very, you know, easy to uh, implement, you will realize that compare page actually takes way less time than our coin page. In today's lecture, we are actually going to make our select days component, which will actually allow to make, which will actually allow our chart to become more uh, dynamic. Right. So over here, what we have is um, a simple MUI select component. And over here, we have an option for multiple days. And once we click on that, a state changes, which in turn allows for, you know, for us to fetch the data again. And when we fetch the data again, our chart gets updated. So that is the basic logic behind it. Let's quickly get started with by making the component. Now to make the component, we'll head over to the MUI's website. We will quickly go to their component library. And inside their component library, we'll go to their select, right? Once you do that, this is the select component that we need. We have over here, if I click on 10, 10 gets selected. If I click on 20, 20 gets selected and 30, 30 gets selected. So to make that, it's very simple. Uh, let me just quickly copy this entire code and shift to our VS code. Now over here, what we will be doing is we'll be going to our coin um, folder and inside our coin components folder, we'll be adding, adding our select days component. Now inside the select days component, we'll have an index.js and we will have a styles.css like usual, right? 
So inside select these, I'll go say RFCE and make this select place. And in fact, I don't have to do this. I can just simply copy my entire uh, select component code that I got from MUI and that is about it. Now over here, I will change this to select these because that is the component name that we have. And I don't really like to import my React like this. Uh, so let's keep our life simple and import React or use state. Hmm. Like we usually do. So import use state from React. And that's about it. Right. So we have imported use state normally. And uh, we have a use state of age. We have a handle change function, which just sets the value. And that is about it. If I look over here, this is something that we don't really need. So we'll make our lives easier over here as well. And what I would like to do is that, um, okay, first let's just uh, render this component and see if it is actually working or not. Right. So first things first, let me just copy this, go to our point page, import this before our chart, but inside the same gray wrapper. Right. So we'll import it over here and let me just import this like this go to Google Chrome go to our react and over here we do really see that component even though this does not look at all the way we want it to look but this is how it looks right so now we'll actually be making uh, we'll be customizing this component and uh, we will be adding our days functionality to it right so let's actually do that so over here we need to have a use state for days right we have days set days now our days will actually be just be an integer by default let's keep it to 30 right so now over here this thing should be called days and form control we don't really need a form control right this is good and box is nothing but box just means a diff in MUI right and that is about it so we'll have a basic diff we have an input label we have a select and then we have our menu items now menu items are actually the options that we see so we see the options of 30 days so let me say 30 days over here right then we see the option of 60 days. So we can say 60 days over here. Then similarly 90, right? So we'll here I'll say 90 days and uh, we'll go upwards to 120 and even let's do 240, right? So 120, so that'll be 120 days. And if you want, we can add, in fact, 365, so that'll be one year, right? So let's just do that. So 365, that is one year, correct? So this is what we have, perfect. Right, so now we have five options, 30, 60, and we also have an option of seven days, by the way. So seven, right, we start with seven. Cool, so these are all the options that we have. Now to customize MUI, that is actually very simple. And um, just a second, let me change all of these values as well. All right, now, so if you want to really customize MUI, it is very simple. All you need to do is just uh, inspect your element on Google Chrome. And once you do that, you can actually change their attributes. You can change the colors and you can change everything, right? For that matter, even if you remove this, I don't think so, there should be any issue. Perfect, right? So we have a UI just like this, even though you cannot see it probably right now because it's black, but we will be customizing it. Now to customize it, there are multiple ways of doing uh, the customization. One way is using the way that we customized our MUI tabs component. So if you don't remember that, you can go back to that lecture and have a look at it. But the other simple way is just to directly, you know, customize using the SX attribute. So if I go over here, go to my code, <coughs> this is how we will be uh, styling it, customizing it. So let's just quickly have a look at what we have over here so that you guys can also implement this. All you need to do is copy this and this SX just says there's going to be a height. SX is just the style of MUI, by the way, if you didn't know. Then color is going to be VR white and then we have custom classes. So we have MUI outline input dash notch dot outline and the border color will be white. Now, how do I know that we have to use this class? Because you just inspect element and when you inspect element, you will actually see that class in the MUI component. So you do have to, uh, you know, uh, try a little, do hit and trial if that makes sense but uh, once you do that it will make sense so over here we have this in your outline outline input dash root and this is the same class that we are or we are saying notched outline never mind that is the same class that we are um, changing 
but anyways so we have the svg icon as well we are white because otherwise the icon was not changing its color and we have a hover effect where we are making the border blue right and that is about it so now if i go over here and uh, you know if i go over here and select the drop down and select any value that particular value does get selected we obviously still haven't styled it properly because there is no margin there's no you know uh, there's no uh, what do you say mostly there's no margin but there's also no text that we need right so let me give this a class name and i'll say select dash days over here and i will have a single p tag and the p tag will say number of days selected or uh, i think that is what it says price change in so we'll say price change in and that's about it right so for that i'll go to my select days over here i will also need to import my select days on my um, styles of css my bad so i'll say import dot slash styles dot css and then i'm going to go over here and um, just have dot select days inside my select days i will say display flex i'll say just if i content flex start align items will be centered i'll give this a gap of 0.5 rem and i think i'll give it a margin of one rem let's see how that looks if i go over here go to my this is how that looks maybe we need to give it a bigger margin of at least the top or we need to give a padding to our gray wrapper either way we need to change something to make it look good so maybe i can give it a padding of one rem and see how that looks okay so the issue with one rem is that this component breaks right so we will have to do a fix for that all right so let's go to our dot gray wrapper i think and over here let's give a padding of one rem but something that we'll be doing is when we talk <coughs> you know in terms of the coin page and over here i can give a manual styling to this and i can just say padding Right now, this is not advised. You should obviously take care of it in a better way. But right now, you know, we're just quickly getting done with things. So why not? Anyway, so if I go to my Google Chrome now, this is actually what I see. And that is pretty good. Right. We do have this. Now, the only thing that I need to do is I need to upload these states so that, you know, inside our main coin.js component, when I change the date, the date changes. And inside the handle change function, I'll call the prices again. And I'll set the chart data as well again. Right. So for that, again, it's not a big task and all we need to do is just simply, in fact, before I do that, I need to add a margin bottom to this. That's all. So I'll add a margin bottom over here of one rem because I need to add a little gap. Okay. This looks better. Anyways. So now what we'll be doing is we'll be uplifting the state. So I'll be taking, I'll be cutting both of these things. I'll be having a days over here and a handle days change function. Right, so we already have our days over here, but over here I need to say handle days change, right? And what I'll be doing is, um, yeah, this seems to be good. Okay, so now if I go to the coin page, I will be pasting those two things, obviously, and our days is already there. So what I need to do is I need to have a handle days change function now. So first things first, I will be passing these two uh, props over here. So I'll say days, and I'll pass these two props and then handle they change, handle they change. Cool. So now if I go back idly, if I select a particular days, uh, that day does get selected. Right. For some reason, what is the default value that I have? I have 60 over here. And um, do we not have 60 over there? We do have 60. So then as to why was, uh, okay, we do see 60. I thought no value was selected. My bad. All right, so now we can continue with our coin page and over here, what we need to do is we need to fetch the prices again when we change our days, right? So to do that, we already have this very good function that we have made. So now first things first, I will make this event uh, or I'll make this function as an async function, right? And then what I'll be doing is I'll be fetching my prices again. So now all I need to do is just copy this code and that is about it, right? And yes the yellow bracket and i just need to copy this now you guys already saw that you know there's already a lot of copying that has happened 
So what we'll be doing is we'll actually be making this into a separate function, which is we'll be setting our chart data, uh, you know, through a function or a helper function. So I'll be making a function called um, setting chart data dot js, and the entire task of this function will be to set our chart data, right? So set or setting chart data. My bad. Setting chart data the reason why i'm saying setting and not set is because i don't want to confuse it with the use state right so then i'll go over here i will copy all of this entire code um and in fact cut it as well and i will go to my setting chart data and paste this right so now we need a set chart data attribute or a parameter over here we need a price right and prices sorry we need our prices so these two things should be good we just need our prices and our that and I need to import my convert date function. Okay, so this seems good because our set date chart data is a value that we pass, and this price is the value that we pass, and that is good. So now all I need to do is inside my coin page, I just need to go over here and say setting chart data, pass set chart data, right, and pass prices in that order. And now I can just do this. Correct. So basically, I set the chart data, and obviously, when we uh, technically, you know, um, start uh, loading or as soon as we change the state I want to set my loading set is loading to true and what that would make is that would allow my loader to uh, pop up obviously so we want a loader to show then we want our set days right so something that you need to realize is what happens is when I set a, a use state and then I call it again in the next time sometimes that doesn't really work out well so what my suggestion to you guys would be so whenever you have you know uh, whenever you call a set date or a set function or a you know use state and you're setting that value and whenever you set that state right i would really want you guys to set it towards the end once everything is done right so that everywhere before you want to use that value you use the value that you are setting right so over here we would rather use event dot target dot value and not days and the reason for that is days will not get set so uh, you know quickly right but regardless of that, I think this is all that we need to uh, make our entire line chart dynamic. So if I go over here now and let's say if we change our days, if we make it seven, page reloads and boom, we see seven days, right? If I make it 60 days, I'll see the graph 60. If I do 90, I'll see the graph 90. And that is what it's about, right? And the best part is, by the way, if I now inspect my element, right, my chart is actually responsive. And I haven't really gotten to the bottom of this, but my understanding is maybe this flex that we have pushes this line chart. So for some reason, if we don't have this dip, our chart is not responsive, but for, you know, if we add it, it becomes responsive. So we don't really need to take any pain. By default, the chart JS is, you know, chart JS is pretty responsive, but I think it breaks sometimes and it glitches out and it gets fixed automatically by things like this. But anyways, so now our chart is really dynamic. So our, you know, coin page is actually coming together. The next step that we need to do is we need to build our toggle groups. So this is our toggle groups. And all we need to do is we need to customize our get price function a little, and we need to customize this a little, and that's about it. Once we are done with this, our entire coin page will be done. And once our coin page is done, our compare page won't actually take a long time. The MUI toggle group that we'll be making. So in the last class, we actually made our entire line chart dynamic and um, we did that by adding basically the select, uh, you know, the select MUI component which changed the number of days and every time the number of days changed, we fetch the prices again. So now today what we're going to do is we're going to add this MUI toggle group and what that is allowing us to do is that every time we change this, we will be changing um, the array itself, right? And so we'll be customizing our prices function a little. And, but before we do that, we'll obviously make this component. To make this component, we'll head over to the MUI again and we'll go to this toggle button group, right? As soon as I go over here, what do we see is that we get this toggle button group, right? Now we don't really want multiple selection. We just want a simple toggle button group on clicking of which we really change the entire, you know, uh, we have this handle change function basically. So what we'll be doing is we'll be copying this function uh, we will go to our VS code and um, so in our VS code we will be going to our coin folder and inside our coin folder what we will be having is we will have our um, price type I believe folder so now inside the price type we'll have an index.js and again a styles.css 
so or uh, price toggle as well whatever you want to call it right we will base the code and all we need to do is change this to price type so now first things first let, let's just you know let the code be what we'll do is we'll copy this and i will go to my coin um, js and inside the coin js i'll have this below my select tails right so let's just have this like this uh, control space and okay so now if i go to my google chrome what do i see is i see this toggle component that is there and on clicking of it my toggles do really work obviously they're black for uh, you know since we haven't really styled them but we'll just uh, quickly change that we'll go to our vs code go to our toggle component or price type component and over here the first thing that we want to do is like i said we will be fixing the way uh new imports react and that is not really the way that i like to do it so um Hmm. For some reason, I'm not really getting my import there. So if you just say import new state from React, right? Perfect. We don't need uh, these icons, so we will get rid of them. And instead of these, I having these icons over here, what I would like to do is I would just like to have text, right? Um, yeah there so what we will do is firstly we don't need the disable button we just need this so we have a toggle button group which has three toggle buttons and uh, the first one we can have let's say price then over here we will have total volume or market cap market cap then we will have total volume so as soon as we do that, if I go to my Google Chrome, this is what I see. We see price, market cap, and total volume. I'm pretty sure you might not be able to see it clearly because again, it's black, but we'll be changing the styling, right? So other than that, we will be naming this use state again. So instead of saying alignment, we will call it price type. And over here, I would like to say price type or toggle price type. Let's, let's call it toggle price type. I think that's a better name. So we have price type over here, we'll say set price type and we have use state and the by default we're going to say prices right and i'll tell you the reason why we say prices by default then i want to just make a function called handle um, price type change price type change right and this is the function and over here instead of saying new alignment i'll say new type correct and instead of set i'll say this so this is how that function looks. I will be passing this over here. We don't need the area label exclusive. Their value is price type. Correct. And the value for this is price. This is, for this is market underscore caps. And for this is total underscore volumes. And like I said, I will be telling you as to why we have these uh, values. Right. Something that I will also do is we don't need these area labels as well. So let me just get rid of them right and okay cool so we have a very simple uh mui component now which just has a toggle button group it has toggle buttons the values of them are prices market caps and total volumes if you remember when we were getting our prices right over here let me just console log my response that data if i go over here and console log my response that data inspect my element and go to my console what do i see is i see this object which has market caps prices and total underscore volumes right and then it has further it has a number of arrays you know the number of objects that we have called for so if we have called for 60 days it's fetching 61 but yeah right so something that you need to realize is inside the api call that we're already making we're getting three objects market underscore caps prices and total volumes so what i need to do is i basically need to toggle between all of them so when i click this i want to change my prices and i want to just say dot market caps then when i toggle this i need to say dot total volumes and that is about it right so it is very simple and um, yeah that is all that we need to do so something that we will be doing firstly is obviously we need to style this properly right now and then we'll be going to that part but this is the reason why we have prices market underscore caps and total underscore volumes because we can just you know uh, keep our life simple anyways so now what i'm actually going to do is uh, we will just quickly copy the styling again from our previous uh, component and again so we have styled using the sx tab so let me just copy this and the moment i copy this our styling does become uh, very smooth 
So let me just copy this. If I go to my Google Chrome, you will already see that this changes, right? So I see price, I see market cap, and I see total volume. Correct. And when clicking of each, uh, it does change. So if you want, I can just console log uh, my new type, right? So every time I change it, you will see it in the console, total also volumes, market caps, and price, right? We do see all of these things, correct? So anyway, so we know that our uh, this thing is working. All we need to do is we just need to style it properly. So I'll have a div over here because I need to center it. So copy this, have my div wrapping my entire toggle group. And then what I need to do, give this a class name and the class name will be toggle dash prices, right? I will copy this class name. I'll be importing our styles. So import dot slash styles dot CSS. Then go to our styles of CSS over here. Have dot toggle prices and just say display flex. Right, align item center and just right item center. And by doing that, our entire toggle group will be centered. Right, as soon as we do that, this is centered. I should also give it a little margin, so maybe a margin of one rem wouldn't hurt, and that is about it. Correct. So this is how that looks. Now, something that I wanted to talk about was the fact that how are we styling this component? So again, we are using the SX attribute over here. We have a dot mu selected. We are blue. We have border color. We have border. Then we have dot mu and toggle button group grouped. Then we are giving it a border of one pixel solid. The color will be blue, and the border color we have set unset. And obviously the standard is blue. So see, all of these stylings might seem very confusing to you right now, but like I said, you just have to hit and try these values. So if I inspect my element, go over here, go inside my toggle group, you know, I will be getting all of these classes and all I need to do is just inspect, you know, each one of them and just grab one of these classes and just say and and dot and then do the styling part, right? Other than that, I think something that we are missing from this is the fact that over here also I had given them a class name. And let me have a look as to why have I given the button a class name. Okay, because to make it responsive, we are going to reduce the font size. That makes sense. So basically, I have given a class name to the button itself. And because what I want to do is I want to make them responsive when our, uh, you know, when the screen size reduces that's about it so again this is not really necessary responsivity is something that we'll take care of towards the end but anyways it's, it's good to still add it right so let me just add this over here uh, options options yeah okay so we have our toggle group now ready and it looks pretty good as well right anyways so what we want to do now is that on the change of this toggle, we want to fetch the prices again and we want to fetch the specific specific type of the price, correct? So again, uh, we'll be doing the same thing. I will be cutting this entire code. I will be having my price type over here and handle price type change function as props. I will go to my coin.js, paste both of these things over here. Uh, put this at the very top because by default we want the prices to be we want to just fetch the prices right and then what we want to do is that we will be passing our prices over here firstly so price is equal to prices or price type my bad price type right and uh, handle price type change is handle price type change these two functions correct so at least we know that even right now our uh, this thing is working right where we are toggling it and it should work so now what we want to do is every time we do that we'll do the same thing so i will say set is loading is true right i will say set we are already setting the new price type then we want to fetch the prices again but the only thing is this time what we want to do is we fetch we fetch the basic prices by passing a price type to it right so how do we do that? Well, it's very simple. Inside the get coin prices function, we make a new price type variable, right? And over here, we'll pass the new type, like I said, and not price type. So if I go to this function, what I will be doing is I'll have a price type variable over here. And all I'll be saying is, instead of saying this, where we return response or data or prices, how about we return this, correct? And if you guys know what this will do is, it will return the exact same price type. 
so our code is much more cleaner and if this price type is prices we will get prices if this price type is total underscore volumes we'll get total underscore volumes and if our price type is market underscore caps we'll get market underscore caps so that is about it so this way our code is much more cleaner and um okay so the only thing that we need to take care of is that the fact that we need to pass our prices everywhere now so let's say if we are getting our prices over here i need to say price type over here right and there's no event dot target dot value over here i need to say days so see we will only fetch with the new data right so over here my event dot target dot value is my days which is new right which is changing so the price type is the same over here days is the same price type is changing correct when we fetch the data for the very first time Oh, and also something we need to do is we need to do this. So instead of calling this function as well, I will just uh, pass this. And anyways, right. So now again over here, I need to say get uh, comma price type, and that is about it. So as soon as I do that, go to my Google Chrome now. If I click on my total volumes, I should see total volumes. If I click on price, I see prices. If I click on market cap, I see market cap. And I know how these values are changing is because over here I see that obviously total volume is 80 billion something, market cap is 5, 60 billion something, price is 29,000, right? And that is how simple it is to actually make an entire line chart component dynamic. Now, something you guys are already noticing is that over here, this seems to be a big number. So why don't we try to slice it a little, right? And as you guys already remember, we have the function which converts numbers, right? So we can convert this into 560B and we can convert this into 80B, right? If you remember, we have this function already, which whose job is to say convert numbers. So why don't we run this function over there? But now the tricky part is how do I edit the Y axis of my line chart? So for that also, you can refer to the documentation and the documentation says that you can, you know, customize your scale, right? So the code to customize the scale is also something which is very, very simple and it is very straightforward as well so if i go over here and if i just google customizing my um, y axis in line chart <coughs> i should be able to see that charges y axis uh, custom horizontal line and label so you want to actually customize a y axis label right um yeah so we should see that and anyways if i go over here we see this you know scales options inside our options correct so basically something that we realize is there's this thing called ticks right and we need to write callback functions for that and that is about it so if you do a little bit of research you will find this i think there's an example inside uh, there should be an example inside chart jason's documentation as well of how to customize you know the scale and we will have to find it scale options right so title configuration i believe so this is the title we don't really want that we want scales um hmm it is somewhere around here there is a callback function though but anyways the main point being it is something that is there uh, commonly available if you just know what to google you will be able to you know get it yeah like this okay so basically what you need to do is you have the options attribute or options what do you say key value inside that you will have your scales and inside that you have your y what y means is y axis right so now the y axis attribute you can just have ticks over here ticks refer to this individual thing each thing is a tick right and you can uh, call a callback function and then this is basically adding a dollar in front of the tick so this is actually what we exactly need because over here, let's say we have the price, right? So we need to add a dollar in front of it. So how do we do that? So basically all you need to do is let's just copy all of this entire thing, the scales part and go to our VS code, go to our line chart component and just add this over here, right? So we have this Y and we have this uh, scales and uh, we have the Y, we have the ticks and we are returning this. So now if I have a look at my charges, what do I see? I see a dollar value already added there. So that's new. And something that I realize is now what I can actually do is I can actually say dot two locale st string to this as well. So I can say two locale string. And what this will do is it will give me commas. So I will have dollar sign 29,000, 29, right? 
and something that I can do is I can pass my price type. So just just have a look at this, right? So whatever price type we have, we will be passing it. So let's say if I pass my price type over here inside my line, uh, not inside my list, inside my line chart. Let's say I copy this, paste this, and I pass my price type. So what that will allow me to do is I can go over here, have a price type, right? And I can say if my price type is let's do you know um, if if my price type is equal to equal to prices then we'll do this right else if my price type is uh, or I can just directly write an else else we can just say if you know it's market cap or if it's total volume what we would want to do is we would want to do this but apart from this we will also want to do convert numbers right convert numbers is the function that we had made over here if you guys remember let me just call this function now and I think I am already importing that uh, no I'm not right oh it's called convert number my bad not convert numbers so I just need to convert my number correct so now what happens is if I import this I should be able to see our code where let's say we have dollar sign 29 comma thousand right or we have commas over here if I go over here we get 560 billion and over here we get 80 billion so now this looks way 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 better and um, yeah and I feel that is about it and that is the last puzzle piece that we needed to finish our entire coin page so now our entire coin page is done with and um, yeah that is all right so now we can actually move on to our compare page which is nothing but it is just simply uh, having to deal with two coins right so over here we were getting our coin id from our bitcoin if i go and take you to or from our you know dynamic routing if i go and take you to a compare page what that means is that we will have two coins and how do we handle those two coins we handle them using these two selects so apart from the day selects we will also have two coin selects right and I will be fetching the data for two coins I'll be fetching two coin data I'll be having two line uh, you know two um, list views I will be having two coin info views and I will be finally having a multi-axis chart where I'll be having two you know y axis so if you remember one is on the left and the other is at the right so this is what we will be doing in our upcoming lectures so stay tuned for that and it is actually going to be very simple to do that i know right now this might seem a little complicated but trust me because of the fact that we've made our entire code base so modular and so well you know organized making the compare page is very very easy it's just going to take us two lectures the next one is going to be totally about our select uh, for our coin ids and doing this coin info and you know having a list view there and the second is going to be about charges and once we're done with that we're practically done with the entire project then we'll add some features like the footer and this mouse follower feature and that is about it. Now to make our compare page the first thing that we need to do is we need to realize that we will be handling two coins this time right or two cryptocurrencies. So we will have crypto one and we'll have crypto two. So what we'll be doing is first task is to actually build uh, this component where we'll be having two selects. So one will be the crypto one and the other will be the crypto two. Now something that we need to realize is that crypto one will just refer to the ID of crypto one and crypto two will refer to the ID of crypto two. And we need to have a crypto one data state that will be the state that holds the entire data of crypto one currency. And then we'll be having a crypto two currency or crypto two data state, which will be holding the state data of the entire crypto two uh, currency, right? And something else that we need to know is that we need to first, when we make this component, fetch the list of 100 coins that we have. And then we need to select these coins. So if I select Tether, what is happening is I'm actually selecting the state of Tether, right? So every time I select the state of Tether or the ID of Tether, I basically, um, you know, fetch all of the data again. And I fetch, you know, I fetch the data, I fetch the coin data and I fetch the coin prices. But if I'm just changing the number of days, I'm not fetching the coin data again, rather I'm just fetching the chart data again and that's about it. Similarly, whenever I toggle the prices or I use my toggle price component where I'm changing my total volumes of market caps, I'm not really changing the coins. 
So you need to realize that to optimize our entire performance, what we'll be doing is we'll have multiple states. And in these functions, there will be two functions, let's say the days function and the handle price change function, where the only thing we'll be fetching is the prices and we'll be updating the chart data. Whereas if we change the entire coin, then we need to fetch all of the data all over again, or at least for that coin, we need to fetch all of the data all over again. And that is about it. So without any further ado, let's actually get started with this page. And right now, this seems like a very huge task, but trust me, uh, by the end of this video, you'll realize that this is actually sim something which is very, very simple. So first things first, we'll go to our VS Code and we need to see if we have made our compare page. So this is how our compare page looks like. Right, so I'll have my compare page route over here and that is about it. So I need to make a compare page page as well. So I'll say compare page.js. I'll say RFC over here and I will have my compare page. The first things that I need to import is the header, right? To import the header, it's very simple. We will import it from the components and that is about it, right? So I think now we can import our compare page over here. And if we go to our compare page link, we should actually be, uh, okay. If we go to our compare page, we will actually be taken to the compare page, right? And as you can see, this link is working because over here we have a header. If you want to test it, what we'll do is I'll also go ahead and say hi, right? As you can see, we can see the hi, perfect. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to build this entire uh, group of states, right? So we already have our days uh, there, right? So we already have a days uh, select. What we need to do is we just need to build this. Now building this is something which is very simple. So let's make a new components folder and call it the compare page components. So here we will be having all of our compare page components, right? So the compare page component will actually consist of the select coin component or select coins, correct? Select coins because we have two coins. So then I'll have an index.js over here and I will have a styles dot css over here my index.js page will have um, the two what do you say the two selects right so select coins and all we need to do is we can actually just copy our code from our select days component over here so we can generally just copy this entire select as it is and i'll tell you as to why we can do that right so over here we'll just copy it and we'll just paste everything over here and something that I'll do is I will copy this SX as well. And I would like to, you know, make us a constant over here, call it styles and add that over here and then just put my styles inside my SX. And that is about it. Right. So then we have a label not needed. We have the ID not needed. We have the value. So now we will be making two, um, uh, what do you say? We will be making two selects, right? So the first one will be const for crypto one. So I'll have crypto one over here and I'll have set crypto one, right? Remember this state is just for the ID. We'll have a separate state to fetch our entire uh, coin data, right? Similarly, we'll have a crypto two. The crypto two one is uh, basically the same thing, but over here instead of Bitcoin, we'll have the default value as Ethereum, right? Okay, cool. So now what we need to do is we need to have, uh, we need to change this right and we also need to have over here the value needs to be crypto one and something that we need to realize is we'll have two handle change functions as well uh, or we can have one handle change function but anyways so we can have a const handle coin change function right and over here what i would like to do is let's say uh, we have an event obviously we'll have the event and the second parameter also we'll have so firstly let's just change the crypto one Correct set crypto one is equal to event dot target dot value and this should be good right and I can have the handle coin function over here over here I would like to give this the label of crypto one right and that is about it now something that we need to realize is what is the menu items the menu items are actually the hundred coins that we need to we are fetching in the dashboard page correct because we will be selecting out of them so now do I manually write them or do I just use the API so obviously I will just be using the API. So let's actually go to the dashboard page because there's something that we want to change. So over here also we have this access call. So why not we create a function for that? Because we will be using this coin. Uh, we'll be using this again and again. So let me just say get hundred coins over here dot js. And let me just say const. Uh, this will be export const. Get 100 coins. Right. 
and again it'll be a it'll basically be the same thing right where um yeah it'll basically be the same thing the only difference is we are just you know optimizing our code a little so i will be copying this entire thing and um yeah so i will be copying this entire thing and we will be taking this over here pasting this over here so we will be importing our axis so our import for our axis is uh, just this import axis from axis <sighs> we'll have our import like this and there is no variable over here so that's cool we have this response we have these set coins and set paginated coins and everything so all of this is something that i will just return so i'll just say return response dot data right and i'll just say const my coins is equal to this and i'll just say return my coins correct so that is about it so now we will be returning our coins and what that means is if i go to my dashboard page all i need to do is make an async function over here const get data which is an async function right uh, remove this no no correct and i'll have my code over here so now what i need to do is i just need to say const uh, my coins is equal to await get a hundred coins right get hundred coins the function that we wrote and i'll be importing this so we'll be getting a hundred coins and i'll be saying set coins is equal to this and this will be this right and i just need to say if my coins is there only then do this right and something we also need to do is i need to make my set is loading is true okay by default that's true that's cool so all i need to do is get this call this get data function to call our data and i'll just do that over here right so now if we go to our dashboard i don't think so our code should break if it breaks then we'll see as to why does it break and it doesn't seem to break even if i refresh everything seems to be just fine even the pagination seems to work so everything's good right so let's quickly go to our compare page and over here what are we going to do now we are going to call our get 100 coins function exactly like this right so let's go to our um, compare page or in fact before we go to our compare page let's go to our select coins component over here and just have that right so what we'll be doing is i will have a use effect over here right and basically whenever this component is called what we'll be doing is we'll be saying get data right uh, what does get data mean we will be writing a function for get data so const again it's just going to be a simple async function so let me just say function get data right call this have a sync over here so that we can call this and get 100 coins we'll be importing a 100 coins so now i get my 100 coins so what i want to do is i want to have a use state over here and the use state that i'll uh, save it as is 100 coins const or I can just say all coins, right? All coins, comma set all coins is equal to use state, and this will be an array of coins, right? So as soon as I get my coins, I will be saying this set all coins, and as soon as I do this, I'll be passing my my coins over here, correct? So now as soon as my component renders, I will be getting my data, and my get data is getting hundred coins, and I'll be setting that. So now all I need to do is I just need to map my all coins over here, right? What is all coins? All coins is an array of hundred coins. I'll be mapping that array. I'll have coin over here. And every time I map that array, I will be having a menu item, right? And that is generally about it. And the only thing is that the value will be coin dot ID, like I said, and over here, what we want to show is we want to show coin dot name, right? And that is about it. So if I go to my Google Chrome now, I haven't called this component. So let me select coins, copy this. I will go to my compare page. I will have my select coins component, right? And as soon as I have that, what do we see? Uh, not defined. Okay. Hmm. I don't seem to have imported use state. So let me import use state. 
import a new state and okay menu item is also not defined okay so obviously we need to add a lot of imports so let's just copy these imports from here <coughs> go to our index page have our imports as soon as we have our imports use effect is also not defined let me import my use effect again for some reason my auto fill is not working uh, that's strange so use effect right so now i have this as soon as i see this i see that i have a bitcoin and over here i see the list of 100 coins that i have on selecting them i see all of these things and the best part is if I console log, you guys will actually realize that what am I saving inside my state is just the ID. So if I save this and if I just say console log my crypto or just crypto one ID, what you guys will realize is if I just, you know, say even dot target dot value over here, go over here, I am actually selecting the ID, right? Over here it says clay TN, but over here it says clay dash token, correct? Similarly, if I select, I think BNB, it should show Binance coin because Binance coin is the ID, right? And if you remember, our API highly depends on the IDs of the coins and that is why these are very, very important, correct? So now the rest is just about making the UI look good. So firstly, we will have a P tag over here, right? So I'll say P tag, P tag, let me say crypto one and I need to put all of this inside a flex. So right now, just because uh, for ease of use, let's just say uh, coins dash flex over here. And I'm just going to put everything in a flex box, right? So we will have a little trouble styling this later, but that's fine. Um, and right now the functionality matters more, right? So I'll just say display flex, uh, just if I content, flex start, align items, center, and let's just give it a gap of 0.5 rem and that is good so now if i have a look at my google chrome this is what i see correct and this is very similar to what i had wanted over here obviously and that's about it right if you want we can give it a margin of 1.5 rem as well so i think a margin of 1.5 rem would look good Go over here this is how it looks great right all right perfect so now what we need to do is and the gap i think we can increase as well so this is how it looks okay this looks better so now what we need to do is i need to have my crypto 2 and for that again all i need to do is copy this right and have crypto 2 over here have crypto over here call this crypto 2 handle coin change is the same not the same so over here we'll be have i'll be passing two things so the first thing is obviously my event object Right, so I have an event over here, I'll pass the event object. The second thing that I want to do is, I'll say is coin2. So now what I will do is over here, I have this and I have is coin2, right? And what that allows me to do is, now I can basically say if is coin2, else. So if it is not coin2, it is coin1. So we will basically be doing this thing. But if it is coin2, we will be setting my coin2 state. Correct, so I'll be saying set crypto2. And that is about it. So now if I go over here, yeah, is coin2 is not defined, is coin2. Okay, so over here, I think I need to do the same thing and I need to say true over here. And by default, it will be false. So if I inspect my element and if I show you my console, what you guys will see is if I select this coin, it says crypto two, where it should have said crypto one. And if I do this, it says crypto two. So over here, both of these are saying crypto two. So let's have a look as to what is causing this error. If uh, it's going to, I think I will have to put these, this exact thing. So let me just do this and over here, I'll say false, right? Yeah. So now if I change this, this should say Solana, Crypto 1 is Solana. And if I change this, it should say Crypto 2 is strong. Okay, so our function works perfectly. And now I have the state of the ID or I, my ID contain, my state contains the ID of Crypto 1 and Crypto 2 respectively. So all I need to do is now fetch data according to this. Correct. So, okay. But first things first, I will obviously have to uplift the state uh, somewhat and um, yeah, so I guess we can just simply pass these two values. These two values are the values that I need outside this component. So crypto one, 
crypto two set is uh, I mean set crypto one and set crypto two. These four values are the only values that we need, and rest we are good to go. Okay, so now what I'll be doing is we will be calling our or going to our compare page, and over here we'll be having these use states, right? I will be importing use states, so use state correct and that is about it i need to pass these two values and these two values correct so over here i'll just say this copy this have this over here and have this as our last value Perfect. So now if I go to my Google Chrome, everything should still work. Let me refresh. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin is there. Ethereum is there. If I go over here, Binance coin, Litecoin, everything seems to work. Crypto one is Binance coin, Crypto two is Litecoin. And just like that, our entire, you know, um, select coins thing is done. So now obviously what uh, I need to do is I need to call my select days component as well if you guys remember so for that we we'll need to have a select days over here and a set days as well and the by default value of that will be 30 i think right so now i'll just have a div over here and i'll put this inside that correct i need to have my select days component and uh, i need to pass my days attribute there Something else that I need to do is I need to pass a handle days function, handle days change function, right? So I'll make a handle days change function here as well. And all that function will do is for now just set the value, right? So function handle days change. And right now all it's going to do is just set days to event.target value. So we have an event over here. And I'll just say event.target. Value. So this should be good. And if I go over here, we see this, right? This is changing. This is changing. Everything seems to be working. The only thing is the UI doesn't look good. So I'll over, go over here, say class name, and say uh, coins dash days dash flex. And since we don't really have a styling page for this, we'll just put it inside the index for now, right? So let me just go to the index.css. Have this. And just say display flex, display content. Uh, let's do space around, I think that will look a little better. And align items will be center, obviously. Correct. So if we do this, this is what it looks like. Not the best. So maybe space between. Let's just keep it space between. This is how that looks. Hmm. We should have a margin over here. Of I guess 1.5 rem and that means I can really remove the margin from this part yeah this is also fine right so if we do this this is how that will look right for some reason this doesn't look um, aligned or is it just me so we will have to have a look as to why is this not aligned right because if you think about it this or is it just me no it's not aligned Right, so something something's off. We will have to take care of that. But before that, another thing that we'll do is over here I will pass uh, no p tag. Right. So what I want to do is just say if no p tag is there, uh, if no no p tag, then just show this. Right, and that is about it. Correct, because no p tag will be true right now, and we'll make this false. So if I go to my compare page, what I'll be doing is I'll say no p tag is equal to true, right? So this phase, what happens is the p tag goes away, right? For some reason, the styling is still a little off. We will have to definitely have a look. Maybe I've given this thing a margin. So let me have a look at this. Yeah, this has a margin. So maybe that will fix it. Yes, that fixes everything. Great. So this looks better now, right? This is still not obviously responsive or how we wanted it to be, but this is still a step forward. And anyways, so what we can do now is uh, firstly, I don't think so set space between is going for us. Let's just do flex start 
and let me just give it a gap of uh, two rems maybe to just you know give it a little gap yes this looks better in my opinion anyway so we have our state and we have our uh, you know we have a crypto one state crypto two state and we have our days there so now all i need to do is i just need to fetch all of the details right so uh, like i said we'll be having two more states so the first one is called crypto one data right so set crypto one data correct and the second one will be called crypto two data so these states are the states which are responsible for the data of that cryptocurrency this is just for the id of that like i said so again all we need to do is basically you know um we'll also have to have to pass the coin function over here but anyways so all we need to do is we need to fetch the data now so something that we realize is we don't need these two things and if i go over here we don't need to pass our set cryptos because what we'll be doing is we'll have our handle coin change function handle coin change right so i'll just get this function out of here and that makes our lives much much more simpler so if i go to my compare page have this outside and then i can just pass this inside our select coins right so okay so this is how we'll be doing this and perfect so now what i need to do is now i just need to call my um, data or fetch my data and we have already done that so we can actually go to our coin page and just copy that so let's say if i'm getting my uh, calling the data for this particular id this is what i need to have and this is how i'll be getting the prices as well of that right so what we'll do is i will just copy this put this inside my uh, handle coin change function but first let's deal with coin two right so what we need to do is uh, let's say if we are having our coin two okay so we are setting the state we don't really want to see this we have we are going to get our data so we are going to get our data for even dot target dot value right if data comes you will set that inside the coin object right and the best part is over here it's not set coin data it's set crypto to data right and this is the data we get the prices as well and we don't have a price type right now so we'll just pass prices over here uh if prices dot length so and so setting chart data function we need to call this function we don't have a chart data so let's not have this code right now okay cool so what we're doing is we are changing our id and we are fetching the data right if the data comes then we are moving forward correct similarly for this we'll have to do the same thing so let me just copy this part mm, okay let me just copy this and have this over here so if my crypto one is changing i will be passing again crypto one's id have this as crypto one data have this as over here there's no id rather there is um even not target or value both the places correct and prices and that is all great the first thing that we need to do is we need to say set is loading to true right and once the data is fetched this is what we do perfect so all right what we did was we are right now taking care of handle coin change then that means as soon as we get the coin we will be uh, you know as soon as we get the coin we will be fetching the data so if we are changing the coin to we'll just fetch the data for coin to and update set crypto to and we'll be updating our set crypto to data if we are changing the crypto one we'll be updating the set crypto one which is the id and set crypto one data which is the data of that right this might seem a little complicated right now we will fix the code i think this is not the cleanest way to do it we will fix it but right now let's just see if this works something other than that what we need to do is i will be making a use effect because i need to uh anyways fetch the code for you know first my uh first uh, obviously whenever i get the data i need to get it for bitcoin and ethereum right so that is something that i definitely need to do so yeah so we will be making a get data function over here as well and we will have to call all the uh, functions right so let me make a function called async function called get data over here and what that means is i will be getting the data of my um, first coins right which will be bitcoin and ethereum so i do need to do that so i'll just paste the code over here not this i will just paste this code so set is loading is true definitely the first thing then we need to get our data one and data two 
So I'll say I'll say const data one and coin get coin data and what are the what is the coin data that I'm getting the data for crypto one because crypto one is Bitcoin. Correct. Then what I need to do is if my data one is there, we'll set the coin object and all of these things obviously. So if my data one attribute is there, which is my data one means coin data one, I will be setting crypto one data with data one. Right. Then we need to get the prices as well. Over here we need to get the prices for crypto one and that is about it then we'll obviously set the chart data as well okay then what i need to do is i need to say const data 2 and data 2 will be for my crypto 2 correct similarly basically the same thing and what i will be doing is i'll have if data 2 over here and that is about it so now something that you need to realize is now we need to get the prices after we get the data so what i will do is i will just cut this and uh, I will just cut this as well. So what we will be doing is we will be having the prices after we get data one and then data two, right? And then I'll be getting my prices. So then I'll be getting prices one for crypto one, and then I need to get prices two, which will be for crypto two, correct? And then similarly, if prices one dot length is this, that means the prices one is there, and prices two dot length is this. That means price two is there then we need to say both the prices fetched or if you want i can just show that both prices fetched and i can just show prices one comma prices two correct and that is all so now first things first let's just have a look at what is happening okay we have a lot of things that are not defined so firstly the use effect was not defined so let me have use effect over here correct then what do we have not defined set is loading is not defined uh get coin data is not defined get coin price is not defined. perfect so i will say get coin prices we'll get this get coin data is not defined apparently we will do this set is loading is not there as well because obviously we never made that state so i need to say const set is Is loading comma set is loading is equal to use state and by default let's just keep it true right so this is there now what is not there everything seems to be there perfect other than that something that we need to do is we need to have this logic as well where we say uh, this thing right so I'll go over here have that logic too so if anything is loading we'll just show that right otherwise we don't really need this and that is about it right okay so now i need to import my loader perfect so that was a lot of code but now i think every everything should work fine so let's go to our console and let's actually refresh the page so we see the loading we see that and what do we see is firstly we need to pass a key prop over here we just do that we see both the prices are fetched we see 31 31 we see the data is there right uh, the data is here this is the 100 coins and um, yeah so we do see if the prices are being fetched that means the data is also being fetched right so everything is being fetched uh, fetched clear uh, you know properly over here we'll go and we will add a key over here because we should so here i'll say key and i know this is a lot of coding but it will uh, it is working now right that's what that matters okay so something that I need to fix is our um, the fact that we do not have prices one and price two for my um, compare pages handle coin change, right? So see this logic that we have if data one and data two is there, then fetch both of the prices. So basically, what we need to do is we need to fetch both the prices again. And before I actually do that, I will also make a state for our price type. So I know this seems to be a lot of states, but I'm just doing all of these things right now so that it's not you know an issue in the future so let me just say prices by default correct so instead of this i will be having let me just replace all by nope i cannot replace all i just need to do this and these two all right so something that you need to realize is now i need to really optimize this part so what we are saying is when we change our coin, I am saying if my if saying if my coin two is changing, I need to fetch this, and I need to basically fetch 
uh, my prices again. But the uh, the thing is that I need to fetch the prices anyways all over again, and I'll tell you why. So what we can do is the best thing to do is actually just having this outside the if, right? Outside this thing, and having our lives very simple that way. Prices one and prices two. Right, and basically what I need to do is we need to say um, over here we need to say even dot target dot value if or I can just get the prices. <sighs> okay, so the thing is if I have my prices inside the if I want to get both the prices more or less, right, and um, I don't want to save the prices in a state and the reason for that is that is unnecessary. So what we can do is over here I can have um, crypto one. right and over here i will have crypto two and that is about it so now what will happen is let's say our coin one data is here is the data is here we say if data you know set the coin object we don't need to do that honestly we can just have this and if you uh, right now i'm just trying to reduce the number of lines of code that we are writing right right and that is about it so what is happening is if it's coin two, we change everything. We set the coin two object. If it is coin one, we change everything for the coin one object and we get the prices. And the reason for the fact that I'm getting prices is now that we can just call our chart data function. If you guys remember, if once we get a chart, uh, once we get our prices, it is very simple to move forward because all we need to do is we just need to do setting chart data and that is about it. Right. And yeah, so that is the next step that we'll be doing, but that is something that we'll be tackling in our next uh, obviously uh, next video this video is anyways way too long but just to show you guys that our code is really working what I'll do is let's do this so that you guys know that when I change the change a coin I'm getting the prices again right as you guys can see did we get our uh, both the prices fetched right if I change this let's see if we get that again right so we should see both the prices again right uh, so we do see both the prices again correct so this works just fine and everything is working so that is great so let's meet in the next class um, where we will be dealing with how to you know uh, make a line chart and how to really get started with all of those things so before getting started by you know writing more code today so something that we would want to do is that we would first want to talk about all the states that we have made so in the last class the first state that we had made was crypto one right the second one we had made for the crypto too. So these two states are just for the IDs of our cryptocurrencies. Then we obviously have a state for our days uh, select, right? And then we have one more state for our crypto one data. And then we have the other one for our crypto two data, right? So now what needs to happen is that every time I select this select, right? I need to basically change my, uh, what do you say? I need to change my crypto one ID and I need to change my crypto one data. Whereas whenever I do this, I need to change my crypto two data and I need to change my crypto two ID, right? And yeah, so the reason why we need to have crypto one data and crypto two data is because we will be making the uh, list components, right? We need to add these two list components and we also need to add these two components. So I think that is something that we did not do in the last class. So in today's class, let's actually do that first. Right, so we already have crypto one data and crypto two data. So what we'll be doing is I will just simply copy this entire code that we already have and I'll paste it inside my compare page. Right, so over here, I'll just have this uh, below this. Correct, and now what I'll be doing is I'll be changing this to crypto one data. Right, I think this is called crypto one data, if I'm not wrong, and this will be called crypto two data. Correct, so as soon as I save that, go to my tabs, the page loads obviously and when the loading is done we do see our crypto one data and crypto two data and this is actually solana we see solana over here and we see ethereum over here right other than that what we need to do is we need to also add our um coin info component so again let's just simply copy this go to our compare page add this below our list component for now uh, but yeah so now over here we just need to pass two things so obviously we'll be passing coin one data dot name and coin one uh, crypto one data dot description similarly crypto two data dot name and crypto two data dot description and that is about it so if i go over here coin info is not defined let me import this 
right this is how i import it go to my google chrome and now i do see these two things so now apparently there is no um you know firstly there is a little uh issue that we have with our padding so we need to fix that other than that over here we don't really have a description for solana so just to make sure if i select solana over here am i getting a description or not let's have a look so okay yes solana does not seem to have any definition so that is an edge case that we need to look out for but before that let's just quickly correct the styling that we have right so let me go to the coin component and over here as well i think what we need to do is we'll just you know uh, change the styling that we have already done over here inside our list view so let me just change the padding itself i think it's just a simple issue of the padding that we are having let me just do this and the moment i do this i think our code should look a little cleaner as uh, it does uh, but solana's heading is not really looking nice so we will have to fix that but yeah anyways more or less it is working over here maybe i have a padding bottom as well for this right and that will fix things just a little correct yes it does okay perfect so obviously we will have to take care of that edge case that is not important right now but something that we now realize is that we have a crypto one data for the data and we need to again fetch our prices have a chart data and all of that but before we actually do that something that we are missing is the fact that if i select ethereum over here there can be two ethereum coins over here right let's just have a look so now crypto one is also ethereum and crypto two is also ethereum now there's no point in comparing the two same coins so what we need to do is over here if i see there's no after bitcoin there should be an ethereum but there's no ethereum because i've selected ethereum over here so let's say if i select bitcoin and i go over here now to my second uh, drop down there's no bitcoin right so basically what i'm doing is i'm saying that whatever the list of 100 coins that we are mapping over here right inside this menu items mapping we are having a list of 100 coins so i will be filtering out the coin that i've selected right so if i talk to you guys in terms of code the code is very simple all we need to do is go to our select component over here we already have our crypto one so what i need to do is in the mapping of this i need to say firstly all coins dot filter right and i need to just filter the item dot id should not be equal to crypto 2 and that is about it and then i'm mapping it right so basically what will happen is only uh, this all coins of filter will return an array containing all the items except for the crypto 2 one right similarly over here what we need to do is i need to say the same thing but the filter will filter crypto 1 correct and that is about it so now if i go over here and go to my google chrome this should work so if i go over here and okay so if i select bitcoin bitcoin gets selected and over here ethereum is selected and there's no bitcoin right if i select tether over here right my page reloads obviously and then if i go over here there's bitcoin ethereum but no tether so my code is working so now i cannot select the two of the same coins right something that is now left is that we need to get started with our line uh, chart component and uh, after that is done we will be also working on a price target functionality right so if i go to the code and if i go to my compare page code what we'll see is let's let's just look at the flow of the code right now right let's say our coin is being changed as soon as we coin change our coin we are fetching the prices again for obviously whatever coin we are changing and that is about it right so something that we can also do is that i can just fetch um okay so basically we can just have these prices inside of this if else as well to make our lives easier because this way is what is happening the state is going to be a little uh, problematic for me right so what we will be doing is i will be fetching let's say our coin two coin two is changed so i'll be fetching both the prices again i know this is not the most ideal way but we do need both the prices again right so you guys can make the code optimized uh, whenever you want to but over here then we'll be setting our chart data right so um yeah and that is about it correct so now the only thing is we will be having to change our setting chart data function as well because now our chart data will contain two data sets if you guys remember right so our code will basically revolve around that and um, that is about it so if if let's say what we will do is first let me create a state for my chart data right the state for the chart data is obviously for the chart data because we need to pass the chart data inside our line chart right so i'll have chart data comma set chart data over here and the use state will be an empty object so this is done 
Now what I need to understand is, let's say we are getting these two prices, correct? So obviously this is the first, uh, what do you say, this is the use effect function that runs as soon as the page loads. So this is the first functionality that we need to tackle. So now let's say we will be doing this, correct? But over here, we were just passing one prices. Now we have two prices. We have prices one and we have prices two. So something that we need to do is maybe I need to pass a variable called um, is prices two there or I can just pass this and I need to change this function. So what I now need to do is I need to say prices two, right? So I'll make this as prices one. So this becomes prices one, this becomes prices one, correct? Now what I need to do is I can either have an if over here, I can just say if prices to correct and I can have an else right so this becomes my else part if I have prices to what do I want to do I my x-axis will remain the same right so let's let's just look at our chart j's and see what is happening so when we have two graphs our x-axis is the same because the number of dates is the same or it is only the prices that is changing and if I refer to my multi axis line chart documentation that I had for my uh, line chart, what I realize is inside my setup, I need two data sets, right? And uh, over here also, what we have is we have two data sets with two y axis IDs. So now this y axis ID is also something that I'll be talking about because it is this y axis ID which lets me have one y axis on the left and the other on the right, right? And if I want to see how that works, that basically works because I have this code where I say, you know, y is on the position left and y1 is on the position right, correct? If I go over here, I see this is a y-axis ID of y1. Now this y1 is corresponding to this y1. So the type is linear, obviously, uh, that is something that line chart wants. Display is true, obviously, we want to show the display as well, but position is right. So that means this position will be right, and over here, we have the position left. So that is all that we need to do. So in essence, what exactly is happening is the fact that over here, we'll be having two data sets, firstly, so I have my second data set, right? The border color for my second data set, let's keep it green. I think that looks the best. So I'll just copy this, go to my um, setting chart data function over here. And inside my second thing, just have this, right? Then over here, we'll be having prices too, obviously. Over here, we have prices one. Convert date works exactly the same way. Over here, we need to have, uh, yeah, everything else works exactly the same way. Now the only difference is that uh, the background color, I think we can say fill false. And what that means is there will be no background color because we don't want the background color, right? And these are all styling that you guys can change according to your needs as well. But these are the styling that I have made according to myself, correct? And apart from that, I think more or less we should be good to go now. Over here, maybe I can say prices two dot length, or I think this is also fine. If prices two exists, then we'll have this. Otherwise, we'll have this. Right, so the code is very simple and I think it should work now. So if we go to our compare page and obviously we need our line chart component. So let me just copy that from the coin page as well. So let me just copy this entire diff, have this inside this part, right? Uh, remove these two things, not needed. And this is what we have. I'll be importing my line chart, correct? I don't think so, we have a price type right now. So let me just save prices for my price type and that should be about it. Right. So if we go to our Google Chrome now and go to my crypto tracker, what do we see? We see one line and we see the second line. Perfect. So now something that you need to realize is that over here, if we, if I compare Bitcoin to Ethereum, what is Bitcoin's current price? It is 27,000. What is Ethereum's current price? It is 1,700, right? So Ethereum is basically just a straight line as, compa as compared to Bitcoin. In fact, if let's say I compare Bitcoin with an even smaller coin, let's say the last coin that we have, this particular coin, this value will be nothing but 0 0.499 uh, cents, correct, or 0 0.499 dollars. And this is $27,000. So this is basically a straight line as compared to Bitcoin. So this graph is not really an impressive graph or visually impressive, I must say, right? So now how do I make this graph visually impressive? So what do I need to do is that is where I will be needing two Y axes. Because if I compare this with just a single Y axis, what is happening is this is 0 point something something and this is 27,000 something. So this is all the way up and this is all the way down. So that is actually the reason why we need to have a multi-axis chart so that our scale gets relative, right? And I'll tell you why relativity is very important. Because when we compare charts, relativity becomes very important because it lets me compare charts properly. 
So something that I realized after making this project and after making my chart re- relative was the fact that Bitcoin and Ethereum follow the same pattern. Whenever Bitcoin is rising, rising, Ethereum is rising. Whenever Ethereum and Bitcoin, Bitcoin is falling, Ethereum is falling. Right. And sometimes it is exactly the same value. It will ex- it will rise to the exact same date. Then it will fall a little. Then it will rise again. Then it will fall a little. So the pattern is literally almost superimposing. Right. So that is why I mean this really. So the entire point of making this website is making a tracker which is you know, uh, what do you say, easy to use. It is something that you know people will understand and people get the knowledge of cryptocurrencies using this. Correct. That is the real life application of this project. So that is why we need to make a graph which actually makes sense. Now, if I compare Bitcoin with the last coin that we have, let's say Thorchain, right? So if I go over here, let's have a look at what Thorchain has to offer. Um, let it load, and this is what we see. Now, even the Thorchain's price is at one dollar, one point three seven dollars, and Bitcoin is at seventeen thousand. We can clearly see the relative growth and the relative fall of it. Even this coin was almost following the same pattern as Bitcoin, but then there was a specific point. Where Bitcoin fell and it did not rise that much, whereas this thought chain, or sorry, um, thought chain is the green one. So Bitcoin continuously kept on rising and the thought chain just fell, right, and did not rise that much. And before that, thought chain was very volatile. It kept rising, kept falling, kept rising, and Bitcoin had a set steady graph, correct. So we really do get to see all of the different, uh, you know, the different things that happen to the. Um, Cryptocurrencies. When are they rising? When are they falling? If they are rising, by how much? If they are falling, then by how much? Uh, through this, right? And that is why we need to have a relative scale rather than having a scale like this, which is plain and boring. So how do we do that over here? If you guys see, we need to pass this y-axis property, and then we need to change our options tab. Correct. So let's just do that. So let me just say, uh, let me just copy this. If I go to my VS Code, what I need to do is inside my Uh, what do you say? Setting chart data. What will I do is I'll have a Y axis ID and I'll call this Crypto One, right? And then over here I'll have another Y axis ID and call this Crypto Two, correct? Over here I need to pass another Y axis ID and call it Crypto One because over here we just have one crypto, correct? Now what we'll be doing is we will be going to our line chart and over here I will be passing this multi axis uh, prop. This prop will mean true, right? So first thing what I'll be doing is over here I'll be saying multi-axis is equal to true. So I'll be saying multi-axis is equal to, and I need to pass true. So now my multi-axis becomes true. If I go to my line chart, what do I need to do? Multi-axis is true, right? Now this is the part where I'll change my scales a little, and what that means is over here instead of saying Y, what I need to have is crypto one, correct? This is the ID of my entire scale. So again, I'll be copying this exact same thing and having crypto two over here, right? Then what else do I need to copy is the fact that if I go to my config, I need to have a tight linear display to a position left to my crypto one. Again, all of these things are things that I am also copying myself, right? And the only difference between crypto one and crypto two will be that this will be right. And I think this thing should be enough for me to go to my crypto tracker. And over here, I, if I see now the graphs are superimposing. Right, and that is all. Over here, we see the legend, and it says undefined, undefined. So I think what we need to do is we also need to have a label inside our landing page. Correct. So um, if we go to our setting chart data, I think over here there is no um, label over here. If that makes sense. So I can just say crypto one over here. Right, crypto one. And if you guys want to pass Bitcoin, you can pass Bitcoin as a another prop, right? That is up to you. And over here, I'll say crypto two, right? And that is about it. If I go to my Google Chrome now, crypto one is blue, so this is my crypto one. Crypto two is green. This is what it looks like, and my graph is looking like this, correct? And that is all. So now my graph is also there. All of my details are there. Everything seems to be there. Now all I need to do is firstly take care of this days functionality. So let's say if I'm changing the days, what do I need to fetch? I just need to fetch the prices again. So something that you need to realize is, I'll uh, repeat this again. If you change the coin, you need to fetch everything again. You need to co- fetch the coin data and the prices again. But if you just change the days, you just need to fetch the prices again because the coins are the same. Correct. So for that, we already have this function called hundred uh, days change. I think over here. So we are setting the targets. All I need to do is just I need to copy this part and get this done with. Correct. 
So this is all that I need to do and the only difference is that this needs to be an async function firstly. So we'll have this as an async. I will make is loading true. So set is loading will be true. And when the prices is done, I say set is loading will be false, right? So that part also will take care of prices one is crypto one days. Now instead of days, we need to pass event or target or value, right? And that's this is something that we discussed yesterday as well. So that is all. And the reason for that is the state does not change that easily, right? And oh, we have a price type variable that we have already made. So let me just pass price type over here as well instead of passing you know uh, prices like this. Anyways. So if I go to my Google Chrome now and if I change my days, my days should work. 90 days should mean 90 days. Let's just have a look. Uh, the API is working a little slow right now. So maybe something, okay, we see an error. What is the error? Uh, cannot read properties of undefined reading map. So, okay, something somewhere is going wrong. So let me have a look over here. Now it just says uh, network error. Did we write a lot of requests at one? Did we send a lot of requests? Hmm. We will have to see. I'm caught in promise. Okay. So how about we take two minutes to let me figure out what is happening and then I'll get back to you guys. And yeah. All right. So this error seems to be an error from uh, crypto uh, coin gecko APIs end. So basically if I try to execute this, this just continuously loads and then Okay, so now I do seem to get the data, but before that I was not getting that data. So let's have a look at this now and I think it should work. So I did not really change anything, but the error seemed to be because of uh, there was something wrong with the crypt coin gecko API. I think that was down for a few minutes. Now everything is working just fine. Okay, so I did not change anything on my coding part. Everything is still the same. But yeah, as you can see, the graph is still not responsive, but at least our, you know, the number of days is working and the graph will magically become responsive as soon as we add this price toggle component that we have. So that is what we will be doing in the next step, right? So anyways, again, I would like to repeat, I did not change anything in my code. Everything is working just fine. I did try to add this cross domain something, but that doesn't really seem to make any difference, right? So anyways so all right let's continue so now what we need to do is we need to add this price type component that we had so again we just need to copy like i said so after once the coin page is done making the compare page is very simple all you need to do is just simply copy a lot of components right so i'll have this price type component over here let me import it so it's actually toggle price type hmm so i think we need to change the import for this a little as well right and this is it. I think this should be fine now. But anyways, right? So we have our toggle price type. We have this. I need to make a handle price type change function. Correct. So now if you guys remember, the handle price type change function is actually very similar to our handle days change function. If you want, we'll also just copy this. And let's just have this over here. So, okay. Let me go to my compare page. Paste it right below my handle days function, handle price type function. We have this. Set price type. So now again, we need to get both the prices and that is all that we need to do. So I'll just do this and that is all that I need to do. Now the only difference is over here, instead of event.target.value, we'll have days, correct. And instead of price type, we'll have the new type. And that should automatically take care of all of the issues for us directly. So now if I go to my Google Chrome, what do I see is that my, um, over here, if I refresh, let's have a look, right? So our data seems to be fetching and uh, the data does seem to take a long time to load, but we will get into as to why that is causing an issue. But here we go. Everything else seems to be working just fine, right? Even this is completely responsive. Um, if I inspect my element, right, I should see the same thing. For some reason, this is black. We'll have to have a look as to why that is happening. But again, the data fetching is happening. And if I change the number of days, the number of days changes quickly as well, right? So the chart gets updated and um, yeah, everything seems to be working just fine. If I change, let's say the coin, let's change the coin and make it into something like Zilika. Let's have a look at what this has to offer. This also works completely fine. So everything does seem to work right. The only thing is this toggle for some reason has now become black. So we'll have to have a look as to why that is happening. This was something that was not happening yesterday. So let's just go over here. Let's select our MUI. 
and over here do you see this MUI selected tab uh, this MUI selected class sorry dot MUI dash selected so we might have to change that one a little so let's go uh, to our toggle price type and this is what we have toggle price group dot MUI selected we already have this maybe this is the reason as to why that was an issue okay so there was just a spacing issue now everything seems to be working exactly the way it should right and i think that is about it so with this our entire compare page seems to be also done and like i said once our uh, coin page is done compare page does not seem to be an issue at all the only thing that we did was we changed the accesses now we have two accesses right one is called crypto one the other is called crypto two crypto one is on the left crypto two is on the right we have the same array for our prices we have two uh, chart data elements now if i talk about my setting chart so the setting chart logic is all simple if we have prices two then that means we need to have two data sets one is for my crypto one the other is for my crypto two over here the border color is green the prices two is being mapped over here prices one is being mapped rest everything else seems to be the same and obviously this is yesterday's code right so nothing is changing over here if i talk in terms of my compare page we started off with our select coins this is where we are selecting crypto one and crypto two, which, which are basically the IDs. Then we have select days. Again, this is just for the days. Then we have a gray wrapper for our crypto one data list view. Then crypto two data list view. Then we have a toggle price type. This is allowing us to toggle between the price type. We have a line chart, obviously, which has the chart data. And we have the coin two coin info components. Right. And with this, our entire compare page is done. Right. So once we make our uh, coin page, our compare page does not seem to be a hassle at all. If we go back to our coin page, this is what we get, right? Let our data load and this is what we see. So everything seems to be working exactly the way it should have. And over here, we even have one year's option, right? So again, that is great. So do I have a one year option over here? I did not. That is strange. We haven't seen our one year view for this. Let's just quickly do that too. So let's just go for one year and let's see how that looks. Awesome. So this looks great. Right. And obviously this is also completely responsive. Like I said, somehow this MUI flex uh, makes this list component just expand the entire drip. And that is how, you know, this becomes responsive. But at least up to my understanding, that is what happens. But anyways, right. So with this, your entire compare page is also done. So, all right. So in the next class, what we're going to do is we're going to actually just talk about the watchlist functionality. And this is something that I would want you guys to implement. And it is something which is very simple and can be done using local storage. So consider this to be somewhat of an assignment, right? Where we'll talk about how you need to make the watchlist page. And after that, we are almost done with the project. So we will be uh, wrapping things up. We will be pushing uh, our, all of our code on the GitHub repo. We will be hosting our entire website on Netlify. And um, yeah, then after that, the last video will be about a simple resume session where I'll be telling you frequently asked questions and all of those things. So this page is something which is very simple to do. And this is a task that I will be giving to you guys and I will be expecting you guys to do. Now this page is very simple to make and all it involves is just a simple local storage, you know, uh, functionality. And all you need to do is, let's say the user goes to our dashboard page, right? So the user story is very simple. The user goes to the dashboard page and the user decides that, you know what? I am getting tired of, you know, always searching for the exact coin that I want to save. And I go and look at, you know, let's say I look at Dogecoin's portfolio every day. So what the user should be able to do is this user will see this particular, uh, you know, what do you say, um, an icon on the grid view or the user will also be able to see it on the list view. And what the user can do is just click on this. What happens is uh, Toastify or a React Toastify toast comes up. And what that says is Dogecoin, Dogecoin has been added to the watch this page. If the user goes to the watch this page now, so what we'll be seeing is we see the two coins or we see the coins that the user has added. Now this component is basically our, the same as our list and our, our tabs component, right? So all we have are the grids and the list view. So now something that you need to realize is what will you be saving inside our local storage? So inside the local storage, you will have an array of just simple IDs. Right. If I go to my application tab, if I go to my local storage over here, what do I see is I see an ID, uh, what do you see? An array of just simple IDs, right? 
So now how do I achieve this? Well, obviously you will make two functions, one to add a specific item to the local storage and one to remove that, right? So if I click over here, what do I get? I get a pop-up which says, are you sure that you want to remove this coin? If I say, okay, the coin gets removed. If I would not say, okay, the coin would not get removed, right? Similarly for this, if I do this, the coin gets removed and I access that state. And now if I refresh, what will I see is, I see no items in the watch list. Since it is using local storage, you will, you know, eventually have to refresh at one point. But anyways, regardless of that fact, what do I see is no items in the watch list. So let's say if the user comes to the watch list for the first time, you need to show it this view. You need to take the user to the dashboard, right? Inside the dashboard, allow the user to add coins and make sure that once the coin is added, you change the ID or you change the uh, coin icon, right? So as soon as it's added, it's added inside the array. And over here, what you need to do is you need to just simply um, you know, make sure that the user gets to see that, you know, something has been added, something has not been added and whatnot. So over here, we see that this icon is filled now. So there are two MUI icons, one is for filled and the other is for outlined. So you can use those icons. Now, if I talk about the logic part of the watchlist page, something that you need to realize is, let's say we have 10 coins that I've saved, or let's say we have 80 coins that I've saved, right, inside my watchlist. Will I be making 80 individual calls to get 80 individual grid views? All list views? No. So what I'm doing is over here in this page also, I'm fetching all of the hundred coins that we have in the dashboard. And then I'm just filtering and I'm saying whatever coins ID is over here, I need to just show that particular grid component. Otherwise I don't need to show it. Right? So basically what we're doing is we're fetching all the hundred coins again and exact same logic that we're doing inside a dashboard. The only thing is this array, instead of being uh, filtered through the search bar, like we have over here, it is being filtered on the basis of this array. So we're just saying, you know, if let's say this particular ID is included in this array, then show this on the grid, otherwise don't show it. So that is the simple logic that is there for our watch list page. And I don't think that that should be a, a tricky thing for all of you to do, right? If I talk about React Toastify, this is the library that we are using, React-Toastify, and it's a very, very easy to use library, right? If you go over here, uh, it allows you to make all sorts of toasts and this is something that is really good because it gives a user some feedback correct so this entire library just say npm i install uh, react toastify and all you need to do is you just need to have a toast container inside your app.js you need to import these two things and then to use your toastify it is very very simple you just need to say toast dot success right so let's say if i talk to you guys in terms of code all right, so this is what you need to write, something like this, right? You just need to have a toast and then just have a message and that is all, right? If I show you the code that I have written, that is even easier, correct? Because what it allows me to do is, okay, so let's go to our functions. We have obviously inside a functions folder, we will be having, let's say, uh, remove from the watch list, right? So this is the logic that I've written and I'm saying window.confirm. So the confirm window that you see is through this. If the user says true or if the user says yes, we will, this logic will run, otherwise this logic. If you want to give an error, you say toast.error. If you want to give a success, you say toast.success. And obviously, I'm pretty sure all of you know that you have to json.stringify before saving an array inside watch list. And whenever you get it, or inside local storage, whenever you get it, you need to json.parse it. Correct? So toast.success is to show a positive toast and toast.error is to show a negative toast. Right. Other than that, you can use any other library that you want. This is purely just for UX and this is a really interesting page. And other than that, this also adds a bit of a functionality to your website. Right. So with this, our entire website or our entire crypto, uh, you know, crypto project does come to an end. There are a few things that remain like, you know, making it uh, compatible for dark and light mode, adding a footer. And those are the things that are just left. And obviously, uh, you know, working on the responsibility. So these are all things that I really trust you guys to do. And I really hope that you guys do that because, um, yeah, that will really, you know, help you guys and it will make this project, you know, really great. Something else that I expect from you guys is to also change the theme, maybe change certain icons, maybe change certain, you know, design of it, change the order of it, maybe add more value to the days, right? Maybe fetch 250 coins, maybe mess around with the API documentation a little, add some more functionality. We saw that, you know, the description that we are getting is in many different languages. So maybe add a toggle for different languages, maybe add a toggle for different, you know, currencies as well. And maybe save that currency inside your local storage. So the next time the person comes, maybe just show them the data in INR 
or USD or Korean, right? Or whatever, whatever you want to. So the number of features that you can add is endless, right? Maybe inside the dashboard page also something that you can do is you can add uh, more grids or more lists. Like I said, maybe fetch 250 coins, right? And uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot of things that you can do, right? And one big task that I can also give you guys is, or I can give you guys an idea is that maybe convert this from just a crypto tracker and use the same template, use the same logic, use the same, you know, everything and convert this from just a crypto tracker to something like a, a stocks tracker as well. So this will be a crypto and a stocks tracker. And if you want to go one step further, you can also deal with commodities. So you can even show your graphs for, you know, all of these are publicly available APIs, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure there must be a free stock API and there must be a free commodity API as well. What commodities refers to is, um, you know, all of your prices of gold, silver, platinum, all of these fresh petrol, gas, right? All of these things that come into commodities and even these things are traded or even these things are, you know, they have a price chart and they these values continuously keep changing. So this is a really interesting world to dive into and you guys can definitely make something great out of this project. And obviously the idea was to give you guys a project that you guys can, you know, put in your resumes. So the next class is going to be about, uh, first you'll be hosting this project. So using, we'll be pushing all the code on GitHub, hosting this project on Netlify. And the next step would be to uh, talk about what all kind of questions can be asked in interviews and what all you need to be prepared for. We have finally come to the part where we will be pushing all of our code to GitHub and we will be hosting our entire website using Netlify. So now first things first, we will be creating a new repository. So click on this new button and click on the new repository. So obviously there's no template. Just simply go ahead and say crypto dash, whatever obviously you want to name it. I would want to name it crypto dash dashboard dash March, right? Make the, I'll be making the repository public so that you guys can refer to the code. Obviously there will be no read file, readme file for now. And maybe I'll push it later for you guys to refer to as well. And let's just create the repository. As soon as once that is done, obviously you get all of this starter code that you need. So let's go to our VS code. Let me just open my terminal and open a new tab over here and say get in it. Correct. Then obviously I'll be saying get add dot. And after that, all I need to say is get commit. Uh, let's just say project done. And instead of git push, since this is the first push, we will have to do all of these three things. So let me just copy this, go to my VS code and add these three things, right? As soon as I do that in my, all of my code really gets pushed to GitHub and let me just quickly have a look at it. And uh, yeah, everything seems to be there. So the next step is that we will be hosting this through Netlify. So let me just go to netlify.com and I will be now clicking on login. Hopefully I'm still logged in and great. So I have a login using GitHub, right? So <laughs> if this is the first time that you guys are doing this, uh, please feel free to follow the steps, obviously. And all right, so, <coughs> so click on add new site, import an existing project from GitHub, right? And connect your GitHub repository. So a lot of people like to manually deploy their GitHub projects. I feel, you know, linking your repository is much better because that way is what can happen is every time you make a push, all of your code automatically gets hosted again, right? So let me just say crypto dash dashboard dash March, I think, right? So this is the repo that we have. Um, obviously it will be main, everything else is the same. And we'll just say deploy site. Now, when we deploy site, there are a lot of warnings that my code already has, right? So now the best part is something that I'll be doing is that, you know, let's, let's just look at the logs. Right. So if I look at the logs, the website is going to build now and it starts, you know, doing whatever it needs to do. And let's just have a look at, um, okay, what happens? So I feel we'll have to wait for a few seconds, but the main point is that, um, over here, you guys will realize that Netlify by default takes warnings as errors. Now the difference between warnings and errors is that errors cannot be ignored, whereas warnings can be ignored. But what Netlify does is by default, it considers warnings to be errors as well. So if there are unused imports, if there is something, some warning that is there, something that is happening, it will not deploy your website because it will say that, you know, NPM, NPM run build could not run, right? So if we wait for it over here, as you can see on line number 76, what do you see? Treating warnings as errors because process.env.ci is true, 
So now process.env.ci is true. Now this is something that is known as environmental variables. And if you want to fix this without going back and fixing your errors, a little hack is that we'll be making a CI variable and we'll be setting that to false. So if we treat warnings as errors because CI is equal to true, if we change CI to false, we will not be treating warnings as errors. We'll be treating warnings as errors. So all you need to do is go to the deploy settings, go to your environment and click on go to environmental variable settings, add a variable, add a single variable. And what we'll be doing is I'll be saying CI, right? And I'll be saying false. I'll be saying create a variable now. And as soon as you create a variable, the variable is created. What we'll be doing is we'll be going to build and deploy and let's just deploy it again. So if I go to deploys, trigger deploy, uh, clear cache and deploy website. So now everything will, should work like a charm because what did we do? We changed CI from true to false. Now this is something that is not really advised because obviously if your code has certain warnings, you should go ahead and fix them first before hosting. But um, obviously, you know, uh, if there will be certain cases where you might have to ignore those yourselves or something. So in those cases, let's just, uh, you know, this is just much more simpler to do. Anyways, let's just wait for our create react app to build. Now everything seems to be building. NPM run build is running now. And now this will be creating a build file. And because of that build file, our entire code will be deployed, right? So let's just wait for a few seconds till then we can actually change the domain name but uh, i just want to show you guys exactly what the message that comes over here now so the last thing the message came was that we are treating warnings as errors because process.env.ci is equal to true now it should say totally different thing it says compiled with warnings and then it says finish processing blah 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 i think our website should be good to go and there's a final message that it comes uh, i think they stopped giving it wow okay site is live that message is here great so if you go to our website, we should be able to see our website and that is great. We do see our website. Everything seems fine. Everything seems perfect. If I go over here, it loads fast as well. That is great. If I go over here, uh, this takes a little time to load, but this also loads eventually. And that is awesome. So, okay, that is all that you needed to know. And obviously the watch list page is something that you will be making over here. If I go, there's no page. So yeah. Next thing that we should do is we should probably rename our website. So let me go to my deploys, go to my uh, site overview. I think we can just go to the general settings. Yes, perfect. And I can change the site name. So maybe I'll keep the site name as something it's very simple. So crypto dash dashboard dash march. And that is all. As soon as I do that, my entire website is good to go. And yeah, that is all that you needed to do. So with this, your entire website is good to go. In fact, now if I go to this website or go to this link, it should be working. Great. Okay, perfect. So our entire website has been hosted uh, and deployed. Every code, the code is entirely on GitHub. I will be giving you guys an entire documentation. Like I said, there will be an entire Google Docs. There will be an entire assets library. The Figma will be there. The API links will be there. Everything will be there and will be provided to you guys. And all of the code that I coded is going to be there and yes so anyways let's let's now uh, end this session on a good note so in the next class what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, the next class which will be also uh, probably a last lecture where we're going to talk about what are the real life applications of this project and how do you actually you know if you plan on putting this in your resume what all are the questions that are frequently asked about this and how do you need to tackle those questions uh, and all of those things, right? The last lecture of the crypto project series where um, we made this entire project and I'm Avi Vashisht, obviously. And today we'll be talking about what all things that you need to do now. So first things first, we will be adding this project in our resumes. So how do we exactly need to add it? What do we need to say? And uh, if you know, let's say we go to the interviews and if the interviewer asks us, so what are the things that the interviewer can ask us? and how do we deal with those questions all of these things are the things that we'll be talking about today so first things first what did we exactly build right so obviously you guys will be having your entire document with you guys this is a document that i made and i will be making sure that this is down in the description of every video right so now what you need to realize is this is the text tag that we have and this is the description so obviously you guys need a very short description that you need to add in your resumes so you guys can use this description and the description is very simple. So we built a crypto tracker using react 
and um, so <laughs> this is just a simple description you guys can change this as well and we can compare different cryptocurrencies we can look at their graphs we can look at the graphs of the prices total volumes market cap etc we can search from the top 100 cryptocurrencies in real time and add them to our watch lists as well right so obviously this was the objective this is the tech stack the tech stack involves react material ui chart js axios react router coin gecko api frame of motion if you guys added or used local storage do that if you guys used uh, you know if you guys added react toastify do that and all of those things correct so now the entire point is that what did we exactly build and you know uh, what are the features that we built and or that we uh, you know that this website has and how do we actually sell ourselves to the interviewer correct so first things first whenever you are in an interview the interviewer will ask you to explain the project so now how do you actually explain what you built a lot of students just start off by saying that okay so this is a react project that i built right or they don't even say the react project they just say you know this is the website that i built and then over here this is the landing page we have the heading we have this we have a button you know we have uh, the header we have this animation then we go to the dashboard then over here we have the loader you know they just explain whatever is happening on the screen now whatever is happening on the screen is something that the interviewer can see themselves right so what you need to know is you need to basically tell the interviewer exactly what they want to hear now you need to understand that an interviewer will not have more than one one to two minutes to understand your project so you cannot stretch the project too much you cannot explain it in too much detail because obviously this video com this uh, lecture comprises of what 29 to 30 lectures right somewhere around that number now it is not practically possible for you to just you know combine all of what you learned in the first 29 30 lectures and just uh, you know just tell the interviewer in a minute or two right so what you need to do is you need to tell the interviewer exactly what they need to hear and you need to tell the interviewer what you know what makes their lives easier to evaluate you so first things first you need to use keywords so the first keyword that you'll be using is this is a react project which is you know uh, handling uh, crypto data or you can just say which is a real-time crypto tracking you know react project that i built then over here if you go to the dashboard we fetch a list of 100 coins and all of this is in real time if the coin is doing good we see it in green if the coin is doing bad we see it in red you can search in real time right and you can even add cryptocurrencies to your watch list after that uh, you know maybe talk about how if you click on a specific coin there's a coin page which shows you more details of the coin right it shows you their graph it shows you how the coin performed in the last 120 or how many days that you have added there is a price toggle as well so you can not only see the graphs of the prices or the variations in the prices but you can also see the you know graph for the total volume or the market cap right again if you want to read more about the um, currency there's a coin info component which shows you a lot more about the currency you can read more about the currency you can go to the different links right you can even compare to different cryptocurrencies correct so then you will be talking about how you're comparing to cryptocurrencies you're fetching all the data again you can compare amongst 100 cryptocurrencies in real time you can change their graphs you can manipulate the data you can you know um, change their price type as well over here like you're doing there's again their information whatever you need to know and all of these things right so something that you need to realize is uh, when you tell the interviewer all of these things the interviewer will start to get interested and that is what you want to do right apart from that what else that you can do is you need to make sure that you explain the entire project within a minute or two because once you exceed that time limit the interviewer will stop you and if the interviewer stops you there's no going back right but if you finish earlier then there might be you know uh, instances where the interview interviewer will ask you that what more did you do right i want to know more features is this responsive all of those things correct and like i said don't forget to use keywords like react js chart js mui so this is a custom styled project but we are still using mui for co our components right so we are using mui as a component library and this is still a custom style project other than that completely responsive completely dynamic everything is happening in real time we're using an api called coin gecko api all of these things you need to mention so that is step one so let's say we clear our step one so now what is the step two now the interviewer will start asking you questions and these questions can vary from something which is very general something like how did you make the api call we used axios to make our api calls right now that is something which is very very general 
and these questions can like i said vary from something which is very general to something which is very very complex like let's say how did you handle the data that is needed for the charts or explain this chart how is this chart working so when the interviewer asks you how is this chart working you need to know that like i said every chart com comprises of two things an x axis and a y axis an x axis is just an array of dates in our case and the y axis is an array of prices right both the things we are getting from the coin gecko api and now the coin gecko api actually sends us the data in such a manner that it becomes very very easy for us it sends us the timestamps making it very easy for us to make the x axis and it sends us the prices in correspondence to those timestamps so the zeroth timestamp will be you know mapped to the zeroth price that i have and that way making my graph is very simple correct you need to make sure that the in, uh, interviewer knows that you know your concepts very well right another question that the interviewer can ask you is let's say why are you just fetching 100 coins right so you can see that there is a limit of 250 coins and you decide to just fetch 100 or maybe you're fetching 250 themselves so it doesn't matter what is the number of coins you're fetching just know that you know there is a limit of 250 coins per page and that is what you're doing then over here the interviewer will ask you how are you handling the pagination because usually the pagination is handled using apis whereas ours is something which is happening very fast so any interviewer will be able to guess that this pagination is something that is done just through the front end so you need to tell the interviewer that this is just to make the lives of the user very easy we just added this pagination so that the user does not really have to scroll a lot right and all of those things correct apart from that what else do you need to tell the user again the tabs is something that we built using mui so all of the mui questions you can i think you can tackle easily if you just go through the mui documentation properly then the next question that the interviewer can ask you is how are you filtering right filtering also done using uh, the dot filter function and it is something that is happening in real life or in real time and it is something that is happening just on the front end so again no api calls there we are filtering on the basis of the coin symbol and the coin name so both of the things we are tackling other than that the project involves a lot of conditional rendering and how do we know that if the price is uh, you know if the price decreased today it is in red if the price is increased it's in green the watch list page is something that we are handling through only and solely local storage but we are not storing the values so make sure that you tell the interview that even though you are saving the uh, id of the coin but the value is still current right so make sure that you tell the value is current as well so everything is up to date right the coin gecko api uh, gets updated i think every um, one hour or so or maybe even before that i don't remember please go to the documentation to see that number right so there are a lot of things that the interviewer can ask and as you guys can see that my project is very different than your project in the sense that i have this mouse follower thing and i do have this um, you know light mode dark mode as well so now even this is something that is very easily achievable and this is all of this is provided inside this document uh documentation right so make sure that you go through this documentation and you've added all of these features yourselves as well other than that something that the interviewer can also ask you is um okay so our watch list is done compare page is done home page so the interviewer can ask you how are these animations happening right is this something that you've used keyframes for or maybe have you used you said that you've used uh framer motion so you might have to explain how framer motion works right so frame of motion is this react library right and you need to pass your initial values animated values and you need to pass a transition attribute so it converts your html add element you into a frame of motion element and all you need to do is you need to write motion dot in front of it correct so all of these things you need to take care of and um, yeah again make sure your entire website is responsive right uh make sure that you have taken care of all the edge cases you have taken make sure your entire project is responsive like i said and something else that the interviewer will also ask you is that um how do you really tackle a great user experience right or how does your website ensure or how does your react project ensure that you know your website is or your application is really um, uh, your users feel good or the user experience or the ux part of it is good so something that you need to realize is ui is very different than ux ui is whatever you see whereas ux is how the user feels when they're using your website do they feel that the website is easier to navigate is the loading speed less is does the website contain things like light mode dark mode does it have good hover animations does it have you know uh, is the data easily readable is the chart good is the animations good are the animations smooth right all of these things so all of these things matter and what you can say is 
that you know we have included all sorts of animations we have added um, a watch this feature specifically to make sure that you know if a user wants to save or this watch this feature kind of gives the user the you know uh, feel of the fact that they're saving a coin so this is an added functionality this was not really needed but we solely added this for the user experience part right other than that we have two views so the user can view the data in terms of the grid or the list whatever they want to prefer the website is completely responsive so all of these things are things that you need to realize that are uh, you know that are adding value to your project other than that something that the uh, interviewer will also ask you is that um, you know um, apart from the UX perspective, the interviewer will also ask you things like um, what all features can you add? What are the more features that you can add or how can you expand this project? So then at that point, you don't need to say that, you know, what sir or ma'am, this is the perfect project that I've ever made. This is the best project that I've ever made. You don't need to say things like that. You need to basically tell the interview that, you know, there are things that you would want to do to expand the project as well. Right. Like, for example, the stocks API part that I gave you, maybe convert this just from a crypto tracking app to a stocks app, maybe add more cryptocurrencies, maybe add more, uh, you know, more, what do you say, uh, more days to this, maybe add a different graph. So you know how stocks and cryptocurrencies have a specific type of graph. It's called, I think, the candle graph, if you guys know. So if I Google stocks graph. So there are APIs or there are, sorry, uh, there are, you know, NPM packages available for you to implement something like this which is a graph like this, the candle graph, I think it's called, right? So all of these things you need to tell to the interviewer and make sure you tell the interview to the interviewer that, you know, there's always a scope for improvement and you are a person who is willing to learn and who's willing to keep on adding value to the projects. Because at the end of the day, what interviews want to see is that you are a developer who is really passionate about what you do and you don't create projects which are, you know, normal. You don't create projects just for the sake of it. Because some of the interviewers ask that, why did you create this project? So at that point, you don't need to say that, you know, you created this project because obviously you wanted to add a project in your resume. That is the honest answer. But that is not something that you should say, obviously, right? So what the interviewer wants to know is, are you really passionate or are you really a great developer? So now the competition is not just about being a good developer. It's about being a great one, right? And what separates you from a good developer and makes you a great developer is the fact that you take care of the user, you take care of the idea, you take care of the problem statement. And what was the problem statement that this crypto tracker is tackling? The fact that, you know, we are making a website, which is kind of like a one-stop shop. You can compare cryptocurrencies, you can learn about cryptocurrencies, you can look at their graphs, you can look at their, you know, uh, what do you say? You can look at their patterns, are they going up, are they going down? You can compare the number of days as well, right? You can compare how, what, how many, you know, what is the volume of the stock that is being traded on a daily basis. Uh, uh, daily basis what is the market cap fluctuation that is happening what is the again description all of these links are there everything is there right so you need to make sure that you tell to the interviewer that whatever you've creating or you whatever you've created is adding value to someone right maybe there's someone out there who would really enjoy this uh, application because this is like their need right they just wanted a simple application to go to where they can search cryptocurrencies they can look up different cryptocurrencies they can see what are the new and upcoming crypt uh, cryptocurrencies and also compare them so i think this compare page and this watch this page they can even add it to their watch this page so i think these two pages really adds a lot of value to this project and just make sure that you tell the interviewer about this about the value that you're adding to this project right and that's it that is what it's uh, more or less about but other than that i feel you guys are good to go and this was a really long session even for me to record but i'm glad that we are finally towards the end of it and i'm really thankful for you guys for coming to the end and obviously uh, congratulations for everyone to reaching the end and you know uh, we all learned a whole lot while making this project and I hope you guys really do work on it and you really change the design, change the theme, add more functions, add more functionalities, right? Maybe add the stocks uh, API that I'm talking about. That is basically like a dream. And maybe when I get time, I will be doing that too. But yes, right? Other than that, I think we're all good to go. And uh, thank you for watching this series. And I hope I was able to add or Ake Job was able to add uh, value to you, right? So thank you for watching.